Good morning, colleagues. Can we please settle down? I was not expecting the room to be this full today. Yesterday was overflowing. Oh, somebody has just reminded me that it's the 15th today. So <laughs> I thought the malls were still closed, but uh, colleagues, once again, welcome. And uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence again today. I know that uh, you had to take time out of your busy schedules to participate in this endeavor, and we appreciate it. My name is Linda Ludla from DPSA. Um, I'll be chairing the session for today. Um, as I already asked for the proceedings of the day, may I please request our first two presenters, Mr. Corey Smith, and uh, Ms. Amukelani, who will be presenting on behalf of uh, Renisha Naidu from the DPSA to come and join me here in front. And it's purely for me not to feel lonely. So um, as they walk up, um, I would like to officially open the session for today. Yesterday, we had a very packed day of uh, a lot of presentations, and I'm sure as you were sitting, um, you made a lot of mental notes and maybe some physical notes. And I just thought to start us off and to give us a short reminder. Um, I noted the number of punch lines and concepts and words yesterday. Some of them were very new to me. The first one was the public service does not have the luxury to be extinct. I'm not going to tell you who said what, it's just a way of checking your memory and reminding you of the different inputs that we had yesterday. We had the word Dodo and Nokia. We had that the majority of chief directors, DDGs and DGs will retire by 2024. We heard that the majority of our deputy directors are over the age of 40. We had the words foresighting, futuristic thinking, anticipating, anticipatory innovation. We heard that we need a Damascus moment. We had uh, about BBTs and BATs. The only um, abbreviations I've known thus far was before Christ and after Christ. So we heard yesterday that there's the bond before technology and born after technologies. We heard words like the gig economy, uh, the global localist, and lastly, one that got a lot of people laughing was that for most of us, the future of work is pension. <laughs> so colleagues, as indicated in our program today, um, I would like to call on our DG, Ms. Yoliswa Makasi, to give us a recap on previous day's discussions. Um, and then followed by that, uh, we'll start with the formal process of our program, which is looking at the key emerging issues for review. So please join me in a round of applause to welcome the DJ. Thank you. Um, I'm told that Prince should be hovering around here. He's uh, behind me. Who Prince is like Celebrity Ale Conference. <laughs> Good morning, colleagues. How are you doing today? Eh? I can't hear you guys. Eh? 
Are you well? Did you sleep well? What were you up to at night? Why didn't you sleep well? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, don't allow those, those concepts that Linda was sharing here to confuse your colleagues. Ne? Use them to your best advantage, but they mustn't confuse you. Sorry, I just need water. Something is stuck on my nose. So I was given a slide this morning to talk to. This slide. But I was not briefed what must I say on the slide. So I'm going to figure it myself out as I talk to the slide. Basically, as I understand this, it's it captures the conversations that we had yesterday. Um, and and I, I think to a bigger extent, when I looked at it, I agree that it captures those conversations that we have yesterday. And at the center is our workers, obviously, because they have to deliver services to uh, members of the public. So this is what they call the key aspects of a modern employee experience. Uh, so at the center is a, a worker who is location free, who is mobile and yet connected, who has control over purpose, work-life balance. I don't know if there's anything called work-life balance, but people speak about it. I have not experienced it yet, and I still aspire to. If any one of us has figured out what work-life balance feels like, maybe you could share uh, for everybody. Highly collaborative and transdisciplinary. And then you obviously have culture. So culture is very important because culture really uh, informs how we carry ourselves at work and how we behave in any environment, by the way, not just at work. So if our culture is not aligned to the future, remember the future is not the other day, the future is today or if our culture does not align to the changing nature of um, uh, work in the public service, then we're gonna have problems. So we need to look at the issue of culture. In the, currently, we have a very hierarchical culture. Uh, we, currently, we have a culture of pe people doing as little as possible. Um, um, uh, people even not including work that they are doing and delivering on, but this work is not included in organizational documents because they are scared they are going to be held accountable around this particular work, and yet it's deliverables of the organization. So we have a, a culture of um, people who are scared, um, 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 uh, uh, who have fear. And um, I always say when I talk about fear that fear is a personal issue first. Um, uh, so we, we, each one of us as individuals, we have to really work hard around dealing with fear and what triggers fear in our lives. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be fearful of everything. And one of the things I like about the work environment, especially the public service, is that employees have rights. And there is laws. I mean, personally, I'm a beneficiary of laws in the public service. Uh, that protect employees. And I think all of us, one way or another, we are. We have very good laws that protect employees, but still people have this big, big fear about uh, this and that and that. So we, we just have to, on our own personal journeys, deal with the issue of fear uh, and, and how it can stop at us at times from exploring, from doing things differently because we are scared. Then obviously um, uh, there is the, 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 the digital issues that we have to deal with. They're looking at our HR processes, our HR processes are very manual. Well, most of us, some of you may have, uh, may have automated, you were lucky enough to automate before Treasury closed the tab. But uh, those of us who are not lucky enough, we have to beg Treasury, we have to write submissions to request deviations, we have to do so many things because we want to automate, but uh, Treasury has uh, locked the system to automate because of IFMS. So, but we need, uh, we can't wait for um, HR solutions that are automated in the public service. I mean, I always look at HR just at work, they advertise an admin post and 2,000 people apply. So you have HR officials who must go through words of paper, 2,000 people 
in order to shortlist maybe five people out of that uh, group of people. And if you had a system in place that you are using, an e-recruitment system, it would help you. Some provinces are implementing e-recruitment system and some departments are implementing e-recruitment systems. So we should move as a public service completely into automation, into e-recruitment system, into integrated and streamlined uh, digital workspaces as well. Um, 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 different apps we can use for different reasons. You know, I, I one of my dreams at DPSA, and it shouldn't really be a dream of a DG, but it just shows you how basic things are. If we can just have a chat box on our website, so that when you want to know something about the regulations, you start in the chat box. If you cannot get the answer that you want, then it gets escalated. If we can just have an app that nicely answers a number of frequently asked questions. Because you guys write about the same things to us, but we take three months to respond to you if you are lucky a month, if you are lucky a week, like extraordinary lucky a week. Because of how dis disintegrated the system is. I mean, the other day I get a letter that, was, uh, that I must respond to, that was sent in 2019 to the department. That was even before I was the DG. Now I must respond and say, apologies, we took so long. But I don't even know why we took so long to respond to this letter. So these are our realities. But if we invest in tools that enable us, apps are not expensive. We, out of the budgets that we have, we should be able to do those things. I hope my IT guys are here. Uputandi? Eh? Mm. <laughs> so, 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 so that's, that's just one issue around automating our HR processes and our HR systems. I know that IFMS wanted us to have an integrated system, da, 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 but honestly, I don't know when we're going to have IFMS kicking in and really being implemented. But now we're sitting with a challenge, Z83, that is not automated. Um, uh, it's just PDFs in the PDF in the system, but it's not automated. Um, so, so there are departments and provinces that are implementing um, HR system. I worked in Gauteng; they have an automated HR system, online HR system in Gauteng. They manage leave online, they manage performance online, they manage so many things online, and it seems to be working very well. And it allows for the integration that we're looking for. So um, um, uh, the, the, the other part of it from a, a physical point of view, it's the tools of trade, the, the IT capabilities that um, uh, we bring in into the system, your analytics and other things that you, your intelligence systems that are going to give you the intelligence data that you require in order to take decisions. Uh, these things are done in South Africa. You know, it's not like new things that are not done elsewhere. They are done um, um, uh, and, and hopefully move into a paperless environment at some stage. Because really, um, a, a paper that we use to print and sign and send, print, sign and send, we use so much paper. I think the last aspect is that collaboration on employee experience. Um, uh, close long-term partnerships require joint vision, strategy, operations, holistic code design with workers, and etc. So these are these are some of the aspects that we're looking at when we, in terms of the discussions yesterday. But if you think about the concept of the future of work, it's transformative on its own. You can, I mean, from an ethics point of view, from a governance point of view, um, uh, because it helps you to think about what you require from now into the future other than what you did in the, sorry, other than focusing on what you did in the past. Many of our departments have a culture that says, this is how we've done it, and this is how we're going to continue to do it. So if you are um, a, 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 a senior manager, and I can only talk about my own experiences, if you are a DG who comes to an environment and you are new, and every time you ask for something, people say, no, this is how we did it. So if you say, explore other ways of doing it, because there could be other ways in which we could do the same thing, it's like our teach is not supporting us, our teach is not cooperating. So we just need to 
read and predict the future and use tools that are going to help us to predict the future. Scenario planning is one of those tools, foresighting is one of those tools, etc. So the School of Government has also quite a critical role to play in terms of bringing some of these capabilities into the public service. So, so this is the, the summary that a colleague said and did yesterday. I will not go into detail further than this, but I also wanted as the last part to talk to a little bit of um, why, why we are having, uh, because today we are focusing solely on regulations review and we want you to piggyback on the discussions and information that you got into, you discovered yesterday uh, as you engage in the working groups and you are dealing with the regulations and proposing areas of change and etc. And I just had five pointers I prepared around why these regulations, why are we reviewing regulations and our policy directives. And uh, the first issue for us is we need to deal with the administrative bureaucracy and we need to, we, to deal with the compliance burden. Uh, the former minister for public service didn't, uh, didn't like the, the word uh, compliance burden. He always said to me, Digi, don't use this word. Find another word, don't use burden. Uh, so I'm using it with caution. So we spoke yesterday about the compliance requirements that we are putting on your door as DPSA, and we are hoping that once we clean our house and integrate and improve, other departments like um, uh, Treasury and DPAME who are also um, uh, imposing re uh, reporting requirements to you will also review their own processes. But this is about our own processes at this stage. We also want to clarify the wording of the regulations, especially around purpose and meanings. There's lots of letters that we get around people wanting clarity on this. Um, and I think also internally, we want to deal with our own issues around interpretation. So we have institutional interpretations rather than individual interpretations of regulations. So we know institutionally, what do we mean by this? And when a department is asking a clarity on this particular matter, we have an institutional response rather than an individual response of somebody who was writing the regulations or somebody who was involved in the process. Let's share that understanding of what the regulation aims to achieve and what are the limits to the regulation itself and what are the areas that can be deviated. There's a, a big issue around deviations. Uh, there's expectations for deviations. And I just want to tell you, in case somebody told you, it's me who's a problem, who's not approving your deviations, maybe I am the problem, but just also note that in terms of the public service regulations, I think 98% of the regulations, DG has no authority to approve deviations. In terms of the Public Service Act, DG really has no authority. MPSA, in certain areas and very small few areas where MPSA has authority to approve deviations. So uh, when your deviations come not approved requests, uh, 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 don't think that it's me, it's the system. Uh, the third issue, we want to promote integration, integration and dismantle silo working. So. There's lots of silo working in the public service. There's lots of silo working in my department. And we have to look systematically through our processes how we disintegrate silo working. Because when we talk about the concept of future of work, we have to collaborate. And I say this to colleagues all the time, but sometimes people sit in their positions and they are not prepared to reach out to other people. And that creates challenges in terms of silo working. So it's an issue that we're hoping through the regulations and through the review and the integration that we will do internally, especially around reporting templates and et cetera. I heard Pierre yesterday saying that we must forget the templates. I fully agree with you, we must forget the templates. So we must look at other means of being able to collect data. From a policy point of view, there's many different tools that you can use to collect data that you require. Questionnaires also, I mean, questionnaires are very simple, but they play a very critical role. And we need to put our processes online. If we can do this meeting, the, the registration online for this meeting, and the attendance online, why can't we have our reports submitted online? And I think, by the way, Didi Chimantla had indicated they have a capability that they, they are using in their branch. Why can't we use that holistically as DPSA? So that you don't have to send documents to emails of people. 
you send documents that are required for reporting through a very streamlined process. Uh, we want to promote e equity. For, so for us, the issue of age, yesterday you heard that we are an aging public service. Indeed, we are an aging. And the thing about older people, which is us, I'm old, or I'm older, even though I'm still called a young lion in some circles, but I'm old. So if you, if you, if you think about older people, they are stuck in their ways of doing things. I've experienced this. People who have been in departments longer, yes, they bring the value of institutional knowledge that you can't take away from them, but also they will struggle with change compared to youngish new people. It's not, uh, so, 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 so this is out of anecdotal experiences, not really out of any research I've, uh, I've read on the matter, but you will still get older people who are flexible enough, who want to learn, who want to improve. Uh, on their knowledge and etc. But generally, people tend to be stuck in a comfort zone. So if you have an aging public service like ours, it's possible that about 60-70% of us are stuck in our comfort zones. And therefore, there's no opportunity to improve in terms of how we do work and in terms of how we deliver services. There's issues around disability, there's issues around race, there's issues around gender, which are part of issues around equity that we must always keep an eye on. Uh, we are struggling at SMS and MMS level with uh, keeping, especially SMS, keeping up to the, uh, to the requirements in terms of equity, women in SMS. The last time I checked, I think the report I saw was saying we're at 46%. Currently, uh, in terms of SMS compliance, I think the last issue for me or for us relates around skills development, continuously improving our skills in the public service, but not just gathering degrees. Because yes, it's important to have the degrees. I actually like the idea of getting as many degrees as I can, but complement the degrees with real skills. And so skills development is a very, very important part of the work that we need to do. We spoke yesterday about the impact of um, um, uh, digitization to the public service in terms of employees. Many of our employees are going to, think about the employees in HR. I don't know in your departments how many HR employees you have, but I always see in the department, I actually don't know how many we have even in my department in HR, but. Sometimes I'll see a group of people working and I'll hear somebody saying, no, those are colleagues from HR. Th uh, uh, or, or think about colleagues in supply chain or colleagues in finance. Once you fully automate your systems, what will some of the colleagues who are in those responsibilities do? Those whose job is to word through papers and papers and papers, what will they be doing? So the impact in terms of skills development and preparing them for this future of work that we're talking about is very important. So, so those are some of the things I really wanted to say, colleagues. I don't want to take much of your time. And on that note, I will go back to my seat and sit down. Thank you very much. Thanks, DJ, and thanks to Prince. I'm sure you'd have lost five Ks by the time the two days is over with the up and down that we are making you um, do. DJ, I must tell you the word or the phrase an aging public service um, created a lot of conversations outside yesterday. So um, I think it's something that um, requires a lot of conversation because there were different takes to it yesterday. Some people were saying there's actually nothing wrong with having, maybe it's the word aged, matured, public servants. It's about how, what do they do in their maturity in developing the skills of those that must uh, come after them. And I think we all acknowledge that we have not to date as the public service done a good job 
in continuously developing colleagues so that they are future-proof in terms of the skills that they need to have. And I'm hoping that part of the discussions that we had yesterday makes us have a different take on the concept of human resource development. Because I think to date we have left it to people choosing what they want to do and that's not necessarily wrong. But we have not made a concerted effort of creating opportunities for people to test the knowledge because one of the big misconceptions is that once you've acquired a degree or formal qualification, you have a skill. You do not have a skill, you have knowledge. It's only people who are in the technical fields who learn by doing. And therefore the big question becomes all the money that we invest in PDPs, funding PDPs and bursaries, what is the return on investment um, in the departments that we work in? But most importantly, how do we create opportunities for people to test out that knowledge so that it becomes a skill? The issue of paperless um, is also an interesting one. In fact, when the, the, yesterday it was said that we do not have the luxury as the public service not to automate or to embrace technology. One of the things that we saw about not just the burden of capturing applications, but was that with COVID, that was actually a factor that delayed the filling of vacancies because the protocols told us that um, COVID can stay on a particular surface for X number of days. We were also told that we actually need to quarantine the applications, the ones that people um, submit physically. So, and there's a view that we've entered a century of, um, what was COVID called? Pandemics. And therefore, COVID might not be the first and the last one. And therefore, what is it that we do? Because the concept of anticipatory is that we must start operating in that mode where we anticipate these things will probably continue for the foreseeable future. And therefore, we don't have the luxury of seeing technology as an add-on or as something that we will do. But most importantly, as I invite my first speaker, I think the, the key takeaway for me yesterday is that as a country, we are spending a lot of money on infrastructure. We are pumping billions of rents, and it's the infrastructure of brick and mortar. But what came up very key yesterday was that we also need to start investing in IT infrastructure. The People working in IT always decry the fact that departments have so many expectations about what they should be doing. And I'm not referring to you, DJ, because of your comment this morning. But that we don't budget adequately for IT. So we believe that IT will be the solution to us doing things more effectively. And again, from yesterday's conversations, it's no longer a luxury but we don't budget for it effectively in how we allocate our budget. We spend a lot of money on servicing licenses and all of that, but not the actual valuable IT that allows us to develop solutions and systems and, and, and. So I, I will not take long to introduce my next two speakers. I think DG has spoken about why there was a need to review our regulations. And yesterday there was a lot of talk and a lot of blame that was put on regulations. And I'm not sure if the future of work that we are looking for would be regulation-less. But whilst we still have regulations and we are preparing ourselves to create um, the future of work that we are all striving for or we are projecting, projecting should be in the next five, 10 to 20 years, unfortunately, we have to contend with working within a, a regulated uh, environment. So on that note, I would like to call upon Mr. Smith, who is a senior advisor from the Government Technical Advisory Center. And you'll be talking to us about human resource and management development regulations review project. 
Mr. Smith. Good morning, colleagues. Um, good to see so many familiar faces and also some new faces. Um, it's an honor to be part of you and your discussions today. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here yesterday, but I hear that you've had really fruitful deliberations, and I hope today it will kind of culminate into practical expression of what we do in terms of reviewing the regulations and preparing for the future. I like the um, statement that um, the future is today. Um, I think that's indeed true. We are in the midst of the future. The only constant is change. And um, so therefore we need to be flexible. We need to be able to adapt to change. So um, colleagues, I've been introduced. I'm Corey Smith from, from GTAC. Um, GTAC stands for the Government Technical Advisory Center. We are an agency of National Treasury. Um, I think we've worked with quite a few departments nationally and provincially, and also public entities. Um, and we pretty much support departments for improving their um, systems. Um, and the whole objective is improved value for money, higher levels of efficiency and effectiveness in government. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about um, this particular project uh, covering four items, as you can see there on the slides, um, provide you with a bit of background, what we intend doing, um, how it will unfold, and also some of the key success factors. So where it all started, uh, we, request, we received a request from the DG of DPSA asking if we as GTAC can support the review of some of the regulations. And in this case, um, it pertains specifically to the HRM and D regulations. So the letter of request um, mentioned that government has experienced several challenges in relation to HRM and D policies, and that there's a sense that um, outdated policies contribute to those challenges. So the idea is really to focus on current practices and approaches, and maybe also mention future approaches, um, and then the idea is that that work must actually feed into this broader review of the HRM and D strategy for the public service. Essentially to have an integrated public service HRM and D strategy. And um, obviously there is a broader review of the regulations that is happening at the moment. So this work will also feed into that broader review. So um, essentially our focus is on the number of things. We firstly want to identify those regulations that are outdated um, because of the need to adjust to remote working, for example, following the COVID-19 pandemic, and then also in the whole shift towards the future of work, as well as the skills that are needed for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and then linked to that, is the issue about undue reporting requirements, things that cause unnecessary red tape in implementing them. I think broader in government, there is a focus on red tape reduction. I think we've heard the president speaking about creating a unit within the presidency that will focus on red tape reduction. So that is obviously a topical issue across the public service especially for the clients of the public service out there, but then also internally through the kind of rules and regulations that we generate. Um, lastly, also to focus on gaps um, in the existing regulations. So in other words, we shouldn't just be fixed on what currently pertain, but also ask ourselves what should actually be in place going forward. So it's really quite an open-minded focus on what we need to put in place in order to prepare for the future. So the idea is to see what kind of um, regulatory framework do we require in order to embed modern human resource management practices, especially those that focus on integrated employee lifecycle management. 
so that we don't have these cycle, these silos that the DG spoke about, but to, to ensure that there is actually that integration. Obviously, systems and processes help us with that, but also policies often drive that kind of silo focus, and we want to see how we can actually break that silo focus going forward. So um, we've had to, in conjunction with the steering committee, um, think hard about which areas will be part of the scope of this work. Essentially, it cuts across chapters three, four, and five of the public service regulations, um, but there are certain exclusions. But if one then becomes more specific in terms of the areas that will be covered, there's about a list of 22 of them. But it starts really with the organizational part of the regulations. So you'll know that there are certain parts of the regulations that talk, for example, to the functions of the public service. Um, DG spoke about the minister having certain competencies as far as the functions of the public service are concerned. And um, uh, you know there's the schedules of the act, for example, that talk to the various departments nationally and provincially but also when it comes to the transfer of functions, there are certain processes and procedures that have to be followed. So there will be a focus on those regulatory requirements when it comes to the functions of the public service. Um, there are also parts that speak to the establishment and perhaps also disestablishment of government components and specialized service delivery units. So those are the kinds of corporate forms that are available within the public service. You have your departments, government components, and specialized service delivery units, for example, requiring of you to do feasibility studies um, and to ask uh, permission before you establish these kind of units. And they link also to the creation of public entities. So there's a certain link to the treasury regulations when it comes to the establishment of new departments or um, types of, of government entities in the public service. There's also thirdly issues around approving when you want to affect certain changes to your organizational structures, uh, certain consultation requirements uh, with the Minister for Public Service and Administration, um, and also broader kind of organizational and government arrangements in the public service. There's issues about creating and filling off posts and do's and don'ts uh, around that. Human resource planning and employment equity planning um, certain requirements there uh, to be followed, the recruitment processes and procedures. Uh, we heard about the Z83, that's obviously part of your recruitment processes and procedures uh, and adver advertising and selection. And I think as we go through them, we'll find there's always a, 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 a rational reason for why those rules and regulations were established in the first place. But the question is whether those are still relevant and whether they can be streamlined. Um, seven point conditions for appointment will be focused on, including probation. Um, eight point, the whole issue of the senior management service. The SMS has been around for some time. When I was still a full-time public servant, um, I was uh, privileged enough to be part of the whole process of establishing the SMS. Um, obviously, there were certain good things emanating from that, but also certain unintended consequences, and we need to look at that. Working hours, which is quite critical, given the new world of work and remote working. So uh, that's included. Emergency work is also included. Um, job assignments, uh, re rules and regulations around that. And then the last the list of 12, uh, the working environment, including remote working as part of it, uh, work facilities, including the question of uh, do we still need all the brick and mortar facilities that we have, um, training and development, uh, development programs, part of that, performance management and development also, um, and that links to poor performance as well as um, making sure that there are adequate links between performance management and competency development. I think that's often um, an area where there are still complaints that we don't have those links. Health, safety, wellness of employees will be part of that. Resignation and termination of employment, reappointment of employees, utilization of employees and voluntary workers, as well as employee records. So um, especially when one comes to the transactional part of HRM&D, obviously that's the part 
that lend themselves to um, automa automation and uh, we need to look at that. We still have challenges sometimes with keeping proper records. So those are all the areas that will be covered. So in short, it's the organizational side of things and then it's the whole uh, employee life cycle from appointment through to performance management and termination of service. There are a few things that uh, we won't be covering because there are a number of reviews, other reviews that are actually underway. Um, Amu will talk about the work um, already being done to review the legal framework of the public service, but there's also other work underway. For example, the personnel expenditure review, the PER gets done every now and again, a couple of years, and we are in another cycle where um, the remuneration framework of the public service, including things like occupational specific dispensations will be looked at, the whole collective bargaining system will be looked at, and those are all part of the PER that we will leave to that particular process. Um, and then importantly to mention, given the fact that we now have uh, umbrella legislation for the public administration, uh, because the focus on the regulations themselves, which only focus on the public service, will obviously not cover municipalities. Municipalities are clearly covered by Palmer and the Palmer regulations, but in this instance, we are focusing on where the bulk of the compliance burden actually lies at the moment, which is really the public service regulations. The Palmer regulations are fairly new. So um, what we also won't cover specifically are those rules and regulations that are issued by other departments like the Department of Employment and Labor. Obviously, they also have uh, their requirements, let's say for example, around skills development and employment equity. But what we will look at is where there's actually overlap or duplication and to see whether we can actually smooth that overlap and duplications. Um, so to the extent that that might actually adding to the compliance burden of departments, we look at those areas of overlap and see whether perhaps one needs to step back because a particular area is already covered by uh, those rules of general application. So um, the other thing that might be crossing your mind and which we had to get our heads around is whether we only focus on the regulations or we actually look at all the associated decisions or determinations, directives, guidelines and the reporting rules and the regulations that are issued. And to our mind, we should actually look at all of those associated directives and determinations and reporting requirements because that's the devil is often in the detail. That's where the compliance burden often comes in. So it goes beyond just simply the rules and the regulations, but also those things that are issued in terms of the act and the regulations. So our uh, particular project will unfold um, up to July. So it's essentially a seven month project. We've started in January around the conceptualization. We've just concluded the inception phase and we are now in the middle of the research phase. So in this particular phase, obviously the work that you've done yesterday the deliberations yesterday, today's discussions will all feed into our work as well, but we'll do some other independent research work as well. We'll also pick up the reviews that have been done by other independent bodies like the Public Service Commission. We'll look at the work of the Auditor General. We'll look at the work of the National Planning Commission um, to see, well, okay, this is the intent. This is how we are matching up uh, to the original intent. So that'll go into the research report. We'll then look at the gaps that have been identified. And once we've got the research and the gap analysis done, we really want to expose that to discussion and deliberation uh, before we get to closure stage. So um, to talk a little bit in conclusion about what we see as the critical success factors, obviously we're highly dependent on all the rules and regulations that have been issued. Um, some of them, or most of them, are quite accessible uh, given uh, the website. I saw the DPSA's website got a bit of a refreshment uh, recently, so which is uh, welcome news. So we'll be able to access quite a bit through the website, but others that we might battle with will get 
uh, from our DPSA colleagues. Fortunately, we've already got a set of baseline documents which um, is helping us. And then the question of the ref reference group that I've alluded to. So we see that reference group as consisting of both officials within the DPSA and also from national and provincial departments in order to be a sounding board uh, for the work that we will be doing around literature review, document review, um, to tap into that practical experience from you guys uh, on the ground. So that reference group is in the process of being established and that will help us um, uh, to a high degree. Um, and as I said, what we are envisaging at this point in time is to consult with that reference group once we've got uh, the two base documents ready, which is the draft research and the gap analysis report. So um, that reference group, I cannot overemphasize, critical to get those inputs from them. We can go so far in terms of reviewing documents and reviewing the literature, but um, what we really need to do is to have those interactive discussions in order to get a sense of uh, which of those rules and regulations are working, which ones are not working, which might have unintended consequences and where are the gaps. And I think those are pretty much the themes in these uh, discussions that we'll also have in plenary. So I think it will be very useful to actually tap into that as well. So um, colleagues, that's pretty much my short overview of what this work will entail. And um, I'll be available for any questions if uh, we have an opportunity for that. So thanks so much, appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, I'd like to suggest that uh, we take the next presentation and then we will open up for questions. Um, last night, uh, one of my colleagues sent us um, a report that uh, was done by National Treasury. I think it was towards the end of last year on the word that DG doesn't want to use the reporting burden for program ones. And it's quite interesting because it looked at the number of reports that business units in program one are required to, to produce. So it did a comparison from 2015-16 to 2020-21. Under the area of strategic planning, there's 24 reports that need to be produced, and it's an increase of about 26% since 2015. Under financial management, there's 21 reports, and it's an increase of 23.5%. Under HR, 20 reports, it's an increase of about 25%, and noting that these reports are not 20 reports annually but some of them need to be produced quarterly. So I think it just underscores the, the question that we, we, we are battling with now with respect to our regulations and what we require these program ones um, to, to be producing. And I always remind my DPSA colleagues from what we call line function that actually DPSA's clientele is program ones in all departments. And therefore, I think that as we proceed to the next part of the presentation, we'll also be reflecting and um, making notes of what are some of the proposed um, reviews to the legislative framework that governs public service. And as we proceed throughout the day, you'll be able to just reflect on what would be some of the things that you would advise the DPSA um, to start considering to, to ensure that we, we reduce the, maybe the overload instead of a burden, because I'm sure there is value to these reports, but I think it would be something worth um, your while to go into the report that was done by National Treasury, so that it, because it also looks at other things, like what is actually the cost of this reporting in terms of man hours and in terms of financially, what does it cost um, departments. 
But I think most importantly, when we talk about the concept of strategic HR that we are all calling our HR units to do, is that how does that facilitate an environment for HR to step out of reporting, to start operating as a key partner to the business of the department so that they can generate that intelligence that departments need to be able to make decisions and even make policies. And therefore, yesterday there was a concept of systems theory and that we need to understand that if there's something happening in one system and if we take the public services and ecosystem, what happens in one system has an effect on the other parts of the system and just something to chew on. On that note, I'd like to call up um, Ms. Amu Baloyi, who will be giving us um, a presentation on the review, or oh, it actually says reflections and implementation of the current regulations on behalf of uh, Ms. Renisha Naidu from our Chief Directorate Legal Services in DPSA. Amu, Prince, you disappeared on me. to the Director General, members of the Senior Management Services, um, ladies and gentlemen. I am Amugelani Baloyi from the Legal Service Unit of the DPSA, and it is a privilege um, to stand before you to reflect on the current public service regulations. As we approach a critical time in our legislative reform, it is important that we reflect on past changes, challenges, as well as to provide some legislative context to the amendments to the regulations. Um, as many of you, ladies and gentlemen, know, um, the Public Service Regulations of 2016 introduced an entirely new regulatory framework, replacing the 2001 Public Service Regulations. This was precipitated by the extensive reforms introduced by the Public Service Amendment Act of 2007. The amendments which were made in the 2016 regulations included prohibiting the reappointment of employees who were dismissed for misconduct, prescribing periods of probation, allowing for the summoning of witnesses to a disciplinary hearing amongst others. There have been some immediate challenges with the 2016 regulations which requir required ad hoc amendments to the regulations such as Regulation 66 which was amended in 2018. Prior to 2018, Regulation 66 permitted the appointment of persons in the offices of an executive authority or a deputy minister for a period of three years, and this was on contract. The application of this regulation became a bit of a problem when these persons were appointed for a three-year period by the term of the executive authority or the deputy minister ended before the expiry of that three years. So we amended this regulation 66 to reflect that all appointments in the offices of an executive authority or deputy minister should be linked to the term of that minister or Deputy Minister. Um, over the past six years, we have realized that whilst we've made strides towards transforming the public service, more could be done uh, to facilitate better human resource facilities, cap capacities, and capabilities. This is to ensure that we have a more efficient and professional public service. This was emphasized by the President and Mr. Smith just alluded to it in the, pre in the Honorable President's 2022 State of the Nation Address, where the President tasked departments to reflect on the overburdening regulatory framework that are unduly complicated, costly, and sometimes difficult to comply with, and to remove the unnecessary red tape across government. 
Therefore, it is important, ladies and gentlemen, that the DPSA reflects on its legislation to see what works, what is necessary, and what needs to be removed. To this end, a broader reform of the public service regulation and other determination and directives is necessary in the medium term to address current challenges that are being experienced with the regulations. It must be noted that some challenges arise from determinations and directives as well. This required the DPSA to consider these prescripts holistically and some preliminary areas, either than the technical amendments, and those would include the interpretation of the regulations, as DG has mentioned. We have identified certain areas for possible amendments. And if I may please, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read through each one of this because I think they are each worth noting for this platform. So we want to amend the regulations to augment human resource planning to ensure a sustainable workplace. We want to amend the regulations to deal with matters to enhance ICT capabilities and capacities in the public service. The retention and recruitment strategies in the public service to address the overlap between the public service regulations and the Public Administration Management Act, which include areas dealing with ethics, lifestyle audits, and disclosures. We want to amend the public service regulations to provide for processes for the de-establishment de of government components. We would also like to limit the administrative matters that are usually referred to the Minister for Public Service and Administration on matters such as um, leave, which exceeds 30 percent, appointments additional to the establishment and secondments for periods exceeding 12 months. We also want to put in place a regulatory framework for transfers, which should ensure that, that whilst employees are able to move across departments, these employees must be suitably qualified for the jobs to which they are being transferred and also to ensure that appointments additional to the establishments are not abused in the public service. These medium term amendments, ladies and gentlemen, I, env I envisaged to take place over the next financial year and will be informed by inputs emanating from current research and deliberation and of course this endeavor. As we consider these matters of, of significant to note, excuse me, is the process currently underway to amend the Public Service Act and the Public Administration Management Act. Currently, we have two draft amendment bills, which were published in April 2021 for public comment, and these bills are both at an advanced stage. Uh, these bills seek to advance strides made in the achieving a professional, ethical, and capable state. In terms of the Public Service Amendment Bill, it seeks to devolve administrative powers to the head of department whilst ensuring that we retain strategic powers with the executive authority. Please excuse that typo is not with the head of department, rather with the executive authority. The Public Service Amendment Bill bill also seeks to augment the functions of the Director General in the Presidency to align these with the functions envisaged by the National Development Plan for the Administrative Head of the Public Service. The Public Administration Management Act also seeks to clarify the role of the President and the Premier in relations to the Heads of Department. What the Public Service Amendment Bill seeks to do also is to clarify the role of the Public Service Commission in relation to, or rather in determining the internal grievance procedures. The bill also seeks to prohibit heads of department from holding political office in a political party and to provide mechanisms for departments to lawfully deduct overpaid remuneration from employees. And lastly, the Public Service Amendment Bill seeks to clarify the meaning of minister. This is in the context of the President's powers to delegate, to delegate some of his powers to cabinet members. The Public Administration Management Bill, on the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, seeks to further the single public service administration agenda by addressing legal difficulties in the implementation and application of the PAMA to distinguish between 
transfers within the public service and transfers between municipalities as well as transfers in the public service and within municipalities. The PAMA amendment bill also seeks to provide for appropriate definitions to removing unintended consequences in the interpretation of the, of the PAMA. We also want to ensure through the PAMA bill that the NSG has an appropriate organizational form. This, of course, while ensuring that the NSG continues to provide education and training to employees in all spheres of government, and you will note that this includes the municipalities as well. We want to, through, of course, the Public Administration Management Bill, remove unfair disparities in the public administration. We will do this by creating a framework within which remuneration and other conditions of service of employees are determined. And lastly, through the PAMA, we want to provide for more coordination in the mandating arrangements for collective agreements, sorry, collective bargaining, pardon me, in the public administration. So, ladies and gentlemen, once these amendment acts are passed, it will be necessary to repeal the entire set of regulations that we're currently working on. This, therefore, brings us to the long-term review of the regulations. The proposed amendments will require extensive changes to the public service regulations. As I've mentioned, uh, one of the proposed amendments through the public service amendment bill is that we're devolving powers which currently resides with executive authorities to heads of department, meaning this will have to change the current regulations that we have. As we go through these different processes, we are mindful that it is not ideal to constantly amend the regulations in such short period of time, as this has the potential to create disruptions and confusions within the public service. Therefore, as we work through the regulations and of course this process, we will have to manage these very carefully. Um, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we urge you to please collaborate with us ensure your wisdom and experience to, to ensure that these reforms truly achieve the objective required of us. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, Amo. Um, I would like to take this opportunity, colleagues, to um, open the platform for discussion, questions, comments that you'd like to pose to our two presenters. Um, we all note hands, and there were roving mics yesterday, and I'm sure we still have them today. I see Puleng is walking up. By a show of hands, colleagues, or was it as clear as mud? Hey, she's being a BBT, what is it, BBT? I can't see very well. Uh, Puleng and Prince, please assist me in noting the hands. <laughs> My future is pitching. <laughs> Okay, I'm told there's a hand somewhere there at the back. There's one hand, is there, are there other takers? The second hand, or was it the first hand? Okay, maybe let me allow the, the lady to, to come in whilst we try and observe if there's other hands. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, uh, program director. Good morning, colleagues, and thank you to the two presenters. I think the, the two presentations, they, they complement um, each other very well. Um, maybe the comment that I'm gonna make, it's a question in a way will also um, uh, cover both. Firstly for me is the project plan, Cory, uh, that you put. I think it, it will be helpful if maybe at some stage, you start, when you unpack it, you go into those stages so that we can be able to know exactly what are your immediate to short term activities that you are going to embark and then maybe uh, specify those timelines. Um, and the second aspect is that 
I think for both presentation, um, did, did we welcome the reform to start with, and I think all the areas that focus, they are very important. These things that we've been raising uh, with DPSA over some a period of time. But I think it will be important that maybe we do some kind of a matrix um, around the, the impact of all the reforms that we want to make. Um, because not all of them are going to happen immediately. Yes, it's reviewing the regulations. Um, it, it can happen with immediate effect in terms of process. But we know that in terms of implementation, not all of them will take place at the same time. So maybe identifying those ones that are easy to implement and what will be their impact. Um, and then in that way, we can be able then to do the review, but cherry picking as well on things that can be, that can give us a fast uh, a, a traction. The second aspect goes to, it's more probably around the legal issues is that, is there a, a feasibility or possibility of having, um, being successful in reviewing the regulations without triggering the review of the Public Service Act itself. Um, because the regulations are your subordinate legislation. And so, and in responding to that, then you need to be able to factor in um, that, um, that, that, that what would it take for that process as well? And what are the risks that you see um, in us being successful to achieve uh, the, 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 uh, the regulations and, and successful implementation of the, um, the review. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have more hands? Uh, yes, ma'am. Bule? Thank you and good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, my question is um, to Mr. Corey Smith with regards to the review of chapter three, four, and five. Um, I just want to find out what, is the, what are the implications for those departments that are currently in the process of reviewing their organizational structures? What impact is the review of um, those chapters going to have on those departments. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's take the the third one and then I'll hand over to the presenters. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Program Director. My name is Debo Honga Mole. I'm from the Northern Cape, Kimberley. My question really is a, a process question and uh, perhaps information sharing. I want to check if uh, those who are leading the, the, this process, have they perhaps checked with uh, say our sister department, National Treasury, uh, was stuck with the problem of the review of procurement lately which arose from uh, uh, reviewing and changing regulations, and uh, I think they are still in a conundrum now in terms of generally procurement in the public service, which is, even if it's a mini collapse, it exists. So if we share perhaps experiences of how they arrived and how they got to where we are now, uh, are the, those who are leading the process perhaps engaging with them to say, uh, uh, how would your process so that we avoid the pitfalls that perhaps we, we find ourselves in? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Mudise. Oh, the other Mr. Mudise. <laughs> No, um, thanks, Program Director. Good morning, colleagues. Um, that's Mr. Litsadze, not Mr. Mudise. It's Mr. Mudise speaking. Thank you. No, no, uh, Program Director, I just quickly want to check. Um, 
When, when we talk about that, uh, the issue surrounding devolving the powers from EAs to AOs, um, I, I, I think it's a step in the right direction and it's something which must really be welcome. But one, uh, and I do hear that the presenter was talking about there's already two drafts and, and one wants to think already they dealt with the issue of the Public Service Act. But for me, in the main, I think uh, one other challenge um, is the issues around section 42A, 1A, where it says the minister may delegate. If we talk about the issue of devolving these powers, uh, does it mean um, as we are moving forward, we will also be touching at that particular section at some point? Because it's very problematic. We, yesterday we talked about the issues of vacancies and how, how to improve on the recruitment process. And for me, one stumbling block is that particular section. And I think um, even though at some point we tried through the delegations management framework of, of 2014, that has not been helpful, frankly, uh, in that push. But also, <coughs> last issue that I want to raise, um, and I think I might be perplexed, but the presenter will assist me. Somewhere the presenter indicate about distinguishing between transfers within the public service and transfers between municipalities and the public service and within municipalities. I'm not sure, so is there really such an urgent need in terms of really distinguishing that? Uh, I'm asking based on the backdrop that uh, we are saying we are moving towards a single public service. So I'm, I'm asking that based on that. Thanks, uh, Program Director. Okay. Um, I trust that my presenters have uh, noted the questions posed to them. Um, there was about one or two that I think were more process and one or two that it was not very clear which presenter the question is being posed to. Um, but I'm sure they will do their best to respond to your questions. DG? Oh, okay, okay, noted. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for those questions and comments and suggestions. I'm going to try to tackle a few of them and leave the others to Amu. I think the, the first speaker spoke about um, the project plan that we've got in place. Uh, we obviously shared with you fairly high level what we have in mind. But um, at, a, at a slightly more detailed level, Essentially, what our thinking is in the research phase is that we'll look at what the intent was for the existing legal framework, obviously both the Public Service Act and the regulations, because as you rightly point out, the regulations are subordinate legislation. We know that we've had waves of reforms, and uh, so you might not have a singular intent with the regulatory framework. There would have been waves of intent. Um, some of them have been complementing each others and maybe be, there's been some contradictions as well as we went along. So I think the idea of having some kind of a matrix that looks at uh, the evolution of those reforms is a very useful suggestion and we'll take that on board. So um, in as much as we'll do research um, in terms of international trends, particularly pertaining to the public services, we'll also focus on quite a few reports that have been generated locally, um, including the one that uh, DDG Dutlutla referred to, the one that focused on the program one administrative burden, that's one of those relevant ones. But the Public Service Commission have also done some work, Planning Commission has done some work. So we'll tap into all of those reviews and um, make sense of them to have some kind of a consolidated sense of where the um, pressure points are. 
And I think the idea of maybe distinguishing between what are short-term gains versus longer-term gains makes a lot of sense to me. What are the quick ones that can be achieved? Small tweaks here and there. Uh, but then obviously some of the, the others might be uh, talking about um, certain core issues, um, root causes that need to be thought through um, in a bit more detail and could perhaps only be achieved in the, in the longer term. So I think we'll make that distinction, uh, no doubt about that. All right, let me see. The, uh, there was um, a second speaker, a um, person who asked questions around how does it affect us when we are embarking on the review of our organizational structures. I don't think the idea is to stop any of the work that is happening in terms of the existing regulations, but rather to substantively look at the regulations and how they're being applied and whether any changes should be considered to those. Um, in the organizational terrain, we know that there are these directives that have been issued, if I'm not mistaken, the last one was around 2016, that then requires departments to consult with the Minister for Public Service and Administration before they effect changes. So obviously we'll look at those directives as well, and um, you know whether they still um, are relevant and whether they still make sense in our current environment. Um, I think there will always be um, kind of a polarity that you have to manage. Um, so it's not a single solution. There could be certain unintended consequences, but there's also certain good intentions in terms of, and to find that balance. I think that, that's where the challenge will come in, but uh, we'll get our heads around all of that as we go along. So um, I think the other one referred to the whole experience at the moment, which is close to home in National Treasury around the uh, preferential procurement regulations that have been struck down um, by the higher courts. The latest has been the Constitutional Court, which has found the preferential procurement regulations um, unconstitutional. So um, it is a useful experience, a useful lesson, I think, to learn from that. But um, I think there, there are certain linkages, to my mind, with procurement versus appointment, especially when you bring people on board. Um, sometimes you can do that through having permanent people or people on fixed term contracts through the Public Service Act, or you can actually procure their services as consultants or advisors. And departments are often kind of um, um, in, in that conundrum, you know, having to choose the best possible option. And sometimes the lines get a bit blurred. Uh, so I think to that extent, will have a bit of a focus there as well in terms of those different options of bringing staff or um, capacity on board, either through the Public Service Act or the PFMA. Um, often there are challenges around that. Um, then I think the last two would be for AMU uh, around devolving to accounting offices and delegations and so on. Thanks. Um, I would like to respond to the first question. Excuse me, ma'am, I didn't get your name. But you asked if um, there's a possibility of reviewing the regs without reviewing the Public Service Act. So the plan currently is we're going to have two amendments. The first, which is our short-term amendment, will be informed by the agency. And I think that's the reason why we're here to amend the regulations based on the current challenges. The second plan is to have a long-term amendment of the regulations, which will be informed by the amendments to the Public Service Act. Um, it's important to note that the amendments that we are making to the Public Service Act are not re informed by the regulations. So some of the issues that are informing the amendments to the Public Service Act would be the NDP. We have had court challenges which require us to amend the Act. And the effect that those amendments in the Act will have is that we would have to amend the regulations, but that is in the long term. 
Um, the second question based on Treasury's um, regulations. So during our amendments of, in the process, sorry, that's a wrong choice of word. Okay, so in the process of amending the Public Service Act, the bill will be scrutinized by the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor to ensure that it passes um, constitutional master and that it is lawful. And that then let's see, um, you asked on that would you say, excuse me. And that then would you say you your questions were based on the devolution of powers from the EA to the DG. Um, so we have realized that relying on the delegation of powers from the EA to the DG is quite problematic and this is the problem that we're trying to solve by dev devolving powers from the EA to the HOD. In our current bill, there is no intention to amend section 42A1A, but we are amending 42A, um, 42A sub section two, yes, where the president can delegate powers to members of the cabinet. So that is the amendment that we're making. It is informed by policy. Uh, I'm not sure if there's policy to amend 42A1A. Um, and in terms of transfers, I think you know that there's another version of me who's sitting in the office and is uh, responsible for the PAMA. I hope I do justice on answering the questions to the PAMA. So you will realize that when certain sections of the PAMA come into effect, um, they will repeal other sections of the Public Service Act, and one of those sections would be the section dealing with transfers. So it is agent that we make provisions for transfers in the PAMA because once, that come, once the PAMA comes into operation, then it repeals the Public Service Act. Um, I hope that covers all the questions. Thank you. I'd like to apologize for not acknowledging and greeting the colleagues that are joining us virtually. I think when you don't see the screen in front of you, you forget that there there's other colleagues that, that are joining us. So my, my apologies <laughs> for that. You mustn't repeat the mistakes of the past, um, like forgetting yesterday. I would therefore like to check if there's any questions that have been raised um, through the, from the colleagues in the virtual platform. Um, okay, looks like we do have one or two. Prince? Um, thank you, DG. There's one question from Heinrich Lecky. Uh, please clarify Section 38 of the Public Service Act 2017, uh, which was found unconstitutional. And the question is, can a salary deduction be actioned without due cause? Is this legal? And then relating to my question, debt was added to salary and notch was, re was reduced. Can this happen if Section 38 was found unconstitutional? Okay. Um... I was actually just whispering to Amo that uh, the, what has happened with the procurement regulations reminded me of what has happened with Section 38. So Amo, um, you were well prepared um, for, for this question. I'm not sure if you got the second part of the question, Prince. It was something about salary. Debt was added to salary and notch. Oh, debt was added to salary? but the notch was reduced. Can this happen okay. if Section 38 was found unconstitutional? Okay. Amo? Thanks again, Prince. Um, okay, so the provision that deals with the correction of a salary in the Public Service Act is still applicable. 
it's section 38.2, subsection B, that was declared unconstitutional uh, because it made provisions for the employer to deduct salaries from an employee's salary, um, to deduct overpayments from an employee's salary. Um, and that is what we're fixing. So part of the plan is to provide for a mechanism which will ensure that um, the salary is recovered in a constitutional manner. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, before we break for tea, I'm advised that there's one more comment from the virtual platform. So I, it's not me, it's the comment that's standing between you and your tea. Um, Thank you, DG. This one is from Ms. Mamela Mohammed. There's been an outcry that the regulations slash DPSA has no teeth. Are the regula regulatory reviews intended to respond to that in any way? Okay. Um, <laughs> over to you, <laughs> Ms. Smith and uh, Mr. Smith and uh, Amo. I yeah, I don't know who wants to attempt a response at that. That the DPSA has no teeth. Are the proposed reviews to the regulations going to, okay, now I'm paraphrasing, help the PSA grow the teeth, basically. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that um, my supervisor, or Ms. Renisha and I do always say is when we draft law is we don't make law for the bad guys. Um, but just to uh, give a short answer to this question, we have a section 16A in the Public Service Act and it requires compliance and provide that uh, there's compliance with all mechanisms. So every law that we draft, it has a 16A as a backing and you would have to comply with that. I hope um, I covered that. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think from I agree with Amu. I think that's a very powerful provision in the Public Service Act that actually ensures that steps are taken against the transgressors. Obviously, having it in the Act doesn't mean that it actually happens. I don't know how many cases have we had where people have been charged with misconduct because they haven't complied with one or other provision of the Act. But um, to my mind, again, this is the issue about polarity because Yes, you can um, ensure compliance, but at the same time, it's almost like SARS to me. When the SA Revenue Services, when they are start, starting to think of clamping down on people who are not paying their taxes, the first focus that they had was on ensuring that we've got streamlined tax regulation and that you've got an efficient system that makes it easy for people to comply. So it doesn't help that you come with a big stick that you're gonna hit people with if you have got nonsensical rules and regulations and you've got an inefficient system. So we must make sure that our rules and regulations are efficient and effective and that our systems are actually in place that actually encourages compliance rather than people seeing it as a burden to comply. So I think we can take maybe some lessons out of the SARS experience there. And then I'm also reminded by the provision that Palma has made for the establishment of the Office on Standards and Compliance. So to my mind, once that office is properly set up, then that will provide a very powerful mechanism to DPSA 
for oversight um, because I do think there's a case to be made for improved oversight. Um, and um, I think we need to, that, that instruments are starting to take shape as far as I understand. And I think we'll probably start seeing the benefits of that Office of on Standards and Compliance in, in years to come. Thanks. We don't make laws for the bad guys. DJ? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I just, I wanted firstly to just clarify the role of GTEC in the process. That GTEC is supporting us in respect to the uh, HRMND regulations review and policy directives review. And um, however, the entire set of regulations are being reviewed. So the different branches within the department as well as legal are playing a role in terms of that review. And um, so uh, I do think that we must um, uh, come out with consolidated timelines in respect to the entire reviews pro process. There's the GTEC aspect, um, um, and then there's the aspect of, of the reviews that we're also handling from our time, from our side, and integrate both processes. The ideal was that um, by end of the first quarter, we would have finished this process. Now, the end of the first quarter is June 2023, 2022, sorry. And, um, and, and some of the low hanging fruits, there's lots of low hanging fruits, things that we could um, uh, immediately implement um, uh, once we have um, uh, completed the process and we have regulations that have been approved having followed process. But um, in my mind, we're still working on that time frame. but we need to consolidate. And then we need to have a, out of this session, we'll have a very consolidated um, a tracking and time frames. The other important component of this process is that we would want to engage with provinces. Um, 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 and maybe departments at cluster level, I'm not sure. But certainly provinces, we want to engage with them. And um, so we have a session that's due with DGs of provinces in April, early in April, and we want to propose to them dates uh, by which uh, different teams from DPSA could be um, engaging with the provinces in a, almost a similar fashion, but on a smaller scale and maybe over one day to focus on the provincial input into the regulations. We may have to do that with clusters. Um, uh, we will have to check that and see uh, w the possibilities in relation to that so that by the time we, we conclude the regulations, the review, the new, by the time we introduce the new regulations or the reviewed regulations, rather, we are com comfortable that we have really um, spoken to colleagues and have um, uh, got the information that we require. We'll do that assessment. The, the other issue is that has been raised is around, okay, I've spoken about the low hanging fruit. So basically what we'll do, Matt, I think the idea of a matrix I like, and also to identify the low hanging fruits. What are the things that can be implemented um, um, immediately without uh, some of the things, I mean, the kind of deviation requests and the kind of complaints that we get from clients show that some of the things cannot wait um, for a cycle of a financial year before you implement because uh, you don't need to change much in the system in order to be able to do that. Um, there's a last issue I wanted to speak to. It's just this idea of regulations, uh, whether they have teeth or not. I mean, I agree with the spirit that um, um, uh, the, regulations, the regulations should be empowering by their nature. So uh, what is important is for us to use regulations to improve efficiencies. Um, uh, for, for, for the clients that we work with and for ourselves and to think about the outcomes that we want to get out of the process so that it's not regulations for the sake of control, for the sake of controlling people, but it's regulations for the sake of ensuring that we improve governance, we improve in terms of outcomes that we expect. 
Uh, for instance, uh, most of the work that we do, like in, in HR, M&D, uh, HR, M&D, labor relations, these are decentralized responsibilities. So if a department does not implement um, regulations or does not implement what is required, um, we as the department writes to the department, uh, to the relevant department, we escalate to the MPSA, we may report to cabinet, we may also, there's also disciplinary processes that a particular EA can take in respect to failure to implement some of the regulations. So the, the, the regulations, the, the act provides the capability, but whether EAs and other people involved in the process decide to prioritize and to do what is necessary to be done is something else. I also believe that you don't have to use a stick all the time to deal with issues. You also have to work with people, empower them, understand where the problems are, uh, so that you also don't overwhelm them in the process. I do think when I reflect at times that, and I always say to colleagues at DPSA, that all my life I've been a client of DPSA. Um, it's only now that I'm working at DPSA, but I bring in the experience and the strength of having been a client of DPSA, having experienced what happens in departments. On the day a report is due, people from HR will be running around trying to track you wherever you are so that you can sign, so that they submit. That's malicious compliance in my view. Uh, because reports that go to DPSA should have gone through a particular process in the department. But departments will tell you that the system is overloaded, this and that and that reason. Whether those reasons are a true fact or not, I don't know. Uh, but from what we're hearing um, uh, from colleagues, that issue keeps on coming. So from our side as well, we have that responsibility to prioritize and to be clear about the outcomes so that the regulations are linked to the outcomes and the type of a public service that we think we want to bring. Understanding um, uh, what Matsi has raised about the fact that there are certain areas where the Public Service Act may require uh, amendments or review. There's a process to review or amend the Public Service Act, so how do we align for those longer term issues we may, we may want to see in the regulation. Some issues actually are not even about changing regulations, but it's about scrapping the current policy directives and consolidating our policy directives and updating accordingly. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're doing very well with time. Um, according to our program, we have concluded the morning session and um, we should be breaking for tea around 11. However, my watch says it's just about quarter to 11. I'm not sure if it's correct. We're supposed to take 30 minutes. So I wanted to check with colleagues if we can come back at about quarter past 11 instead of half past. Um, that will probably, if we continue doing this well, probably give us a 45 minute um, lunch break instead of the 30. But it will all depend on how we, we fare with the, the session after the tea. Um, I suppose you still remember where tea is, so I will release you for now and then request that we, we bring ourselves back without having to be called back at uh, quarter past 11. Um, but just hold on uh, for me for a, a minute, thank you. Um, would like to take this opportunity to once again thank our two presenters for very useful presentations and I think they did very well in answering um, the questions. I didn't think there was a particular question that caught them off guard or where they had to bite their tongues. So because of that good performance, we'd like to reward you. Uh, seeing that the performance bonuses are also coming to an end, so um, it's an early performance bonus. Please uh, come in front. Um, Prince, as delegated yesterday, will um, be handing over the presents to you. Thank you.
ethics officers who are here, they need to declare. Thanks colleagues, enjoy your teas, coffees, and whatever is your refreshment of choice.
colleagues hi can we can we please settle down Hello, you're wearing my dress. Yeah, just just stand there. Uh, colleagues, we've come to that part of our program where we are going to put you in spaces where you'll start uh, bonding with each other and uh, getting to know each other through discussion. Um, we'll be having uh, plenary discussions on some of the areas that are regulated in the public service um, and uh, seeking your advice on what would be some of the amendments or changes or recommendations that uh, you would want to feedback to the DPSA. So we have three areas, um, planning, organizational arrangements and service delivery in the public service, that's very packed. We have employment matters, we have senior management services, and then we have information management and electronic government. Um, when I was counting earlier, um, we are just over 100 people. I think if I take a guess, it's around 120 or just about. So if we have four sessions, we should at least have 40 or more people um, in a session. So, 25, 400, BBT. Um, but I think without anyone counting us, uh, because that will take a very long time, we just need to try and make sure that we've got as equal number of people per per commission so that we, we are able to spread ourselves um, effectively. So we'll have uh, facilitators for those sessions and uh, the gender composition is not deliberate. For the, <laughs> for the session on planning, organizational arrangement and service delivery, we'll have uh, Mr. Marcel Wilson uh, Marcel, you can raise your hand. Thank you. The Commission on Employment Matters uh, will be facilitated by Mr. Manda Ngobo. Thank you. The Commission on Senior Management Service will be facilitated by Mr. Mudise Litsatsi. So you see what I was saying? And the last session uh, on informa information management and electronic government will be facilitated by Mr. Willy Vugela. Okay, so we will be splitting into those four commissions and um, into different venues. So the commission on planning organizational arrangements okay i think it really actually doesn't matter but the three commissions we will be meeting outside of this venue um the nice lady here with the pretty dress 
will guide you because it's a, it's a venue outside, so it's a, it, it's a few steps to that venue. So she will allocate the three commissions, which is the, all the other commissions except for the Commission on Information Management and Electronic Government, which will remain in this venue. And um, we'll also then request the colleagues that are participating virtually to participate in, in this commission as well. Um, when we come back to plenary, if they have any other questions around the other commissions, we'll find a way of um, accommodating that. So before we then uh, move out, um, there's just a security announcement. Don't panic yet. There's a white Mercedes-Benz. They wrote it in full. <laughs> so it's a white Mercedes-Benz C200. The number plates are YBC 2020 GP. And your boot is open. I don't see any movements. Okay, so YBC 2020 GP, you need to go and attend to your boot. Okay, I see someone moving out. Is it your car, sir? <laughs> it's the CFO, he looks uh, disillusioned. Yeah. Okay. Colleagues, we will have um, those sessions then. We are bang on at 11.30. So we will only come back from those commissions at um, 2 o'clock. So after the commissions, we'll go for lunch. And I just need to request the facilitators that uh, before you commence with your sessions, please um, have the group nominating a scriber and somebody will come back and give the report, although I always find it very challenging when you have somebody writing and somebody coming to read what somebody else has written. But I think you'll figure it out um, in your own groups. Uh, we'll just like to, when you come back then, to take the, the inputs that uh, you, you would have discussed. So we can start moving out. Um, for colleagues that, um, will be going out of the venue. I think it's advisable that you take your valuables with you so that we don't have stories when we come back. You will come back at two o'clock. Lunch is at half past one. So effectively, you'll have two hours or so. Um, Leah is looking at me as if I'm making a mistake. That, that's what the program says, Leah. Am I getting it wrong? Okay. So lunch is at 1.30. Um, but I think as soon as you are finished in your commissions, they can move to lunch at least from 1 o'clock. I think lunch should be ready. So it will depend on, on, on how quickly you finish in your commissions. So let me release you with... Uh, well wishes for fruitful discussions, and we'll see each other back here at two o'clock. Thank you. So remember, you can follow both Prince and uh, Leah to guide you to where you need to go. Can you give me your cloth there?
Colleagues, good morning. Good morning. I think those who are not part of the ICT who are leaving the room, uh, just do like that quickly. We need to start. Uh, I'm not sure whether we can move front or we're okay where we're sitting is fine but it should be good sometimes if we are able to to move front and then we can engage properly our commission is going to deal with the ict issues i think yesterday you had a lot of discussion on the robotic the future work the ict the it all those things. So we're going to develop here a process which will inform that kind of work. Thank you for those who are moving front. I'll app I appreciate that. That's why I decided to get the roving mic than to stand there like a statue. So just we can move along here. We have the scribe and the rapporteur. Uh, there is, I will. If I can get two people describing, there is one, Tandile, you can raise your head, Tandile. She'll be assisting, unless somebody wants to assist here, the rapporteur will be Zaid. I'll be presenting a presentation that we prepare that can spark the debate and stimulate the discussion. 
so that we're able to prepare something that will present to the to the commission to the plenary uh, after I've gone through a number of things. Thank you very much. My name is Willie Vukela. I'm in the DPSA. Uh, I'm in charge of government services and access in government. So, yeah, service delivery, uh, that's part of my work. Which, by the way, to deliver service in the new environment, you may need applications in ICT. Thank you very much. Uh, I would love to introduce ourselves, but we don't have time, by the way. Because at a small commission, we can know each other, we bond, we establish a relationship, friendship going forward after this. But perhaps if we finish early, we can do that in that regard. I'll appreciate that. So that Kibut, Ritsivane, we know each other. Minani Mutonga, you know, we like greeting each other. Uh, so, yeah. There's a presentation that we're going to make here. It's unfortunate that this presentation was made, or nonetheless, we, we just came through the entire environment on ICT. And I think in assist to spark the debate, and more of the things that this presentation will, 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 will raise are things that were raised yesterday's discussion, many of them by the minister, by the deputy minister and the presenters. So, and therefore we need to develop something that will assist this country going forward. I'm sure all of us, you know, that as a country, we're looking behind on ICT meters. And somebody raised here, yeah. when I was driving this morning, I tuned in Power and SAFM. The talk show was one, queues in frontline services. And the report that was released yesterday on home affairs, you might have read the report. People are saying, why there are queues in every home affairs in this year's and age? So these people are sitting here, we must deal with those issues of queues. All of you have got smartphones. Even Google's today, when they go to get them, then they've got smartphones. What can utilize the advantage of technology to do that? I don't have answers, but as a country, we must spark that debate. This presentation and to the plenary, it must provoke. When I was preparing it with Zaid, I said to Zaid, the problem that South Africa we have, we like talking. That Africa we like talking, we like talk shows, we like opinions, and we massage the problems. We paint them nicely. We don't confront the situation because we want to be relevant. So I said, if we can step up of that to say, what is the problem today in the country? That will inform the decisions that we'll have to move forward with. I think that preamble, I wanted us to prepare our minds to say, there's no yes or no answers. We know the problem, all of us. All of us, we know the problem. And COVID has proven us that there is a problem in the country. Compared to our, our, our peers, whether it's a BRIC nation, the country in the East, this, well, in Africa today, Kenya is taking over the space. Rwanda is moving. Sudan is coming. We are not moving. We have got all the infrastructure in the country today. So what is the problem? Why are there still queues wherever you go? Why can't you renew your, your disk lessons in your computer? And then you print, you pay online, you print there. Why can't you do that? So these are things that we must debate, all of us here, colleagues. Thank you very much in that. Uh, here, the overview, I raise problem to say, let's deal with the opportunity that this problem presents, whether it's this pandemic or the future challenges that will face as a country. The capability is there, we saw in 2010. We saw it in 2010. 
we use technology even to link all our stadiums. All of them. From Cape to Messina. We built cable underground in 2010. We built the highway. The fixed network is there underground. We got what we call the mobile network, which the local loop, we could not even uh, uh, open it. So those are the challenges. There are issues that we can say enable digital transformation success. What are these things? The importance of effective asset functions in the journey that they want to march as a country. Today is 2022. We are still talking. In 1999, President Mbeki introduced the e-government. In 1999. How many years is it now? Today, we are still talking e-government. In 1999, as a country, we are in the dot-com. When South Africa hosted Korea in Sheraton for three months, studying South Africa. In 2004, President Mbeki in his sauna announced that South Africa must establish an ICT university in 2004. Today is 2022. Where is it? None. We're still talking. That's the journey. The need for catalytic initiatives, as I said, move away. We want to see this car moving. It's not moving, but we're busy buying the new mags, the new tires, the respray it, but the car cannot move. Let's confront the situation, all of us. We know the problem. And our decision makers here. Existing regulations and proposals. This is where I differ a lot with my with many colleagues. Existing regulations. When there is a problem, you don't talk to regulations. Because regulations are subordinate legislation. You go to the authority that made regulations to be in existence. You correct it. So that's what I'm saying. We've got this car which is not moving. Which is 16 tire wheel, you want to put 18 tire wheel, you want to put the meg wheel, you want to display. The car will never move. But it will be very beautiful. We, we deal with the opportunities. And then let's listen here. I don't know if I've got sound, uh, colleagues. The digital revolution is taking root across the globe, unleashing unprecedented growth and opportunity, creating new forms of work and learning, and forever changing the way we live, interact, and experience the world around us. This powerful new reality has been set in motion by the actions of those before us. Our onward journey can be shaped by the policy choices that governments make today new digital opportunities and more affordable ways to be connected will see people putting technology to work in ways that promise even greater benefits. Exciting cognitive technologies are on the brink of breakthrough. The Internet of Things is laying the ground for smart cities and autonomous vehicles. And mobile innovations and customized apps are extending financial inclusion and closing the gaps in essential services for those on the margins. With mobile continuing to bring down traditional barriers, we'll see the exponential growth of connected societies where everyone can play their part in creating a more empowered and resilient future. At this crucial time, forward-thinking governments will encourage network investment. They'll change regulation to reflect this new digitalized world they'll focus on promoting the growth of digital economies and they'll demonstrate digital leadership to take their countries, economies and citizens forward. As the architects of change, leaders and policymakers hold the power in their hands to shape an inclusive digital future that leaves no one behind. That future begins today. Thank you very much. 
That's the reality we're facing. That future begins today. We have, we have looked at how other countries have traversed in the issue of technology, using application, smart cities, smartphones, uptake. The appetite is there. That future begins now. So the issue of what thinking of, as I've indicated, of governments that need to think and provide a vision. The NDP is very clear on issues of this nature, on access, on ICT. Legislation, which I, I don't know whether it does exist, do we have any roadmap in the country on ICT, except the police. I'm not sure they're called from DCDT here. DCDT, they're not here. They have what we call the ACA Connect for broadband access. That policy is saying by 2020, there will be 100% penetration. Today is 2022. The policy, when it was passed, it was saying by 2020, trying to move with the NDP. NDP is left with eight years, seven and a half years. It says it's the 2030 vision. If you scan through the NDP, how far have you gone as a country? Zero. We're eight years to close it. Broadband, ASA Connect says by 2020 in South Africa, there shall be 100% penetration in all the public places, schools, clinics, hospital. Do we have that penetration? It's a, something that we must ponder in this, in this commission. You've got a big job to do. Demonstrate the child leadership as a country, we'll show you in the slide what has to mean. The architect of change as of demonstrated. Change leadership on ICT in the country. We'll, I will show you what the AG is saying, which are impediment to some of these things moving forward. So I'm just scanning through what other policies are saying, which, by the way, we own them as a country. At high level, we are saying as a problem, we have to identify opportunities as far back as 2000. I said in 1999, President Mbeki was a champion of e-government. In 1999. Today, there's no e-government there's no e today. We look at the issue of transformation of services, as I've indicated. Wherever you go today in the front line services, there's a queue everywhere. Even to check the, the update of the progress of your passport, you must first go in queue. Why can't you key it in there, put your ID number, it tells you your passport now is here. The way we do with the, this take a lot, your keys are ordering things online, it's amazing. They'll tell you, Daddy, I've ordered PlayStation. Now it's being packaged. Now it's being this, shipped. Now it's being this. It's coming tomorrow, Daddy. Why? Why with government you can't do it? When you want to take a U.S. Pa a, a visa, you don't even go to U.S. Embassy. You stand by the wall. You take your phone. You take yourself a picture. You fill the form. You send it. They screen you. They send you a visa. You print it. Why with us everything we must go? I don't have answers. You've got answers. There are issues of investment in technology by government department. Government department are investing a lot in technology. All your department are investing in technology. Is the value add? Zero. But money is living. No value add. Zero. You are even changing uh, computers, getting the, what do you call this, book, what, what, notebook. Next year, get this. No value. Proliferation of mobile technologies. Ikasa says 63% of AC household has access to internet. 63% of the country have access to internet. Now, look at what I said on the ASA Connect policy. 
that says by 2020 we need to have 100 percent penetration department of dc did to drive digital transfer for the country it's a question mark i was asking are they here look at their mandate they are called department of digital communication whatever technologies they are not here having a public service administration to drive digital transformation for the public service is the dpsa is it doing it is there anything from dpsa that martial government to say government we are in COVID situation this is how government must conduct itself in doing business precisely on the issue of online application zero we are here as dpsa there are issues of CETA established as the state technology agency of government as a functionary to be the master champion of ICT in government. Today you talk about CETA everywhere. Nobody wants to hear the word CETA. No one. Because they are very expensive. They say they cannot maintain their system. Most of the departments are always offline. And some even go to private sector users. I don't know whether it's because CETA is government or it must privatize it to make it private. Perhaps it can change. I don't know. Leadership hungry for technology advancement, as I've indicated. Do we have that kind of leadership today? Whether DGs, who got passion for ICT, whether ministers, who got passion for ICT. Do we have such where we can model around them to say, you become the face of ICT. When you talk ICT, you lead. I don't think so. Lack of digital regulator in the country. ICASA was established after we collapsed for regulators. Those who understand the ICT space. We used to have the IBA for broadcasting, SATRA for telecoms, postal for post of postal sector, and the for commerce. All of them were collapsed in 2008 to establish ICASA by then. But in today's arrangement, do you still want a CASA in the current form or do you want a digital regulator in a different form? I don't know. Now, let's deal with the enabled success digital communication. There are strategies that reflect the capability and opportunities. There are governance issues, the model organizational structures and departments, uh, recruitment and development in terms of different workers, as I've indicated, the creation of and the acquire the assets and technology. So if you look in many departments that you are sitting, look at your IT department. How many employees work there? One or two? It's a fact. I can ask all of you, your department, Let's look at the complement of the IT division. How many are you? If you are five, you are lucky. One or two. And most of them are intern. And you want to go for forward future working. You are joking. You are joking. It's a fact. In DPSA, Tandile, how big is our IT stuff? Five. And there, the policies DPSA must marshal the whole government. She said, director, I said, hey. You see what I'm talking about? Is there appetite? No, we like talking. We took two in ten and put them in IT. No, look at our land and webmaster and everything. That's why they're saying the future for us is pension. We're going pension. A closer look at the pillars in our context. The strategy that we talk about, DPSA 
digitized government started in 2018, which cabinet approved. Cabinet approved, we dust it, put in the drawer, as I is there in the drawer, that strategy. I don't even know, people know about the strategy sitting here. DCD, the National Government Strategy and Roadmap 2017 approved by Cabinet. DPSA, Draft Government Policy Framework, and some departments having different strategies. Some of you, you have initiated that. All departments have five-year strategic plans, largely void on digitization effort. Look at our start plan, all of you. There's nothing on IT digitization. There's nothing. All of you look at departments, start plan. There's nothing on digitization. Some slide I will just pass. Uh, the safe delivery model that I was talking about, indicating at the far left, looking at departments which are frontline, and I will provide the model and modes to render services. I won't talk on those. I think we know the problem. We understand why things are not working that way it should work. Now, DCDT has a law called the ECT Act. Electronic Communication and Transitional, Transitional Act. That gives DCDT powers to, to, to run ICT beyond government. To ensure that there is broadband access in communities. And the Public Service Act gives mandate to the Department of Public Service Administration to ensure that there is e-government in government, government to government transition. The two are not the same. DCDT mandate is to ensure that beyond government, there must be transaction. There must be, there must be tools, there must be road, 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 highways, applications, and everything. DPSA mandate, the Public Service Act, is to ensure that government can transact with government. That's where the difference is. And there's a challenge there because to transact, you need a tools, you need applications. I won't bore you with this history that I've indicated. In DPSA, we used to have an office of government chief information officer. We've changed it to something else because it was not a default to call that office an office of government. Government, meaning that that office is responsible for all government ICT matters, assisting the entire government, national and provincial. And then DCDT, a good CETA, that assists with infrastructure and applications which many departments have indicated they are now using a third player, a private sector player, because of CETA's capability. This is just a governance of existing public service regulations. Uh, we, will, we will come back to this slide, which will not do the issue of, 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 of content for today. Let me pass this. I want to, let me jump this specific slide. Now, when we deal with the issue, as indicated, the issue of recruitment and not develop capacity in different spheres of government, there are 1.1 million employees today in public service. But 4.5 are in ICT functions, which translate to 0.3%. We want to digitize government. It's like we say, Muruti, take a priest, Umufe, or no, build me a dam. He's an engineer. Muruti will pray in tongues and everything. There will be no dam, but he will pray. That's what we're doing. There are 1.1 million. Only 4.5 are in ICT. 
as I said, we moved from dot com in 1990 now, we're in net, meaning that everything must be in the applications. You must carry your department when working in your phone. You must click. It can tell you the staff complement, the gender base in the department, the new recruit, da 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 da. In your phone, we don't have to call HR. HR go and open a big drawer. They remove all big files. They start reading. No. No. It must be in your phone. So how can you do it with 0.3% capability? Or taking the future of work. Now, the investment, as I've indicated to you. In 2018, we government invested 19.5 billion in ICT projects. In 2019, we invested 21 billion in ICT projects. 2020, 21 billion in ICT projects. The roundup can just say 62 billion. No value. No value. That money is gone. We're going to put another money this year. It will go. Again, next year we'll come with all these papers sitting here. No value. ICT functions ineffective and lacking mature practice. It's because there is no appetite to mature these functions by departments. You can't blame officials. As I say, is there a zeal and appetite to somebody who understand what the value as they can bring in your sector? Whether it's a health sector, education sector, we saw private schools going through their learning during COVID. Our kids were suffering because they prefer a chalkboard and a chalk. Private sector, we're doing it. A teacher with COVID in hospital learn bay teaching. Learners at home. You gave them computers connecting. What about our kids? Who want the chalk and the chalkboard? Chalkboard cannot come to my house. They were sitting at home. Let's confront these things. You go to private hospital, you book a bed online. I'm coming. E bed, you book a bed. When I hospital, the bed is ready. Public, you go with your own mattress. Your own water. Why? Why public sector is like this? That's the veil I'm talking about. 88% of departments in 2019 have demonstrated the weak IT control. That's the AG report. Go and read the AG report. AG raised these issues. 92% of departments in 2020, they've demonstrated weak IT control. With the value of 62 billion flushed out that we cannot account for. 90% of departments demonstrated weak at the control. That's the AG. Governance structures in departments, as I've indicated, are the ICT steering committee. Is the ICT structure that meet to discuss the matters of ICT in departments? Zero. If they are there, they've never met. Because we don't understand the veil of this concept called ICT. 63 departments, the AG found that there was no appetite on IT governments in 2019. 2020, 65%. 2021, 63%. This is the core function that must drive your service delivery. No appetite. Look at your ex code agenda where MECs and ministers discuss. Is the IT agenda? Zero. Why? 
we must talk future of work. It's future of pension, not future of work. IT projects. 50% of 34 IT projects that did not meet the business expectations that the AG. It's a symbol or a symbol. IT project departments. 50%. They never met. IT con contract failures. 25% of 37 IT contracts did not intended benefits. They failed. It's a reality. It's not a thumb thug. It's not a hypothesis. It's not a guess story. It's a fact. Digital, we sitting here. I want to see the agenda of the ex of Gauteng. If there is any IT agenda, there's nothing. It's nothing. When the past pipe burst year, go to deep slot. Water run six months. Pipe burst year, they'll first dig from up there. What kind of smart pipes? When the best tells you there's a pipe in this dimension is best, you only dig there, you fix it. That's ICT. We are a water scarce country. Water is leaking away. What are the underlying causes? Lack of oversight, as I've indicated. Oversight, no appetite by any higher level structure of departments of provinces on ICT matters. Inadequate support from your structures, whether it's EXCO, it's your MANCO, whether, I don't know what you call their structure, I don't know what they call it, but there is no appetite to make controls. Lack of skills and capacity. You've seen only 0.3% today in government of good skills in ICT. 0.3%. These are people who can tell us what must we do to make sure that we talk future of work. Insufficient budget that we put because we don't understand the value that ICT brings. Global government spend upwards to 4% global. Look at what Singapore. Many of you have been to Singapore to do the benchmarks. All of you have been to Singapore. We're going to Singapore. Singapore benchmarks. What happened to the benchmarks? Huh? DG. You've been to Singapore many times. And what happened to the benchmarks of Singapore? It's a fact. We've been to China, all of us. We had yesterday... When the USA, when they went to China, they were able to monitor our movement. Sit in their office. Here you must hire a policeman move behind you. There you won't even see a policeman. Whatever you do, they caught you. When you arrive in Singapore, immigration, there's nobody in immigration. You just go in there, there's a window. You put your face, it scan you, pass. You put your passport, pass. There's nobody. Here, if they must face open, they must first call somebody, stamp the ID, stand the ear. Queue is moving. Plane is moving. Where are we? We said we want to peer ourselves with the best in the world. How to solve this maturity problem? Okay, we've just put something there to say put governance structures, let there be appetite. You know, plan, business case and oversight. These are just minimum things. You know, departments must reconfigure their structures. You know, I was saying to Zaid, if we, we need to achieve this, we must turn the statistic around. We may say by 2024-25, departments, 90% of your employees, when you recruit, must have ICT skills. Now you'll be talking. 90% of this department, people that we are recruiting, they must understand this basic understanding of ICT. 
that will inform the bigger government and the future. These are still continuation of, of this I've indicated, the planning, the structure, the governance that we need to put in place. Now, yes, the issue of accountability at the AG of raised resources, the interface between DPSA, DCDT, CETA as a functionary of the state that must roll out broadband for the entire country. The need to catalytic projects that energize and inspire, yeah, transversal, standardized, frontline, open data opportunities, your IoT, Internet of Things. The data is a, is a, is a resource. Uh, I think you've listened to Wusani yesterday presenting, was say Sasa was able to process 5 million uh, beneficiary during COVID while they're at home. So that says something to say, meaning that Sasa may have perhaps two to three percent skills capability of officials. Look at the banks today. Banks are closing down. They're closing down all their branches. But service is moving. The chap is at home. You know, making breakfast. You call, hey, I want overdraft. He's saving his phone. Who are you? ID check, credit checks online, da da da. Approved. He does not need a building. I'm going to a bank. No. No. Banks are showing it that closing down all their branches. Officials are working, staying at home. Because it's, diff it's expensive to maintain a branch, to pay people, to pay electricity, everything, have capability. If Sasa can manage to, to, to register 500 beneficiaries while at home, I don't know what they are building now when we remove all the protocol of COVID, why they will need those buildings anymore. I don't know. Possible amendment of regulations will, will come back to it, as I've indicated. Let me finish. Yeah. I think I can go back to, to regulations and then I can allow discussion and then we deal with those issues. You know, this presentation, it provokes, as I said to you colleagues, Let's provoke the situation. We want to build this high-powered car called South Africa. This car must drive. The problem is the engine. Don't overhaul the tires and everything. Let's deal with the, what is the problem? You heard in the months ago the one machine of printing driver's lessons. One machine, it went to Holland, Germany. One in the entire country. Ha! Ah. South Africa. We close all the drivers. People even protested. One machine. It went to Germany to be fixed. My God. With smartphone in your hand. I don't know. There are potholes everywhere. It's only one machine. It's still filling potholes in another province. The time it reaches Messina, in free state, there are other photos. That machine must come by one machine. Let's provoke these things. Because if you don't provoke them, even our reporting colleagues, I don't want us to report, by the way, things that we know. They are not working. DPSA is failing government. DCDT is failing the country. CETA is failing both government and in 2000, President Beke talked about the e-cabinet. DG Masabe can talk about it. How many years now, DG? 20, 22 years. Is the e-cabinet. E Even today, President Ramaphosa said, why can't we have e-cabinet? Why you walk into the cabinet with no documents? There's a computer in every chair. What? You go to UN. When you go to UN, there are no documents. They only give you a password. You sit, screen in front of you, key a password, documents, agenda, everything. Here, we lack papers. 
Even today, there is no e-cabinet. All of you do keep memo, you process documents every day. In 2022. Go to Rwanda. It's a smart city. In Rwanda. Go to Germany. If a German, those guys who drinks a lot, you want to pee next to the wall. When you pee next to the wall, the water come back and smash you. That's ICT. They reconfigure the infrastructure. When you do wrong things, it responds. That P, it fell oh, back to you. It's not a joke. Uber has transformed the transport sector. You don't, you don't struggle anymore to wait for a taxi or a bus. You just, in your iPhone now, in two minutes, the car is waiting for you outside. This thing is doable. We've got ability as a country. Let's do it. Let me pause here. And then let's discuss. Because me, I think we must do something, colleagues. I spent most of my time in the ICT environment. I was in the communication for 17 years. That's why I, I understand these things. But we were failing. I wrote that ICT policy. Now I'm in DPSA. We're two talking e-government which President Becky and DG Ngaba, Dr. Ngaba talked in 20, 1999, e-government, when we hosted the Korean in Seraton. Smart wow. city. Go to Ooh. Egypt today, this smart wow. city. Go to Rwanda, wow. smart city. With wow. President, at least he dreamt two years ago. I'm sure that dream is coming. Let's see. It's a reality. These are not things that we must massage. We must confront them as they are. Why do you go wherever you go? What stops you? You can buy electricity, you can buy, consume municipal services on your phone today. Why can't you do everything in a bedroom? Why can't you apply for an ID in your house? You stand by the wall, you take yourself a picture, you put the details, you send this in you. They say, yes, we can yeah, confirm I guess for me. Why? Let me pause. Perhaps we can talk. So if, can I pause here? And then I want to come and deal with regulations. And then we, we make those inputs. That presentation is a fact. You can take it, present your yeah. Excuse. The literature that begs what we present today is a fact. What AG is saying, go and look at the AG report, is a fact. All as the project are failing in all government departments. All as the project are failing. And the skills is 0.3% in entire country. 0.3%. Because when I appointed me, I appointed Weltra in 1900, there was no ICT. Now, most of you join government using Telegram, from Telegram, fax, from fax, this. Now we want to give you ICT, say, oh, me, I've got three years to go. I don't want these things. Now we must talk the future for It's a fact. Zaid? Come and deal with, let me first take my brother here, introduce yourself and then, because I didn't take roll call, but I know we'll know each other. You can use this mic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheg. And good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm Cecilana from Eastern Cape, Department of Transport. Uh, che, perhaps the, the, the two years that we've gone through under COVID have, have, have done some, some, some changes in how we have perceived and have done certain things, especially around ICT. Yes, in some instances, you, you might be correct in terms of this picture, generally. But I, 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 <clears throat> I just want to, to share a different perspective in terms of what we've done. As a, as, a, as a department, perhaps the issue that we, we, we I think we have failed 
as, as, as a public service is to only expect ICT alone to make changes. Yet it ought to be led from, from the front. I'm not an IT specialist, I'm just a DDG. But what we've done, we made the point that we will have a structure that leads the, the transformation of ICT. Uh, I came into the department when there was a lot of issues around audit, like we are putting it. But we brought in the ICT steering committee, chaired by DDG myself and with chief directors. And we said, our ICT strategy will be led by us. ICT will enable. And what we did, we identified aspects of infrastructure and we said, let's procure servers and everything else. And within this period, we've managed to have an e-recruitment. No person comes to the Department of Transport and submit a Z83. It's embedded within the, what's name? Even the issue of signature is dealt with within that. E-leave, e you can apply for leave under a tree, wherever you are. And then the last one, we, 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 we said we're gonna automate uh, documentation, not only the HR documents, but all documents from creation to disposal within the entire Department of Transport. As I speak, this is my incoming. I don't carry files. Uh, all correspondence, everybody who must sign a document is just opening an iPad, read, sign, approve, it gets there. AG, when AG comes next year, they will just be given an access to the US name and then they'll do that. So all that has happened because as you are putting it, if the leadership of, of, of the department is not taking charge, ICT will always remain lonely. For instance, we said we're gonna, we're gonna invest on, on, on developers, software developers, we'll recruit them and bring them on board. I think now in my department, IT guys are more than 10 in terms of those who are, and now we're introducing business intelligence. What we're saying to say, I don't need to go to HR to check how many people have been employed this quarter. I just press the button and respond. So what I'm trying to say, there's a hope and we can do it. Thank you. I, I know about that. I do not want to be specific, but thanks my brother. I know there are pockets of excellence, but we're talking government. We should not lose the focus. We must, I like that. There are pockets, SARS is one of them, Western Cape is one of them. There are pockets of department which are doing well. But the agenda here is for government. We can take that model, we can take SARS model, we can, but government, why government is not moving? Pocket of excellence are there, I can tell you. And you appreciate that. I know uh, that it also it will assist your you are medical that I'm involved in in Eastern Cape, that 37 billion that you have been sued because there are no files to support the claims. The president hosted the IMC a month ago in Sheraton. The government owed close to 200 billion to lawyers litigations because of lack of files. So Zaid, deal with the issue of, okay, let me take my sister here. They will deal with the issue of regulations. But we thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sisi. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering if, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, let me just make an example. With financial compliance, we have the PFMA that guides us in terms of what should be done particularly the roles of accounting officers, of CFOs, and so forth. And um, should I say that the, the oversight is very strict in terms of compliance to the PFMA? And therefore, if I'm an executive, whether at a chief director, director, or what, so let me say, just say if I'm a member of SMS, even if I'm afraid of um, figures and so forth, but because of the fact that I know that the, the, the function is regulated and non-compliance is dealt with accordingly, I sort of make sure that 
somehow there are things that I do within my, my level that will make it a point that the overall um, organization contributes positively towards compliance to the financial management requirements. And therefore, I think that then assist, because even, even if I'm, I don't understand when CFOs are presenting, but I always make it a point that I contribute towards the overall organizational whatsoever. But I'm thinking that probably in, in ICT, which is also as technical as possible, I might be afraid even to explore what my laptop can do. But because the, the, there's nothing that is pushing me to know beyond the use of the IT tools, and therefore, um, um, I, I don't put an effort in terms of ensuring that we are digitized, we are whatsoever and whatsoever. Because the reality of the matter is the accounting officers, they can do so much. And the majority of the people who are leading um, ICT in various departments were, are not developers, some of them. And some of them were employed some time ago. I think we got the, the, the stats in terms of SMS members. And therefore, the ability to think differently and drive this digitization of the public service that we're talking about. Uh, because for me, it's like it has to be pushed from all angles. You need to have your leadership pushing it, because if you have the leadership pushing, it is going to happen. But think about my capability now as the ICT head, because some departments are led by deputy directors. So uh, my, stra my strategic thinking is it suffices for me to push and ensure that we get to that level. And I think the example of um, the colleague that he pushed it from a DDG level and how many uh, departments at a DDG level have got people who are not afraid of, you know, grappling with your ICT systems and coming up with certain strategies and so forth and how best we can do that. So I'm thinking that as much as we would love to have the leadership pushing it, it also helped to have the experts now uh, of the function assisting the process that will ensure that there is a feasible strategy that can be implemented and uh, we limit also the failures of those projects and, and et cetera, and et cetera. So that, that's what I'm thinking, that we need to have it pushed on various angles. Yes, your leadership you need, but you also need your GCIO council uh, playing a different role altogether in the overall government, not in their small corners of their departments. Thanks. Thank you. I see that's a hand there. Thank you very much, Sisi. You didn't introduce yourself. Let him come back to you again. Sorry. I'm Nomonde Mnuka from the JCIS. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me take this hand and then give to Zaid to deal with the specific which are regulated methods. Thank you very much. Introduce yourself. Hello, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. My name is Dipsy Wechwemang. I'm from the Civilian Secretariat for Police. I've been uh, in the public service for the past 30, 38 years, I say, I suppose. And during the time when I was at DPSA, there was a lot of talk about uh, ma making one government. And uh, that's when CETA was actually established. And we were sort of hoping that CETA will take a government to a higher level, only to find then they are just a, a, a middleman, you know, between the departments. What we were hoping and what was the discussion then was that uh, we will have sort of a database of all the departments in one, one uh, area, uh, like in the blockchain if you, you will. And then the life of the child will be taken from when he's born, he's born in hospital, it's recorded in hospital. Then it goes to the Department of Education. They would plan for that child when he's seven years to say in primary school, 
we will need so many, so many, so many children. In high school, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, so many uh, uh, high schoolers, so we need so many schools, or we need so many uh, things. And uh, university, the same. We will need so many uh, 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 universities. And the lifespan of a child is taken from birth to, to death. The Department of, of Social Development would be knowing how many people have lost their parents. Even now, they should be knowing how many people have lost their, how many children have lost their parents to COVID, how many child-headed families are there so that they can be able to support. So what the problem that we have in government is disintegration. Each and every department having their own little IT and people being very, very, uh, 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 you know, hoarding information that could be used by other departments. And very, I, I don't know what the, 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 the English word is to, to say, you know, you are, uh, you are not generous about your information. And information that, that would also help both the social de department to say, uh, you know, because uh, child-headed families, uh, if they are not supported, they would easily gra graduate, uh, gra graduate to being criminals. Now, if it is well cared of, knowing how many child-headed families are there, then informing the, for instance, the social development, education, and department, uh, and, and, and police, SAPS. SAPS will, in, in effect, reduce the level of, of crimes if we had all this database uh, residing under one cloud, under one blockchain. Now, each and every department wants to do their own things and they want to prove that they, they, they've got uh, the best IT. But we actually need information. We could be having how many rapists are there? And, you know, when, when, when somebody applies for a job, for instance, you already have information, poof, uh, this person is a, is a, is a, is a, 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 was dismissed or this person was... Now you've got to phone and do all those kinds of things. So the only thing that we need is integration of our systems into the blockchain. We have to move towards the blockchain uh, and environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a beautiful input. It will form part of the regulation that is going to come on, on the issue of the big data, what it's raising. As government, we need to establish big data. We need to put together a platform where that big data will be maintained and serviced so that you are not asked the same question everywhere. You, wherever you go, you are interviewed, you are asked, hey, ID number, where do you live? The data must be there, central managed. This is what she's saying. And the issue of the IoT, Internet of Things, uh, as a country, we need to explore the opportunities. Let me take the next hand here. Yeah. Thank you very much, my brother. Introduce yourself and then raise your issue. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lebo Masolani from DPME. Um, and I must commend you on a very exciting uh, presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and even though it, it is depressing when one looks at the, the numbers and uh, the persisting challenges. I've got just uh, four points to make, and, and I think one of them has already been made by my colleague over there regarding lack of interface between the various systems that we have in government. And, and uh, this was really thrust into the spotlight if you look at um, the corruption that took place around uh, uh, the measures that were implemented to deal with uh, uh, the, the impact of COVID, where a number of uh, government employees were able to access some of the, the funds that were meant for people who are unemployed. And I think really, it's just terrible. It's an indictment on, on us as government that we couldn't pick up that uh, people, these people are employed in government and yet the very same systems that we managed were, were, were able to, uh, to, to make payments to these uh, criminals. 
And then the other issue is uh, how do we achieve efficiencies within uh, the ICT uh, sector in government? And um, the fact that we getting still getting overcharged, um, buying this laptop for for thirty four thousand when I could have bought it for for a fraction of that at another s s store. I think. Um, the, the the reforms around the procurement in government also need to come, you know, to the party in order to ensure that we can also achieve the the the, the efficiencies that we're looking for. And then I think um, the other issue is lack of you know leadership and accountability. Sometimes it's just it boils down to to the courage to make uh, the necessary uh, decisions. If you think uh, about how long we have been implementing IFMS. Somebody just needs to make a decision that this needs to stop, and you know uh, because it's just just not going anywhere. And uh, how much have we spent on a project like that, for example? So those are some of the issues really that are are, are plaguing the, the 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 system. And the last point that I want to make is, you know, we we invest in so much money into the ICT infrastructure, but how do we protect the existing infrastructure? We cannot uh, go on uh, investing more money when we cannot protect that which we already have. I mean, uh, a lot of us here have experienced uh, challenges around, you know, the, the, the drop calls. Because we can't protect the ICT infrastructure, people destroying um, uh, communication infrastructure. So those are some of the issues that really we need, we need to, to tackle head on. Thank you. You've dealt with thorny issues. Thank you so much. I think I was shy to talk about IFMS and other things, but thanks, you are raising it. Thanks so much, Sisi. Thank you. My name is Mamou Khali Mashallah. I come from the department of DFFE. I think just a few things um, that which I believe we may need to do, um, and, and I'm going to take a leaf in terms of the films that over and above us having good intentions in terms of introduction of new systems. We, fact of the matter is that we're still in dealing with bus and PESAL, which are definitely desktop based. Um, in an era where in we're talking innovation, digitization, and obviously there are key fundamental issues that which we are raising, such as cyber security um, and the, the and, and the risk elements that which needs to be dealt with if we are to move from the desktop based to apps and, and related matters. So for me, what becomes key is as government, for instance, from G2G or G2B, we need to then be able to understand what are the first priority things that which we need to focus on in terms of digitization um, and innovation, and then we're saying for everybody else, this is what we're going to be doing. Currently, yes, there are best uh, practice and there are uh, pockets of, of excellence. However, that does not necessarily translate into the overall system of government, and that is one of the things that which we need to focus on because investment has already been done and lessons have already been le uh, learned in, in, in that regard. The second thing that which I wanted to talk to in terms of uh, part of prioritization is that we, we seem to be talking of a centralized approach in terms of innovation and um, digitization. Fact of the matter is these things are currently happening in provinces and regions. Um, and like I'm saying, they are best practice, but as government, we all want to invest in exactly the same things in terms, instead of taking that specific investment and saying how do we derive value in other uh, uh, areas in, in that regard. I think the colleague have spoken about the big data, I'm not gonna talk to that. We're here talking of um, review of the public service regulations. Um, we've just been thrust as government into the deep end in terms of the triple uh, PFA. And we're talking of the regulatory framework of CETA in a, an era where in the innovation itself happens at a very high speed. The question is, we are still talking of CETA Act of 1998, which was reviewed in um, 2002. 
how is that assisting us currently? If, if from DPSA we're looking at overall the regulatory framework of government in terms of um, the new developments and responsiveness, what are those, what is that basket of, of um, regulatory framework that which we need to overall um, review so that we can then have that level of, of um, responsiveness in, in, in some of, of these particular issues. The, the other issue that which I wanted to talk to you, it was about the capacity and skills. Yes, I saw the statistics in terms of the 0.3%, and then the further question is of that, um, how much of the 0.3% is actually on, on desktop? But not only that, we are DPSA, um, together with the Department of Education, we provide regulatory framework in terms of um, accreditation of some of these particular skills that which are required to lead and manage uh, innovation. We're still talking NQF, uh, RVQ uh, based related. Whereas when you look at best practice in industry, we're talking sector-based accreditation. We're talking Microsoft-led because they've got a specific product in, in that specific uh, instance. How long does it take for our sitters to accredit some of these particular skills that which we require? These are some of things that which I believe should be a priority in terms of um, how we actually transform the, the current environment so that we, we, we we become responsive. And lastly, I wanted to talk about the compliance nature of government versus the exploratory nature of innovation and digitization. In terms of, of the PFMA, we're talking value for money. In terms of innovation, we're talking having to test and retest and retest up until we get the specific how do we get a balance between the compliance nature of government? Yes, it is the public purse and we need to account for it. But if you have developed something and it fails, what does it mean from um, that very same level of accountability? And therefore the question is, should innovation really be led from government or should we be looking at other alternatives? Thank you. Okay, describe the powerful thinking coming on board. I like it. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Renal Brandt from the DPSA. Um, I would just like to say once again, I don't think everything is doom and gloom. And we can be responsive. Um, the gentleman from the DPME raised the issue about... Um, people illegally getting grants and I, I think we were quite responsive in working together with other departments in that regard where we are sharing data already. Um, so if a, peop a person applies now for a, a, a sp special grant or a SASA grant, there is verification to make sure that those people are actually not employed in government or in the public service. So I think it's, it's, I agree, we've got a limited, limited resources, we've got limited funding. Um, we want to expand into the, the fourth industrial revolution, but we don't support it with the necessary human resources and budget to sustain. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. You were trying to respond. I don't like the response. I don't want anybody to defend any input. We must deal with this issue quite open. Because the lady from DEF, she raised something that come to my mind now. There are three people you read papers. One, APSA, around Eastern Cape, you walk in, transfer 1.3 million to his bank account. You know the story. Second, in Louis Trichat, gentleman walk, walk into APSA, transfer 200 million to his bank account. The third guy walked with the post bank, transferred a billion in his bank account. Are you saying in government is not happening? With this weak system, it's a question to ponder. Are you saying in government, there's nobody walking into government system and transfer money to the bank account of somebody else? 
with this work system. I'm not saying respond. I'm saying let's provoke these things. If it's happening in a very high tech environment, bank, somebody got the pins, encryptions, everything, you transfer money. I talk about three gentlemen. Are you saying in government? I don't believe that. People are transferring money in their bank account. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bukela. My name is Magwena Mulala. I work for the National School of Government. I wanted to wait for the policy issue to be presented, but I think colleagues provoked me to <coughs> speak about this issue, which is a daily issue because we are now speaking to DPSA as a policy holder. For an example, we all talk about the lesson learned from COVID-19. But it's DPSA that is quick to send us letters that we are no longer going to work from home, which to me is leads to the issue of not learning, adapting, and moving forward. Because the future of work, as you are presented today, to me is office without walls. Because I have reached all my target in the past financial year, sitting in my house, and I didn't give any sick leave. There was no way I'm going to give a sick leave. I'm, uh, no, I'm, yes. <laughs> you can see the future of work changes. But we are taking it back because we think seeing you is another thing. Um, the, the other thing is if government wants to save money, it must not save money with salaries and taxes. We can simply close all these buildings, review the contract of the, 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 uh, the, 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 the government, and allow us, if we want to see one another in a meeting, give us vouchers to book a, a, a hotel space for one hour, two hours. It's effective that way. But I don't understand how we gathered here and talk about future of work. Then we say to ourselves, everyone must go back to work. They are coming to work, by the way, in Tatevukela, <laughs> my colleagues tomorrow. <laughs> I like it. I saw the end of the way. Thank you very much for provoking that. It's a fair point. You say you have been effective. I gave an example of banks. The biggest bank today does not even have one building. The biggest bank, the biggest university in the world today doesn't even have one campus. One campus. So he's saying it. Now, the biggest transport that is coming today, they won't have transport means, but there will be transport. Somebody will be, can own all these systems using the application. So let's provoke. He's saying, DPSA, you wrote us letters. You are saying, come back to work. Now you are saying future of work. What is future of work? Is it the walls? I, I don't know. I don't have answers. But my two colleagues are taking notes. They will respond to the plenary. Thank you very much, Sisi. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Rose Pafani from the Department of International Relations. Um, it is true that when you have executive leadership and who, who who supports and, and have buy-in with IT, you are able to move forward. We, when our minister came in, she put in a, a task team that then helped us to de develop a digital strategy. We started with the implementation last year, but how, where we got stuck is where probably everybody in the government is getting stuck. Uh, in terms of digitizing the, all those um, processes that relate to IFMS. I, 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 I think if, if DPSA is now talking about future of work and embracing a digitization of services across government, I'm sure in, in your engagement with National Treasury, you can do something about uh, uh, IFMS because it's, it's holding us back um, and, and we're not able to, to implement uh, all this, these nice things that you're talking about here. So my question was whether, in terms of uh, IFMS, whether um, DPSA is a stakeholder with a voice to, to enable us to be able to move forward from the state in which we are in of being stuck with 
IFMS. You, you ask for deviation, it's not granted. You, 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 you ask to be part of the pilot, it's not granted, or the, 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 the project is not kicking off. Uh, I think from, from government to government level, uh, there should be something that minister to minister can be can be um, dealt with or can I, I think there the should be a decision a political decision from that level about IFMS and and how we move forward thanks thank you very much she raised the same issue PFMA versus compliance I think my sister there raised it versus innovation this PFMA value for money Three is compliance, now innovation. I do put that, I think this point that she's raising, that happens raised there. Let me take my brother here. Uh, good morning, I'm Martin Sishapelo from Limpopo. I just wanted to make a comment about uh, something probably it will come up when we discuss the, 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 the regulation itself, but there has been quite a few points mentioned around information. If I look at the regulations and currently what is there, you find that it focuses on when you talk about ICT, what must the department do inside the department? Now, when you look at how the world is changing, it's about collaboration, it's about working together. And I think that what actually should be in the regulation has to say by default, not as an exception, by default, departments need to share information both with other departments without being asked and those that are relevant with members of the public. In other words, for example, I think South Africa is a signatory of the open government partnership, which then says we need to make sure that information that can be made publicly available is by default publicly available. And that, I think, it's one of the things that can drive uh, certain behaviors uh, to actually ensure that the technology that we put in place is enabling us to actually not only make the information publicly available, but also to allow entrepreneurship and grow the economy. Because once, for instance, if you look at Google, uh, when they give you the weather and so on, it is public information that is made available that Google is making money out of. And that is my contribution thing. Thank you. He's talking about the big data, the veil of the big data as a resource, as I've indicated. We've got a lot of data which is a commodity. It's a gold that government can use. I see. How do we make sure that we, we maximize the value of the gold? Government have got data about everything, but we don't collaborate. We do the same thing as my sister there said it and the guy from DPME. So the issue is, how do you collaborate? He bring in the issue of the uh, international statutory requirements. South Africa is the pioneer of OGP, Open Government Partnerships when President Obama came here, we were the first country to enter into that signatory. So how do you maximize the value of open government so that even entrepreneurs and businesses can freely get this data to maximize their businesses? How can, if they are doing it, MEC Sufi, I know he's upfront on the issue of, of e-education, e-learning, e-registration, and that's the model that we can adopt in that regard. So, thank you very much. Uh, any last comment? I give it to my other two ends before we deal with the regulations. And I think that should be perhaps the very last hands, and then we, we proceed. Thank you very much. Introduce yourself, and then just briefly. Um, good afternoon, uh, DDG. My name is Precious Isaac from the DPSA. I'm just going to read some comments from the, um, our colleagues who are joining us virtually on Zoom. Uh, Pilisi Wemteto is saying thanks for the presentation and looking forward 
for uh, implementation in HRM. We are running out of space because of SP files. IT, please develop digital systems that will help us be central, even employees in moving, uh, in, even in employees moving to other departments. It can be protected as latest payslips. The information is there. Janetta Boerter says, I agree, innovate, innovate by considering how we use the spaces, create activity-based work approaches. Kawe Gambu says, in light of the current conversations around the modern employee, DPSA should consider recalling the circular on going back to work or moving towards 100% office occupancy Rather, can DPSA explore the other, uh, explore with other departments lessons learned on productivity while working from home? There should be a hybrid model between office working and off-site working, taking into consideration the limitations of tools of trade in that regard. And then um, uh, we have a comment from Ms. Lydia Sibugedi. Um, the acting ED of the Center for Public Service Innovation. She says, we need to relook the role of ICT units in departments. This is the time to reskill, upskill them to enable them to support departments broader than desktop support. The stats that Mr. Vugela presented shows that the state has no ICT capacity. 0.3% is way too low. The current regulations do not cater for digitization. The closest we came is through regulation 50, but as it was said yesterday, this regulation was never taken further. And a lot of uh, comments coming in saying thank you for the crisp uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Precious. I think uh, the online comments are also relevant to what we discussed. I saw a hand somewhere. Oh, you want to make another comment? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Um, this is just a last comment and to emphasize the, the issue of we say things but we do a different thing. This thing of 100% it's pushing away the, the strides that have been made during COVID where people could work and work effectively from home. I can stand here and tell you in 2020, when there was a hard lockdown of three months, during that time I developed 14 strategies and reviewed 16 policies because there was no disturbances of people coming in and out of your offices and stuff like that. Now, uh, I agree with people who are saying there must be a hybrid kind of consideration. It's not presentism at work doesn't mean you are working. I have a, 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 an experience of people who will be coming at 8 o'clock put their bags on the desk, go out and get breakfast, and come work for one hour. At 10 o'clock is tea time, they go again, they go and get something. Lunch time, they do the same. So I'm saying let's move away from presentism in the workplace. Let's put people on targets. And targets can, be, can vary. You can put a person on a target of one hour, of a day, of a week, of a month and so forth and so on. So it doesn't mean that working from home, people are sleeping and doing nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much. It came back again. Um, DPSA, you are required to, to release the lessons learned report on the issue of working during pandemic. So, so that we're able to see whether it's popular productive or can we destroy the walls or hybrid, but something must happen. We talk about the future of work or future of work to us, it means building. If it means building, we must most indicate, no, 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 100% is future of work, come back to the office, all of you, 
uh, you're stuck in traffic for, I don't know. Uh, when it was COVID, I used to drive to work. Three minutes, I would be in my office. Do what I do, three minutes I'm home. Now, you wake up at four, you're stuck. When I arrive at the office, you're tired, it's eight o'clock. DPSA said six, eight hours, sit in the office eight hours. Four o'clock, everybody's knocking off, it's running home. Another traffic, I arrive home, 10 o'clock. So this is the reality. When we talk about future of work, these are things that we must provoke. You spend most of your time on the road. Which road? There are no roads anymore, there are potholes. So, yeah. But whatever you want, she says, I reviewed 16 policies at home. 16. Some couldn't even do one the whole year. She did 16. Thank you. Thank you, TDG. My name is Bontali Rumo from PCTA. My, we're talking about collaboration. We're talking about not working in silos and the future world of work. But DDG, how can we have this conversation in the absence of CETA? The resolutions that we are coming up with from here, we need CETA's buy-in, because today we don't understand what is CETA's strategy. It was going to be useful for us to receive a presentation from CETA to say this is our strategy when it comes to digital transformation. So we're going back to where, like you said, we've been We've got a lot of strategies in government. You're going to develop this document, but because you, don't, you didn't bring in your key role players to, the, to this forum, I think at the end of the day, we might be in the, we, I'm not gonna use the word wasting time, but I think indirectly we might not achieve what we want to achieve. So my plea to DPSA is bring in the Department of Communications, bring CETA on board for us to understand what is their view when it comes to digital transformation. We can only achieve this if we work together. Good point. Processes, uh, bring in key stakeholders. I've indicated CETA, DPSA, DCTT, Treasurer, COCTA. When, when you walk, I can say to all of you, take your phones, go to Wi-Fi. Click the Wi-Fi. Do it. Take your phones. Click the the Wi-Fi, and then tell me how many Wi-Fi's there are there. Just tell me three, four. Do it. I want to demonstrate to you. Come again. How many? How many you got? Fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, this is the demonstration of where the future of work is. That's why I'm saying, if you don't understand this, you won't know. You go to countries like Singapore, if you do that, you'll have six page of Wi-Fi connectivity. When you go to malls or we are going to eat out, do it. I'm giving an exercise. Sit, restaurant, do it. You can only see one popping up. One. The entire mall. It's a demonstration that we don't have infrastructure. Do it in your office. One. It should be millions to show that we've got a highway which we've got traffic moving. That's why those who are driving the city, they're digging the roads. Have you seen that? And the townships, who come from the township? I'm from the township. I don't stay in, in the kitchen. I stay in the township. They are digging roads in my township. You, all of you, stay in the Boom Gate area. All of you. All of you. Why? Ask me. I stay in the township. They are digging the roads every day. They are putting the highway underneath. Go to, go to Johannesburg City Center right now. You can't walk on the side of the road that are digging. DG myself. Is, am I lying? I'm right. This is what I'm showing. It shows the strength of the country on ICT. That's why all of you are staying behind the boom gate. Because the real life is different. I'm, it's not a joke, colleagues. Think of those who are staying in the townships. 
you are in the boom gate where there's everything, but the life is there on service delivery. Let me take the last two hands and then give to Said. Uh, thank you, Che. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Joe Ramara from Northwest Provincial Department. Facilitator, I think earlier you mentioned a point whereby here is a car, you put the nice make rims, 18 or 19 inch, uh, the tires, but the car cannot move. And I think Ms. Lurumo addressed that to say, where is it? We are talking technology here. They are the custodian of technology for the government, but they are not here. So that car, it can move because we've got two wrong people, wrong resources. Eh? So let's get the right resources. Let's get the right people. Let's get the right spanner and the car will start. Maybe perhaps the key. Thank you. I agree with you. It's a point. It's your hand up. Okay. The last end is here. It's a point you are raising uh, to say where are the critical stakeholders on these issues? I'll give an example of Murut uh, because I like priests. Uriko Muruti, I want to build a bridge go go Zierast. Muruti redesigned a bridge. Muruti will pray in tongues. The Holy Spirit will come down. People will fall, but there will be no bridge. Because, but get an engineer. Is this what you are saying? I'm just giving a literal example, not to say they are priests here, but to demonstrate the strength of the relevant skilled the same way uh, CEO of PSA is raising it. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon colleagues. My name is Udwez Khabonne. I'm from the Northwest. Uh, I think one of the major problems that we're currently experiencing is working in silos. We are experiencing the developments in so many different departments in different provinces as far as uh, uh, IT systems are concerned. We have the electronic submission the e-submission, we've got the e-filing, we've got the performance agreement that are made uh, online in the PDPs, we've got the e-leave management system, we've got the e-recruitment system that we've been talking about in here. Those are the common systems that are being used in all departments. Why can't the central point uh, implement all those systems and uh, cut across all, pro all, all provinces or all departments so that things can be easier for everyone because not every department has got a developer or a business analyst or a project, uh, project manager in them. Like in the Northwest, we are mostly invested in the support, desktop support staff in IT. We may say we've got five IT officers in the office, but they're all doing only support. There is not even a single developer in the department that will develop such system for the department, which means we have to rely on the external service providers to render that uh, service to the department. Because even if you go to CETA, CETA is more expensive than the other service providers. Because if you code through supply chain looking for the uh, quotation on the development of the system that you've got the business case for, you may find that those service providers are much more cheaper when compared to what CETA is offering in terms of the, the cost of the development of such a system. So the, another thing that we need to look at is the issue of the organizational structure of IT. We cannot be the, uh, investing on desktop, desktop support staff when we want to digitize or do we want to go digital in our department. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I'm done. Zaid, take it. Uh, I think colleagues, you have raised fundamental issues. They have been captured. They'll go to the plenary. And then Zaid will just take us through the regulations. We can panel bit there and then. And then we can even present the problem statement on what is the real problem. I think you've raised a lot of issues here, colleagues. What is the real problem? Let's, let's, let's confront that problem. And then this product will go back, we'll see how do we interface going forward with that product in terms of changing the landscapes. I mean, as I said to you, we, we have hosted Korea here. And they were hosted by DG Masebe, one was in the GCIS. Here in this country, to come and learn in 2000. Whatever we told them, they went back. 
and implement. We're still talking, South Africa. We're still talking. Next week, I've got the team living to Nigeria on the APRM and open government. We're going to teach them. Watch the space. Rwanda came here. We, we, the benchmark, we, South Africa, we like talking. We like talking. The skills are here, capabilities here, but we like talking. So, Zaid, can you lead us on that? And then we, we can put together the presentation. We'll go back to plenary and present. Thank you very much. Clap hands for me, please. Thank you. Well done, DDG. Uh, colleagues, I didn't put up my hand. I also want to contribute to the discussion, but I thought, okay, DDG will give me an opportunity. I want to just, and I'm listening to, to all of the comments that are coming through. Let me just check with, 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 with the collective here. Do we all agree that we are not making the required progress towards digitization, that there's a problem in our progress? Let me just see in terms of hands. Is there anybody that feels, no, 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 we're we, 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 we there. Are we moving at the right pace? Okay, it looks like the majority agree. And then for us in this plenary, our job now is to listen to what was said yesterday. Yesterday was quite beautiful and amazing. People talked about drones. Our job now is to figure out, well, hey, public service, drones, are we going to take, somebody said yesterday in a discussion, maybe if we don't have e-submission, maybe we get the drone to take the submission to the DG's office. That's how we digit, you know, that's the, our 4IR. I joke about it, but the reality is that our job now is to, is to figure out where we are and to think about how we can build a roadmap to the future. That future looks very good, I must admit, not the, not the pension one. The other one, it looks very good. So what I'm hearing and what I've heard so far makes me want to bring up this slide that talks about our structure, our service delivery model, and how it creates some of the problems that we have around integration. Yeah? Uh, despite several NMOS processes and restructures, the fundamentals of this picture on the, on the, on the left-hand side has not changed. Each department is required to, it has its own mandate and services that it delivers. It's required to, to, to automate and digitize its own services, and it's required to deliver to the public. And this creates for us this integration challenge that we have. We have an appetite for integration and for sharing. Everybody has spoken about it. Almost everybody has said, we need to share data. But the reality is that IT is not going to share your data for you. It's not gonna happen, even if they could. The business has to decide that there's a business imperative for sharing that data. And so as a collective, not just on this plenary, but in our discussion for the, in the future of government, we need to think about how do we change this service delivery model so that when we start, when a citizen wants to register in a particular segment where we're delivering services, let's assume persons with disabilities, that that registration happens in an integrated channel, that that citizen doesn't have to then go and go to five departments. Unless we adjust our model, we're going to be constantly chasing this integration story and this integration issue. Yeah? Uh, so, so that's the one element that I heard, that I, I've heard from everybody else as well. And I think it's something we need to take back to the plenary, to say the issue of the service delivery model, we're not sure. I mean, we, perhaps we don't know. How is it going to be dealt with? Is it this forum? But perhaps after this, these two days, this is something that can come out in the report to say, Government as a whole, we need to rethink our service delivery model. The current service delivery model does not support this integration that we seem to want. Integration is not going to happen because, because uh, people like each other. It has to happen because we have created a system that, that forces almost that in, in, in integration. So that's the first one I wanted to talk about quickly before I get to the regulations. I know you're asking me to speak about regulations. The other one is around if we, if we recognize that we have a problem, we are saying, in, as part of this presentation, DG has spoken about it, that we have a problem in terms of the digital governance, governance in the current model. We have many players, and I think some of the colleagues towards the end have spoken about it, to say, where's CETA and where's DCDT? We have key players that are not here in this discussion. But the fact that we have so many players in the space 
of digitizing government actually creates part of the problem for us. It becomes very difficult to then be agile. You know, 4IR requires agility. It becomes very difficult for us to be agile. So we have the Public Service Act and we have our things that we need to do. We have CETA, and we have Treasury and the Office of the CPO that's starting to do some ICT things and create contracts and all kinds of things and really it creates a mess. Those colleagues that are in the space in ICT or those in departments that have had the experience will tell you it creates a mess because we have these contracts, RT15, we have Microsoft contracts, then we have a strategy from DPSA that talks about cloud and Microsoft is a cloud solution and, 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 and. And so we create, we have created this digital governance disconnected model. And this is something, if we recognize that we need to make a change and some kind of transformation around digital governance, we need to consider this model and how it needs to change. Perhaps we don't even need to talk about in this session what the answer is. But I think the recognition from the collective that there needs to be a change in the model, okay, that for me is quite important. So, so, so that's the second point I want to make around that before we go to the re regulations. And the third one, this is for me the, the most important one. This issue of a broken ICT, or you could replace IT, ICT with the digitization delivery model. We started off in 19, 1998, and I'm not going to give you a history lesson, but we started off really on a good footing. We said, we will create a central agency for government. We will take all of our skills, scarce skills in government, and we will pull them in a central agency called CETA. We will then ask this agency to deliver all of those common requirements and services to government departments. What we will leave in departments are those individuals that are able to translate what the business requires into technology and manage contracts from a CETA perspective. Now, for some reason, for whatever reason, in 2002, we decided to change that to a hybrid model. And the important part I want to talk about is that departments transferred IT staff to CETA at that point. So you then, what was, what was left in departments is a shell. Now think back to the, 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 the slide about resources in the 4,000. Yeah? So there was a shell left in departments with the hope that the central agency will deliver services. We then backtracked a little bit and we handed majority of the responsibility back to departments without giving them back those resources. So you in departments know and understand when we talk about the lack of skills and resources and capacity in, an IC, in your ICT units. Right? And then we introduced something called the transversal tenders. So we centralized procurement, and that central procurement was meant to do one thing, well, a number of things, but some of the main things was to say, let us allow us to get the best price for our technology. This is why the colleague is complaining about the 34,000 Rand laptop, because we've taken the central model, and in the way we've implemented it in 2002, we actually broke it. We said to departments, well, go and buy it yourself. Now, the minute you say to 160 odd departments, go and buy it yourself, you can forget about getting the best deal from any vendor. They're going to treat you as an individual because it's in their interest to do that because you cannot pool your resources. You cannot pool your buying power. And so this is something that contributes. I'm still on the broken ICT delivery model because I think it's quite important. Right? And then we come to 2022, 20 years later after making the last change in the model and we find that, okay, we have only 17% of all ICT procurement that is from CETA. Just think about that for a moment. Only 17% of the ICT procurement is from CETA. That means departments are doing it by themselves. We have departments increasingly, increasingly bypassing CETA. And then we've established in the, in the office of the, in the Treasury the transversal ICT contracts and software. So I talk about the broken model because I want, us, I want there to be some recognition that we need to relook at this model if we are to be successful. Because colleagues, it is this model that gave rise to this problem. I don't know where it is in the slide. The one that Vili was showing about the AG, 90% of, of the 90% problem and 80% problems. So I thought, I thought it's important that we, 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 we just recap on the problem and the problem we're trying to fix towards the digitization. Then coming to the existing regulations. Uh, I've tried to just detail the regulations on ICT. Okay, we have something that talks about the establishment and maintenance of an information technology plan, which makes sense. Uh, nobody can argue against it. Okay, and we say that IT planning remains a key instrument. However, DPSA needs to strengthen the oversight of those ICT plans. Okay, 
The reality is that we've not been able to do that. Departments are now no longer submitting ICT plans to the DPSA, despite the fact that they exist in regulation. And we no longer look at ICT plans. And the effect of that is that centrally, or nobody centrally, is looking across all of the ICT plans to understand where are we going as individual departments and where are we going collectively as a government. Okay. So, so we make some recommendation around that. Then there's Regulation 93, which is a strange one. It's, it simply says that the HOD must ensure that the acquisition, management, and use of, te of ICT enhances delivery, uh, improves productivity, promotes environmentally friendly public service, and ensures cost efficiency of the department. It's not something really you can, you, you can touch and feel and measure. And really what we are saying around this is, well, it's largely ignored by departments, and DPSA should consider at least maybe removal is a harsh word. But maybe we need to strengthen it. Maybe we need to be specific about what must happen to achieve these kinds of things and not simply make a statement in the regulation that talks about efficiencies and all of those kinds of things. We need to tell departments how. What are the specific things they need to do that drive those efficiencies? And say, uh, regulation 94 is about information security standards and IT security remains a key focus for us. Uh, colleagues, the reality is that uh, Uber is only successful because Uber is stable as an application. I can guarantee you, had Uber been launched and it started to fail and your data was compromised, the app would have failed itself. It would never have taken off if it was not stable, if it was not secure, if you didn't trust it. And so we fast forward to our, our scenario in digitization. Yes, perhaps there is a business that can come up with a really, really good application idea or model of how to engage with citizens through an application, through any kind of tool. But if that tool is not stable, if we don't have a mature organization behind it that is able to support it and back up your data and secure your data, forget about it. Nobody's going to use it. So in the sexy discussions around digital transformation, you don't hear about the ICT engineer that sits in the background, that's got to constantly review the code, that's got to make sure the servers are up and running, that's got to make sure all of these things happen. Right? But unfortunately for us, it is our job to make sure that that foundation is there. Okay? And unfortunately, that foundation is a little bit shaky at the moment. So, so information security, it's, this regulation needs, to stre needs strengthening to include the foundational activities contained in, in, in what we call the Information Security Directive. And this is specifically to say, what exactly must you do on information security? It's not sufficient to say, uh, have, a have a secure environment. We now have to teach, we now have to help, we now have to instruct departments on the specifics to maintain a secure environment. Then moving on, uh, so Regulation 95, again, Information Security Vigilance. Uh, again, the theme is to say, replace that with specific foundational activities that HODs must implement to ensure that information security vigilance. It's not sufficient to say, be secure. We've got to say what and how and who. And then we've got to be able to measure that and we've got to be able to say that these departments have moved ahead and these departments have not. Incident reports, uh, there is a regulation that talks about incident reports. It reports. Again, it needs to remain and to be strengthened. And we also need to include DPSA as a receiver of these incident reports because really we are the policy owner from a government perspective, but we don't have a clue in terms of how many incidents have happened by virtue of the fact that the regulation doesn't say to departments report to DPSA. So this is just one of those no-brainers that we need to add, we need to, to amend. Then we come to the, the regulation 97 that talks about minimum interoperability standards and really the world has moved on. In the year 2000 or pre-2000, you had, very, you had very different technology sets and standards. You had, uh, let me think, uh, TCP IP even before 2000, and you had IPX. And it was important to tell people that make sure that you all use a common protocol for it to interoperate. But really, there's no technology that gets released currently that can't interoperate. These standards have become really a norm globally in the industry. So, We've struggled with the MIOS. MIOS has not been used or adhered to by departments. DPSA has never received the MIOS report. Uh, but what we do need to do is to think about ICT project governance, and we need to think about how, how we can give large projects over a particular monetary value, how we can start to look at it. The purpose of this, if you read this, this, this regulation, it spoke about when a new technology or a new project is launched, when a new system is developed, that there must be reporting and the system must uh, it must 
comply with a set of minimum standards. Now we are saying that well, at, a, at a base technology level, that's not necessary anymore. Perhaps we need to think about data standards, absolutely, right? We need to talk about interoperability at, an, at a different level, uh, but not at a base technology level. So those are the existing regulations. Uh, let me skip ahead a little bit to some of the proposals that we've made. I think uh, DG has spoken about this one. I just want to touch a little bit on, and, and, and if you look at some of the things that, have, that, that we are saying in here, the establishment of a new transversals for common functions across the public service. Many of you have, uh, of you have actually said this, that we need to, do, that departments are struggling to digi digitalize and we should select common business processes and develop transversal systems. Uh, whatever we want to say about Bass and Purcell, I can't remember the last time they actually went down the systems themselves. Public servants get paid. So the, the problems are complex as it relates to transversal systems, but the problems are actually process driven and not necessarily technology driven. The technology can do what we need to do. Even the 20 or 30 year old Bass and Purcell can do what we need it to do. Our problems are actually process issues. And so the system then ends up being problematic. But we, we are saying that the establishment of new transversals is something that we need to be looking at, right? Uh, many colleagues have said that departments don't have business analysts. We've seen the numbers and the stats, okay? If you just take something like e-submission, we all, every department has a, required, a requirement to, to process memos. Whether you call it a submission or a memo, it doesn't matter. It's a common process that we all have. It goes from, from one official to the next and it gets approved and it gets stored. There is definitely a business case to standardize. There's also probably a business case to create a single one. It, it, will it work? It depends on, on our appetite really for, for this digital transformation to work. Uh, E-submissions, the, the issue of, of uh, I, I don't know how we're doing for time, somebody must keep me honest. I want to just quickly narrate a story that we heard in Korea, 2008. The Korean government was trying to digitize. They didn't have, they had manual processes. What they decided to do was to create a very small and simple application that every public servant when they received a piece of paperwork to process, had to go onto this application and say, I've received it. Okay. And when they send it to the next desk, they say, I'm sending it to the next person. Doesn't sound complicated, doesn't sound difficult to do. But they standardized this application across the public service. What they were able to do with that was to now understand where are applications for services or services getting stuck in the, in the environment. But that was, I mean, you can expect that. Where they changed, what changed it for them, is they then took the data and the statistics from that system and they published it in the national newspapers. They said, these are the best performing public servants and these are the worst performing public servants. Now, what they say to us is that nature, the nature of the Korean society is that nobody wants to be publicly shamed in that manner. And so immediately they saw a change of behavior from public servants, just with a little app that really didn't do much. So we need to think about these kinds of things in line with the catalytic projects and say, is there an appetite in the public service, regardless of what service, regardless of who you are as a department, for us to create some kind of model? Will this be catalytic enough where we start to able to get information about service delivery to energize departments? Not, deal, not digitize the entire process, it can still be manual and paper-based. But these are some of the things, and we don't want to talk too much about projects, but these are some of the things that we are saying, transversal and common functions across the public service. Uh, DDG has spoken about the rest. Uh, possible amend amendments to the public service regulations. In dealing with the ICT function and its maturity, and DDG has spoken about it, you've seen the slides, we can, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to share that with everybody and you can have a, have a look at it. We, are, we have developed version two of the corporate governance of ICT policy framework. Okay? It says a lot about how departments must oversee and manage ICT functions and how it must manage ICT projects. Okay? What we want to then do is to take some of those key things off that framework and make them part of the regulations because that just gives it the teeth and it, gives it, the, the, it elevates it to the right level.
Okay. The benefit, of course, is the improved oversight and control over digitization projects and the management of ICT. We then talk about integration of digital strategies and department strategic plans. Now, departments are required to develop strategic, strategic plans. We have five-year plans, and I think that process is quite mature in the public service. Departments don't miss their deadlines. They all have strategic plans. They all have strategic planning sessions. Okay? What's missing, and they also have a requirement to develop digital transformation strategies, whether you want to call them IT strategies, whether you want to call them IT plans, it's one and the same thing, but there's a requirement to develop those strategies that exist outside of the strategic plans. So in order to take advantage of the entrenched strategic planning processes, we are saying there must be an integration. Strategic plans cannot exist. Okay? without there being actual digital targets in the strategic plans. Now, we have to decide what those targets should be. We must make recommendations about what those targets should be. We say some things in, in the regulations further on around that, but these are just proposals. Uh, the benefit, of course, is that we use existing entrenched processes to drive some of this digital planning, transformation planning. It's very easy for us to, 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 to develop a new regulation and say every department must have a strategic, a digital plan. What ends up happening is that the requirement to develop that digital plan is simply transferred to the GITO. That poor GITO that doesn't have those resources, doesn't have architects, doesn't have business analysts, doesn't have any of these things, is now expected to develop a digital transformation strategy for the business. So we say no, the business must take responsibility for developing its digital transformation plan. In fact, if you have a strategic plan, it, it must, a percentage of it, must talk about how you're going to digitize your services. And of course, what comes with that is the greater visibility and buy-in from the business. If it's in the strategic plan, it needs to be translated into the operational plan, it needs to be funded, you have the MTF issues, you have the issues of reporting to the to cabinet, you have all of those issues. But what we have at the moment in the ICT space is that we have ICT plans that are sitting in the cupboard in the GITO's office. The business never sees it. And so we are saying that's quite a key thing for us, the integration of the digital strategies and the digital plans into the department's strategic planning. The next one is around ICT spend controls. We've done an ICT expenditure overview. We've been doing it some, for some time, and, and DDG, DDG Villiers has, has shown you some of the figures, 62 billion over the last three years. We will be shocked when we start to see the individual, the, the values of the individual transactions that are, that, are, that are being undertaken in government. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, is it correct that a department is able to spend, let's say, 50% of its ICT budget on ICT software that never gets implemented and nobody in government knows about it? We say no. We say there should be a threshold. We say that we need to improve the oversight on ICT spending. We need to, we need to scratch beneath the surface and see what departments are spending on and hold people accountable for this expenditure. There are too many horror stories in the public service around ICT systems that have been procured technology that's been procured that's sitting in the storeroom, software that's been procured that nobody knows about. We all have it in our environments. I don't need to tell you about it. We read AG reports. We've seen the statistics. How do we deal with it? There's this thing, this thing called ICT spend controls. There's precedent internationally, globally, around spend controls. The UK government does it quite well. They have an entire office that looks at particular transactions from an ICT perspective and says, well, hold on. If you are going to spend 100 million with a single service provider, best we make sure that there's a clear business case. Best we make sure that this entire business knows about this business case. Best we make sure that before a single payment is made, we are measuring the value for money. That's something that we need to, we need, we need to look at in the spend control. So increased oversight from, for critical ICT project expenditure. Uh, moving on, then in dealing with issues of or, or, or dealing with this issue of 65% of South Africans that have access to the internet via mobile phones. I think it's actually good. I think the fact that 65% of our people are able to access the internet means there's an opportunity for us. Yeah? Services need to be targeted towards that 65%. So we are saying uh, the regulation on mobile friendly websites must, in, must, must require that any website that is upgrade, upgraded or deployed within a number of days uh, should be mobile friendly. What does that mean, mobile friendly? You all would have come across a website at some point where everything looks small. You've got to actually make your screen bigger to see what's happening on the website. It's not usable. 
and you find the majority of government's websites are actually not mobile friendly. And what mobile friendly is, is that the website is able to detect that I am being accessed by a smartphone and change the way it's structured so that it's more user friendly. It's just one of the th small things that we can do, but actually might have significant impact considering where are the people. 65% of them are on this on a smartphone. They're not in front of a laptop. They're not in front of a desktop. They're in front of a smartphone. The next one is quite important in my view. It talks about the digitization of government services. Now, departments know and knew 20 years ago that they need to e-government themselves. They need to digitize themselves. They need to automate themselves. Yeah? But for the last 20 or 30 years, it's not been happening. So is it fair for us to continue to expect it to happen, given that it's not happened in the last 20 or 30 years? We say no. We say what we need to do now is we need to require departments to execute within a very short space of time, identify public-facing manual or non-digitized paper-based in-person services. Identify them in your environments. Then submit a digitization plan to the DPSA that does a number of things. That lists high-impact non-digital services can be made available online. Okay? Estimate the cost, duration, and effort required. So this is about speeding up that planning. Yeah? This is about saying we want to target those high-value items, and the regulations must require all departments to now reflect internally and say, these are the five. We've planned it. We've budgeted it. Now we need to do it. This is a very quick way of us getting a national digitization strategy going without taking five years to develop a national digitization strategy, going to cabinet, consulting on it, making sure it works, blah, 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 and then it sits in the cabinet. All right? So this is really transformative in my view. Okay? The HOD must ensure that all forms relating to public facing services are made available in a digital format. This should be regulated. It's regulated all over the world. All over the world, all governments have regulated that departments should digitize. We've not done that. And I think we should. Yeah, uh, those are just recommendations. It's not complete, but it's just to get the discussion going. I guess we're at the end of the discussion, but DigiValley will take us. Thank you. Clap for him, please. Good progress. If you look at those proposals, it covers all your concerns. So let's, and they have taken notes to some of the issues while we are waving lunch, we'll improve our slide that will present. So I want to check if there's anything that you feel is not covered that we can also input there and then we, we, we into. I like it because we were open up and then thought provoking. As I indicated, even when we present, when we're supposed to make some contributions, don't sugarcoat the problem. This is what is making the country not to move. I was watching one of the one of the deputy minister. I got disappointed. Because she used to be my favorite. I, I went, I used to sit with her in the desk in the class university. Now she was talking about my DBA. People who come from Northwest, people are saying, there's no service delivery. She said, you know, my DBA, we have done well. We are doing this on national television. People are saying, Deputy Minister, which planet do you live in? You know, it's because people have spoken lies and agree that lies will turn to the truth. That's how we can move in this country. We tell lies knowing that this is a lie. I'm on national television. So it's the same thing here. We can choose to say that Africa is unwell on ICT. That knowing that we are lying. Because after four years, all of you will be gone. You will be in pension. Let's provoke, and I like what I've put it the way we've done it, colleagues, to say, We've taken it from 1998 as a country when it was a fashionable talk about ICT. 1999 eGov. All of you talking eGov. eGov. It was a new way. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. It's gone. Dot net. Dot net is living. Fourth IR is gone. 
Now it's fifth IR. It is past us. It's gone. We are still talking four IR. Hey, four IR is gone. Now we are on the on the fifth gig. That's the reason why we're opening the spectrum. We didn't even see four IR. We didn't even see the second IR. We didn't see. This, we must provoke it. We move from Hosbeck, Fax, Telegram. No. Things thrown, as you say, they are not delivering submissions in offices. You just sit on your computer and then click draw. It comes, it fetches submissions to the next office. It's gone. It's for IR. Robotic is gone. We are still obsessed. So these are confrontations that we must raise. Right? We raise the issue of stakeholders, critical stakeholders that they must be the center. And the repurposing of CETA. From 1998 CETA to 2022 CETA, and then repurposing ICASA from that ICASA that you collapse to, to current ICASA to deal with the issue of broadband access and all these other issues. And the relevant department must activate those. So I want to check if there is one or two critical issues that we can include there. I see two hands and then we we can adjourn for, for, for lunch. Thank you very much. Sis. Thank you so much, sir. It might not be critical, but I felt it's important just to share um, what lessons maybe we can learn from the CIPC, which is your company registration. I think if you look at it, it um, the custodian would be CIPC, uh, DTIC. But when you get into registering your company, um, the system is so integrated such that home affairs information automatically comes up. Um, your tax issues, SARS, uh, you can register and get an, um, a tax compliance certificate on the dot your BEE certificate also on the dot. And I'm saying, um, I don't know what can, or what can be mechanism to enforce us as government, not to voluntarily share data, but to have an integrated data source that when you put in your information, like as it was shared yesterday, all your information that is in the government system can automatically comes up. I think it can assist us in planning. I think it can also assist us in terms of the DDM that we're talking about. And um, if probably we look at, a, I think we are more concerned about the numbers of ITC people within our departments and the governance structures and so forth. And as much as I support, but I'm thinking differently to say, if we are talking working smarter, um, digitization, do we need numbers or do we need to ask ourselves, how do we do more with less? And obviously it's gonna talk to the kind of skills uh, that we require in that space and so forth. I think my last one is just to share in terms of what we were talking about prior to the presentation. Um, of walls coming 100% back to work and so forth, and the fiscal cons constraints. That in another department I worked for, uh, we took advantage of COVID. And fortunately, our um, office lease was, our office accommodation lease was coming to an end. We drastically reduced our expenditure on accommodation from 19,000. 19,000 rand, no, no, was it 19, sorry, 19 million rands per month to 6 million rands, drastically. And uh, the issue of leadership, DDG, comes in because the minister and the DG were driving that process and they enforced it in us to make sure that we do that. 
And from that saving, we were able to request deviation from National Treasury to say, can we move the savings uh, from goods and services to COE so that we can be better capacitated to deal with our service delivery uh, pressures? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me take the hand here, the last hand outside, and then we close. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, DDJ. Mine is on the issue of transversal projects, uh, particularly the location thereof, because I take it that uh, ICT transversal projects would largely be located in the offices of the Premier. But I know that the Treasury regulations would say transversal contracts must be managed by treasuries. So th that contradiction, how can we bridge it in the regulations? Issue of PFMA compliance transversal, I think it's come back again. Let's look at that. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, mine is uh, on the um, um, uh, uh, CPSI. I attended a, 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 an, a, an award function where uh, an IT space was actually utilized uh, to develop or improve on service delivery how do we actually uh, integrate them in the regulation so that um, the, the, there is a, a, an excellent uh, actually skills outside them. So if we are able to identify them through uh, the innovation that is actually led by government, why don't we actually um, uh, build in into the regulation so that it it can be uh, utilized in the entire government. That's my question that uh, it needs to be answered. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, in simple, it's a good innovation. But remember, IT is not innovation. And innovation is not IT. People keep confusing the two. ICT is not innovation. And the innovation is not ICT. So that's, you can innovate anything, like you can sue things, you can sell maguinha, innovate. How do you put your ingredients in your maguinha? That's not ICT. But yes, I hear you uh, that say, how do we bring in ICPSI? But the two are not the same. Innovation. Innovate. There are people who are innovating hackathon, what working for water, these, with no ICT related issues in that regard. But we will take your point as part of the discussion that will raise the I saw the last end I want to close. Yeah, see you. Uh, thanks, DDJ. My my proposal is that when we finalize the regulations we must also guide departments because I'm looking at a possible situation of duplication of systems. It, it will be good if we were to request the departments to go back and come up with business models and then we map processes that needs to be automated because if you automate now, department can just say I'm going to automate this process and only to find that it's not what you need to automate but if you're, our starting point is when we're looking at our business model focusing on our customer value proposition to me that will assist or else we there's a possibility of government departments rushing into bringing in service providers in the form of consultants and we'll be sitting with 100 plans that are not integrated. And I liked the comment that my colleague made about integration. I don't know how you can just try and bring everything together before we even say, okay, yes, you can go to the next point of uh, automating or digitizing. Thank you very much. The last question. Thank you, DDG. Mine is a comment, not necessarily a question. 
As government, we own big data in this country. And big data is a very, very, very important asset. And we are not securing that information that we are owning as government. And our, I'm looking at the presentation here that in terms of ICT security, only 64 percent, rather 64 employees. It means we have trusted that big data with the service providers, the consultants, and we are not even securing that information ourselves. It's like taking your bank card, put it out there and the pin and you saying it will be secured. So I think while we're talking technology, digitization and everything else, we should also look at the security aspect because definitely there will be inherent increased security risks. So we also need to manage that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the last, oh, Said. Sorry, DDG, I, I, I wanted to check with the collective. What we've done is to, is to capture some of your thoughts, or well, all of the thoughts we've actually captured, which we'll try to summarize into, into and, and put together the common, the common things. But we also want to integrate that into the key messaging that we've put out in the presentation itself, so that this doesn't become just a, this is what everybody said. It becomes, well, these are the key themes that came out of the discussion and the key areas and advice that we've been given. And these are some of the things, broad strokes, that we are saying we need to be, we need to be looking at. So I, I wanted to check with the collective that we are okay with that, that we will take out one, of, one or two of the key slides and say this is what was discussed and this is, these are some of the advices and other things that we need to, to be looking at as a collective response then into the plenary. Yes, right. you're quite right. This is a commission. Whatever is presented here is a product of the commission. It might be one or two individuals who will, will try to quickly put something so that if there was nothing, we'll be still almost like one now talking. So that presentation is no longer our presentation. It's the product of this commission. So we'll just amend the right? regulations, everything, and we can even indicate issues that they don't fit in any regulations, but are important to note and for discussions as part of the, of the issues. We'll have a problem statement that will drive forward in terms of that presentation. And then we, this commission, uh, colleagues, thank you. Thank you very much. You were such a wonderful people. We hope when we see change happening tomorrow, it's because of your contribution. If there is nothing happening on ICT, it is because of your failure, people sitting here. So it's both ways. If you see change in government, cabinet approving policies on ICT, this, just give yourself a high five. It's because you make that contribution. Thank you very much. Let's break for lunch. We'll present back and then the colleagues can even make some, some, some additions there and then. Thank you very much. Clap for yourself. Clap for yourself. Thank you.
colleagues, I'm keen for us to start. Um, we're supposed to come back at 20 pa sorry, at two o'clock. I did notice uh, that uh, some commissions um, ended late and uh, colleagues um, wanted to go and grab something to eat. However, um, I think uh, in respecting the colleagues who came back on time, not that those who haven't come back are disrespectful, we need to start. Can I just check, um, we had three commissions, we had three, four, five, and six. Do we have somebody from commission number three who can come up? I was told that Titus, okay. So let's start, the other colleagues will find us uh, on the way. Titus, you can come over, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Program Director, for this opportunity. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, the plenary that I'm coming from, uh, plenary which is uh, chapter, which we, our focus is on chapter three. But, um, other nitty gritties I won't be able to share with you now on how I happen to be appointed to be here. In fact, to be nominated to be here. But uh, in the interest of time, let's focus at the task at hand. Uh, our responsibility, we were tasked to look at uh, public chapter three of the public service regulations, uh, which consists of three parts. Chapter three consists of three parts. Now, the three parts, uh, the first part looks at uh, planning and reporting, the second part on organizational arrangements, the last part on service delivery. Now, under, under planning and reporting, uh, colleagues have identified a number of reports that we are mandated as departments to, to consolidate, to, uh, to develop and consolidate and to report on at different uh, government departments. And now, um, pertaining to that, we came to realize that uh, all these plans, they can be integrated. For instance, looking at uh, your, your HR plan, your HR development plan. In fact, all those uh, employment, I mean human resources related plans, they can all be incorporated and integrated. And those who are responsible to, to, to report on them, they will be able, they will be afforded the opportunity to, to input in those plans and also to report in one in, in, as, a, as a unit. Now, the second part, we, we, we looked at the organizational functional arrangements, whereby we looked at the transfer of functions. I uh, would remember that we, after every five years, we, do, we, do, we are subjected to this pro process whereby uh, we, we undertake the review of, of our micro-organization of states and this also at the end of the day they trigger transfer of functions we are also looking at the feasibility studies on the establishment of um, government components we look also at organizational functionality assessment and the last part looks at uh, service delivery under regulations 36 to 38 
under this uh, regulations focuses on um, operations management framework, service delivery charters, and service delivery improvement plans. <clears throat> now, the second slide talks to the forces that we do believe will shape the future of work in public service. Now, the first force uh, was, is based on the continuous rising citizen expectations. As government, we are responsible for, 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 our, for the citizens. And now and then they do have needs, priorities, that they need the, the government to deliver on. Now, the second force is on increasing physical pressure. Many speakers came to this podium and highlighted the fact that there is no money. The reality is that there is no money. We have to use what we have. And the, the, the last force, technology, to enable us to, uh, to have a space in this uh, new, new arrangements, new work arrangements. Technology as an enabler, we need to regularize it in such a way that it gives clear guidelines, guidelines on how to use it around the issue of information that we are gathering, the data, data usage and, and, and configuration and so forth. Now, based on those three factors, we identified eight drivers. I will just go through those eight drivers without reading, the, uh, without explaining the descriptions. The first driver is uh, citizen experience strategy, government, the second one, government accessibility across all spheres of government, privacy protection, technology, technology enablers, service staff culture innovation, government collaborations, outcomes by design. The third presentation, it talks about the language used in the regulations. Not necessarily in the regulations, in each and every piece of legislation that uh, we as implementers have to be guided by. Do we have the ability to interpret what these regulations are saying we should do? Now, <clears throat> there are conceptual confusion in terms of of some of the things, but here in terms of this presentation, service delivery model have been identified. Now, the service delivery model, for the benefit of those who do not uh, know what it what is, it's a it's a model. It's a it's a delivery model with, which assists the department to to have an understanding of the mand their mandates before before them. A service delivery model will guide them in terms of how, how are they going to render their services and to where and who are their stakeholders. Now, this has been classified in different terminology. Now, we need to look at, at a, system, a, a simplistic manner on how we use these terms. We need to review the terminology and align it to the present day. And also, we have identified a disjuncture in uh, under Regulations 25 and Regulations 30, which talks to strategic plan and ICT plan. Basically, uh, under strategic plan, um, Regulations 25, I do believe, is uh, E. It says that EAs are responsible to specify the IT systems and 30, it says that regulation 30 uh, is the role and responsibility of the EA to develop a inf ICT plan. Now, that part of strategic plan talks about the ICT, IC information system, and this part of uh, inf information communication technology plan talks about uh, the how is it going to be implemented. Now, as a committee, we have a responsibility to look at these things. And how do we promote integrity, I mean, in integration? Now, 
looking at the plans that I have highlighted, the HR plan, the, your, your HRD plan, your equity plan, those we do believe that we can consolidate them. In fact, all the, for instance, for now, focus should be uh, on ensuring that our reporting it's, it's, it's straightforward, understandable, and it doesn't pose a burden on, on our functional responsibilities. Now, if we can consolidate those, uh, for instance, uh, pol uh, plans that are found within a specific value chain and the reporting line, the reporting of those plans be uh, uh, centralized, I'm, I'm not sure where, but when this is there on the table, I do believe we do have the, 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 the brains and the capacity to can decide on that, Depend, uh, uh, more especially looking at, at minimizing time to do our responsibilities. And again, the <clears throat> we also believe that the Regulations 25 is misaligned when looking at the new reforms that are there in terms of the strategic plans and also we need to manage the duplications and reporting on strategic plan we need to incorporate sdips into strategic plans and they we need to also to clarify the it versus data and information management we need to rationalize our plans now, the rationalize of our plans take us back to the issue of those plans because you'll find uh, others are looking only at human resources, a human resource plan, others are looking at the training and development plan, others are looking. So this promotes individualism. So we need to customize, uh, we need to, to uh, present a, a platform whereby all, a, a, a platform which allows us to, to be innovative, to integrate systems so that this can, 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 we can do reporting, we can plan properly without wasting resources and even time. And we also need to improve coordination between the center of government. And this will enable us to cascade this planning and coordination to the next layer of, of implementation. Now, this slide talks to does regulations promote workforce availability and within our our, our group we identified that uh, most if not all of these plans are just malicious compliance like uh, the dg has touched on a matter which i can link it to this that uh, we have a tendency whereby we would submit at the last hour submit plans for signatures. We did not afford the signing authority the opportunity to look at what that authority is signing for. So we need to look at those things. And I do believe that by integrating, we will be able to take responsibility and to ensure that uh, our reporting is synchronized across all functional areas and that there is no integrated planning process, uh, consequences management, uh, and so forth. Now, what works well? Now, in this slide, what works well? We need regulations that promote flexibility. Flexibility then will give us innovation. And therefore, we need to create, uh, I mean, to develop uh, or to make, I'm not sure in terms the correct terminology in terms on how to write regulations, but the same way, we need to have regulations that are supportive of what we are saying we, we are expected to do. And also, uh, under the new areas for improvement, the new areas of improvement, uh, we are saying that uh, the, 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 the regulations, the public service regulations should be packaged in a manner that it shows uh, a value chain, a, a, a workflow. And we need to, to have a level of flexibility or in terms of um, 
reorganizing our acts and re focusing ourselves into an agile uh, public service. And now there is a need also to look at the issue of a uh, matrix approach, a matrix approach whereby we have a pool, a pool of, of, of uh, individuals who possess different skill set in order to participate in different projects. For instance, uh, our organizational structure should be able to, to, to allow us that flexibility flexibility in terms of, of, of undertaking our functional responsibilities. And then in terms of what needs to change, uh, we are saying that uh, the current structures, are, the current system of public service is, is supply driven. We need to focus on a, de on a demand driven. We need to relook re at our performance management system because it does not allow flexibility such as job rotations and so forth. Now, as for one size fits all approach, this will be um, answered by a matrix approach and we also need to move with times. Now, bonus questions are, is uh, location and, man and mandate of CD uh, community development works? I do believe there is a, 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 a plenary a group that is responsible for that. But new, propos new proposal is that we, we would appreciate to have a remote work policy and that, that covers all the needs that we have identified uh, 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 because of the situation that we find ourselves. We need to have an ICT structure, infrastructure that talks to the need, which will enable us to can perform at home and also uh, in the office environment. And in terms of the regulations, uh, we have regulations, but still we still have challenges. Now, the thought of having procedure manuals and so forth that's the question, but we do believe we should continue to have guidelines in, guidelines in place so that it would guide uh, uh, employees in government departments on how they should undertake their functional responsibilities. Thank you. Thanks, Titus, and uh, thanks to the colleagues from Commission 3. Can I just check if the colleagues that were in that commission have any additions? Marcel is shaking his head. Okay, so Titus, it means you've done a very good job. Well done. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take the next commission. Um, and then we'll see after that if um, the, the, there is a need to maybe take some short discussions on both um, the, the inputs before we proceed to the rest of the commission. I'm just mindful of um, the, the, our time pressures. So I think from the last commission, it is not my intention to summarize uh, what was uh, coming out, but I think there's recurring themes that uh, came out from this commission that um, we, we started engaging with from day one, and it's the issue around working in silos, it's issues about integration of systems, integration of planning, um, and I think there's a lot that has been said with regards to the plans that um, come out of the regulations of the PSA and that there is a need for us to try and uh, consolidate uh, those. Um, there were some interesting recommendations about the PSA moving away from being prescriptive but allowing customization and that regulations must promote flexibility. Um, I thought that we were looking for less frameworks and laws and but it looks like this commission believes that on top of regulations we also need guidelines on those regulations so something to think about but i think that um 
I think it just underscores some of the things that we've said around making um, government more effective so that we, we don't become compliance driven, but we leave space for people to be innovative and we leave space for people to be able to start thinking about the work that they're doing rather than complying um, to, to, to what uh, is being prescribed to them. And I'm hoping that the colleagues from DPSA, from both the line function as well as the colleagues that are responsible for drafting the laws that we are discussing and listening, and that effort will be taken to make sure that we take these recommendations on board because the people that are here that are giving us feedback are the actual consumers um, of these regulations. We had a colleague years ago who said policy developers have the tendency to sit in smoke-filled rooms and design policies, but until they become the implementers of those policies, they never know whether their policies are achieving the intended objective. So I think our, our clients or the consumers of our policies are speaking um, and, and that we should uh, listen attentively so that we can really action the intention of this um, session to try and make things easier whilst not compromising on quality um, and efficiencies of what we are trying to achieve. So I'm not sure which commission is ready. Um, it was not my intention to go three, four, five, six, but can I check if commission number four is ready? Final touch. Okay. Um, commission number five. We are also not ready. <laughs> commission number six. Oh, okay. Uh, I see Zaid is making his way here. Is, is Zaid? Yeah? Okay, Zaid? And why are just DP, are the DPSA officials the ones that are speaking? I hope you are not dominating the commissions. <laughs> oh, he says they, they didn't nominate themselves. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, colleagues, we, the commission that we, we looked at was around ICT, but we thought we would talk about the future of work, the future of government, and towards a digital government, because we do see the future of work really being uh, enabled through digital government. The, just from an overview perspective, to, to summarize some of the discussion, we'll talk about the opportunity and the problem. Perhaps not so much about the opportunity we heard yesterday about digital transformation quite a bit. And uh, we'll perhaps skip that part and we'll talk about some of the problems uh, that we need to solve. We'll talk about as well enabling, enabling digital transformation success because we think there are, there are these pillars that we need to look at and we need to reflect on it in the public service context. The importance of an effective ICT function in the digitization journey uh, because really the ICT function is that function that must take us forward. I know that there are, these, there are the uh, purists that might say digital transformation is not an ICT function. It's not something that ICT must drive. It must be dri driven through the business. But the reality is that we look to our ICT function for this transformation. Uh, and we're going to continue to look to our ICT function for this transformation. And in fact, one of the discussions that came up in the, in, in the session was that uh, we talk about Uber and, and how successful Uber is in trans transforming the, the transport sector. What we don't say is that the reason why Uber is so successful, or one of the reasons at least, apart from the, the, transform the transformative part, is that Uber doesn't go down. Your data is safe and you trust it. And that's why, that's why it was successful, because you trust it with your data, your credit card details. Can you imagine 
if Uber had an IT function in the back of it that didn't have security resources, wasn't able to secure your credit card data, was hacked constantly. I wonder how many of us would still be using Uber or Uber Eats. Okay. So we can't overlook the ICT function and we talk about it a little bit. And the need for catalytic in initiatives, as much as we, some may even say, say we're obsessed with internally looking at the ICT function, we do recognize that we need to have some catalytic interventions, some things that excite the public service because we do need excitement. We do need to see those examples of things that are working well. And then of course we'll talk about regulations and proposals. So this is not the, the presentation that we made in the, in, the, in the session. We've trimmed it down and we've tried to focus based on the discussions that we've had. But I thought it's important we talk about the future of our work and, and what our vision is. And it's quite simple. That's really our, our vision. The future of work, this is what we, where we want to go. This is what we want to do, right? You all agree with us. Okay. Thank you. The only thing that we thought we would change on this vision, because it does need some, some, tw some tweaking, is that the guy needs a little bit of shade. There's no way he's going to work eight hours in the public service on the beach with no umbrella. So colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, we'll, we'll take them now. But I, I think we are clear where we need to go and what we need to do. OK, I, I, guess, I guess you know, you know we know we're kidding. So we discussed a lot of the problems. We actually, we came into the plenary session with a, a long list of problems that we had identified as part of the, the planning team. But we were, we were quite surprised actually that many of the issues raised by the colleagues kind of aligned with what we were thinking. So we thought let's, let's capture some of that discussion. The, the one that we talk about is as government we identify these opportunities as far back as 2000, what opportunities are we talking about? We're talking about the opportunities that were discussed yesterday. The drones and the 4IR and the Uber model and the Kodak and, and all of these good stories about 4IR and digital transformation and, and what's possible. Those opportunities we identified as government in 2000. It was called e-government. We had a policy, we had all kinds of things. And so the question of course we have to ask ourselves is, well, 2022, why? Why are we not getting there? Why are we not getting there at, at, at the right pace? And one of the things we actually did was to check with the plenary by, by means of a show of hands. How many of us, or how many of you, let's check, are, are happy with the rate of progress towards digital transformation in the public service? How many of you feel that we are actually getting there at the right speed or we've gotten there? Sorry, put my hand down. Raise your hands, anybody that feels we are there. For those of you that, can't, that don't have eyes behind your back, there's nobody that actually feels that way. And so it, it's important that we then reflect on the why. Why are we not getting there? And we say that actually, if we've started to discuss this in 2000, actually 1998, if we say we have identified as far back as 1998 that there needs to be a central department that's responsible for ICT and for e-government and for transformation. If we say in 1998 and 2000 that we have a department of then telecommunications and now communications and digital technologies, if we have these entire organizations that are responsible for transforming government in some way, shape or form, if we have a state IT agency whose sole function is to transform government through technology, okay, then why are we not getting there? It's, 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 it's a question that we, we reflected on internally in the plenary and we, we didn't necessarily come up with the answers, but we have some indication of, of, of where we need to look. Yeah? So we say we're unable to see significant transformation of services using digital technologies despite conditions existing. We talked about in the last three years we've spent 62 billion rands in the ICT space in government, national and provincial, forget about SARS. Forget about ESCOM. National and provincial government. In the last three years, we've spent 62 billion rands. Okay? We have the structures, we have the policies, we, have, we can show you in, in the cupboard, we have e-government policies that have been approved or strategies that have been approved by cabinet. We have uh, white papers, we have uh, strategies, policies, all of these kinds of things, so why? Now, some of the, the sentiment that came out of the plenary was that one, ICT is largely unregulated unlike finance. It's one of the first comments that came up to say, when we look in the finance space, we find all of these rules and regulations and hoops that people need to jump to when you jump through when you want to spend money. 
And we're going to look at the regulations and what we say about ICT. And we'll find that they actually it's highly unregulated. I say that knowing where I come from and who's, I'm speaking as, with my DPSA hat on. Okay. Uh, but compared to the finance section, okay, we find ICT is largely unregulated in terms of what department needs to do and how they need to do it. Perhaps, perhaps we can reflect on it as a collective. Is that one of the reasons why we're finding this lack of maturity and this lack of progress in the digital transformation space? Uh, there were calls for a one government view or one government issues around one government. There was sentiment that talks about, well, why are we still doing it ourselves as departments? Why are we building ourselves? Why are we not sharing? And there are examples that we know of. Gauteng are sharing certain technologies and they are moving. The Western Cape as a province, they are sharing, sharing certain business processes and certain technologies and they are moving. Uh, so it can be done. Now, we aren't saying centralize everything in government, of course, but we are saying look at these models in our existing environment that have been working and perhaps we need to be talking about one gov. Disconnected systems and lack of integration and lack of data sharing, including big data. I think every speaker that spoke talked about data sharing, talked about lack of integration. Clearly it's a problem that we all know about and it clearly came out in the plenary. Uh, the centralized approach, this was quite interesting, a centralized approach to innovation and digitization while delivery is decentralized. They're saying, well, you here as a DPSA, you're trying to, to drive innovation, you're trying to drive digitization, okay? But delivery of services is actually decentralized. So how do we then start to bring that two, those two concepts together? And how are the current regulations assisting us in this, with these two different uh, spaces? Now, the compliance nature of government versus the exploratory nature of digitization, and how do we strike a balance? I remember in a session of, of, of FOSAD that the, uh, I'm not sure whether to call him the HOD of SARS, whatever the right delegation is, he'll forgive me for this, raised the issue about PFMA and the regulations and how it's stifling transformation. He's saying that there are technologies that are really good that can be deployed very quickly, okay, that are quite innovative, but the PFMA is holding us back. Now, whether that's true or not, I, th I guess the experts in the finance space and, and, and others need to come together and, and look at the specifics and see how we can enable transformation and innovation with our existing legislation and how we need to tweak it. But it's certainly an issue that's being raised to say innovation, digitization, uh, uh, compliance nature of government, exploratory in the nature of digitization uh, and striking that balance. Now, I guess this is probably, the next one is not ICT related, but it came out very strongly in the plenary that the DPSA back to work policy does not consider productivity results of working from home. I think there were probably about five or six speakers that spoke about it and said there were some examples that people said that where, during lockdown I was able to, to review, what was the numbers, really help me, 16 policies or develop 16 policies and review eight policies. The individual can, can, can correct us if we, if we must go to them. But the sentiment is that we were productive when we were working remotely and now that we've come back to the office we are finding that we are distracted by whatever and whatever. Not necessarily a digital transformation issue, but I think it's an issue that's relevant for the broader collective. Uh, how do we make sure that there's no silo planning? And one of the things we'll, we'll see in the regulations and what we are proposing, uh, we talk about planning and how to improve the planning and, and integration of ICT planning. But we didn't consider, let me be honest, the issue of silo planning. If we say to departments, every one of you develop a plan, even if it is integrated in you from your perspective, how do we then integrate it from an all of, all of government perspective? How do we ensure that we don't have the silo planning? And I thought it was an important point that was raised in the plenary. And then the, the issue of the stuck IFMS, I'm just gonna leave it there, the stuck IFMS. Okay. I don't know that we can solve it here. But these are some of the challenges that were raised in the plenary. Now, we spoke about what are the enabling uh, success factors in digital government. And we raise four, four areas. Strategies, we talk about governance models and organizational structures, we talk about the recruitment and development of workers, and we talk about the creation and acquisition of technology assets. Yeah. Those are four pillars that even according to some of the experts, McKinsey for instance in 2016 said, those that are successful, those organizations that are, that are successful have looked at these areas and, 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 and started to build capacity and started to deal with them. Uh, if we look in our context around this issue of integration, 
And it's something that came up in the plenary. Okay? We're wanting integration of data. We have a service delivery model that is disintegrated. From a citizen perspective, you have to go to each department. There's no client segment where a citizen can go in and deal with uh, issues of birth and education and all of those things end to end. And so this is a question around the service delivery model and how we deal with it. And we don't know what the answer is. We do know that as far back as 2000 even, these concepts were out. These concepts were being spoken about in governments to say, how do we create integrated channels? Okay, and how do integrated channels help the citizen and help us as government? So possibly a future digitally enabled service model looks like that. But I guess for us at this point in time in this discussion, we simply need to figure out who or where in government are we having this discussion? Who is responsible for building this out if it is something that we need to build out? If we can identify that, then it's something we can take away and we can say, okay, in the next coming months or years or whatever it may be, we are going to move towards this. We need, it needs planning, it needs thinking, it needs architecture, it needs all of these kinds of things. But it's something that I think is important for the discussion around digital transformation. Then the issue of digital govern governance. And this is really about who is governing the space from a digital perspective. Yeah? We know about DCDT, we know about the ECT Act, and these are we talk about country-level e-strategies, we talk about the digital economy and digital citizenry and digital skills. It's clear from, uh, for, for everybody who, what the ECT Act says and who's responsible for it. But things have started to get a little bit murky in the model. Okay? We have the Public Service Act and regulations, we have the DPSA, and we know what we're responsible for, norms and standards, innovation, e-government, GTOC secretariat, amongst other things. We have the CETA Act and regulations, and it talks about centralized ICT procurement and must services and may services. And we have Treasury and we have the PFMA and we have the Office of the CPO, who is also starting to regulate in the ICT space through some of the procurement stuff, starting to say to departments, you can and you cannot use these technologies and this is how you use and buy ICT technologies or digital technologies. So you can see the, the, the waters are a little bit muddy when it comes to a digital governance perspective. Equally so, when we go to the broken or the ICT delivery model. And this is about, we have 160, I hope nobody quotes me. I think it's right, 160 odd departments and or components in government. Each one has an ICT function, okay? And that ICT function is responsible primarily for the digitization of that vertical, of that department. Now we've created a model back from in 1998 that is a central ICT model that had a DPSA that was responsible for, for the public service that had a state IT agency whose, primary, whose sole responsibility was digitizing and delivering ICT technologies to departments. We had centralized all of the ICT staff into the, seat, into the state IT agency. And then in 2002, we created a little bit of a hybrid model. We confused things in my view. We then said, no, 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 okay, fine. You've given us a CETA, you've given CETA all your resources, but now take back your mandate and you, a, you can do it yourself. You can build your own ICT systems. You can imagine the confusion. And this is why, in my view, that we find ourselves in 2022 and we have some departments that are struggling to capacitate their ICT functions. They are really struggling. There were numbers that came up in the, in the discussion. Some departments had five. I think we asked people to talk. Maybe I must ask DPSA now. I'll save you from that. How many ICT staff do you have in your organization? And some said five and some said six. Now, we are expecting six people in an organization sometimes that's in excess of a thousand people, okay? To support their desktops, to support their network, to back up their data, to transform, to automate their systems, to do all of these kinds of things. In an environment, in a model that in my view is broken, because we've said to CETA, you don't know, you no longer have to do it. Departments can come and ask you to do it, fine, but you don't have to do it. And so now you have this confused IT model, okay? That in my view is broken, and as a result you see only 17% of all ICT procurement is from CETA. 17% of the annual 21 billion, or over three years, 62 billion, is from CETA. Now ask yourself, why do we not get the best prices on the laptops? Why are we not able to, to, to get the best price for these technologies? Why is technology in government so expensive compared to private sector? Why, does, why do things take so long? 17% of departments are buying from CETA. This is the same agency that we developed in 1998 as the shared model to be able to do what we needed to do for all of the, all of the departments. 
Now, in 2022, we're starting to ask these questions. And in the plenary, am I out of time? Oh, my word. Okay. All right. No problem. <laughs> we have a broken model. Uh, we can discuss it later if anybody wants the details. All right. We also have done an analysis of the regulations. Uh, long story short, a lot of the stuff, a lot of what we have currently from an ICT perspective in the regulations, we can chuck out and we need to introduce new stuff. Right? I'm really summarizing it now. <laughs> Same story. This is just a continuation. There's some stuff that's good. We can reuse. We can strengthen. There's other stuff we need to throw away. Okay? Uh, this is quite important, please. We have, one, we have, according to the data that we had at the time, I think it was a year back, we had 1,134,442 full-time employees in the public service. Okay? In ICT functions currently, we have 4,523 national and provincial de departments, all of them, 4,500. That's 0.3% in our ICT function. And as well he says, and we want to do drones and digitize, and we want to do 4IR, but we've got 0.3% Capacity. This is just capacity. Warm bodies. Let's not have the discussion. And we can have some of the discussion here. Who are they and what are they doing? You'll see. 22% of them are doing desktop support. Ask yourself about databases. 29 people. Ask yourself about project management. 92. Business and systems analysts. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where resources sit with you as a business and say, well, tell me what your, your process is. Let me understand and identify a technology that can automate and digitize it. This is the digitization. This is where it happens, 172, 3%. I guess you get what I'm trying to say here. We need to prioritize reskilling and upskilling of public servants towards the capacitation of ICT functions. If we are serious about 4IR, we need to identify. I'm not saying hire new people. I'm not saying take the 1.134442 to 2 million. To 2 million. No. I'm saying of that one, one, three, four, 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 two, how many can now be moved into the ICT function? Can we identify specific training programs where we say, okay, the ICT function should look like this. We've identified whether it's young people, whether it's talented people, whether it's people that are passionate about technology and move them into those functions and start to capacitate it because this is where your 4IR is going to happen, I promise you. It's nowhere else. Uh, yo, so much, okay. Long story short, again, we have an ICT function that's ineffective and lacking mature practices. Okay? Again, take our word for it, and I'm, I'm going to show you some numbers very quickly. In 2021, 90% of departments had weak IT general controls, according to the AG. In 2021, 63% of departments had weak IT governance, 63% and 90%. Colleagues, I'm not talking about 20%. I'm not talking about 50%. They are saying 90% have weaknesses. Okay? Clearly, this is a... What's the right word? It's the word they used for COVID. Pandemic. Maybe this is our pandemic in the ICT space. Okay. Fifty percent of all of those ICT projects that were sampled failed. They failed to meet the business expectations. This is a story that we all know about. Yeah. And it's all pointing to an ICT function that's ineffective and lacking mature practices. So let me let me run from here. There are a number of things that we are saying and we've started to say, we've taken to cabinet about how to fix that specific ICT function. We are including in that, and we have included in that to cabinet, we've spoken about enterprise or all of government prescripts. We are saying it can't be that there's this project called IFMS that is being managed by DPSA and Treasury. Yeah? It's affecting all of us. Okay? But there's no governance, there's no all of government governance around that project, or whether it's eHealth, or whether it's eNatus. There are strategic projects in government that affect all of us. Okay, that require us to have another level of compliance. Why? Because we cannot afford as a country for those projects to fail. So we talk about an enterprise project management office. We talk about an enterprise architecture board, okay, and looking at contracts and looking at, and we talk about ICT clearinghouse and spending controls. Yo, uh, let me say one thing. Let me say one thing from you, please. You know, we're asking for, if, if you listen to, to, to the colleagues yesterday, they all they tell us to change the way we're thinking and think differently about our problems. I just want to, I want to talk about just one line, open data opportunities and how we can use some of these concepts to, to change some of our fundamental problems. We, we know about performance of SMS, okay. but what if we were to say that we want to make 
all performance agreement data and assessment data of SMS available online to the public, what do you think would happen? I mean, I'm an SMS member, so firstly, I cringe, right? Because, but also when I think about it, the minute you start to expose our own performance, whether it's around SMS or whether it's around projects, okay, you find that it's in this public spotlight and it comes back to that, did I talk about the Korean example? Maybe I didn't. But when it's exposed and people can see it, you see, you see a change in mindset and you see a change in approach and you see, well, all of a sudden I can't hide as a, as a senior manager in the public service if I've only delivered on 50% of my targets. Somebody's going to ask me a question. I hope it's not the SABC, Mail and Guardian, but clearly it's going to have an impact. And these are the kinds of things that we need to think about and come up with, okay, that change the paradigm for us. Uh, okay, just one more thing. Exploring using versus building. We have this mindset where we want to say, well, okay, we need a system, and perhaps Gauteng is a system, let's build a system like Gauteng's system. I say no. Say if we have a province or a department that is running a mature system for a business process that is common across the board, why not adopt that technology as a transversal offering? And why not incentivize or... Uh, instruct that particular department that has a mature system to run that system as a transversal offering. These are kinds of things that we need to think about that are practical, okay, that might make a difference. Because the reality, colleagues, is 160 departments do not have a mature ICT function to build a, a mature technology set to support your business. We can wait for the skills development program we can fast track the skills development program and we can wait for that ICT function to be capacitated or we can start to take specific decisions now that says let's change, let's, uh, what is the buzzword on 4IR? Not digitize. It'll come to me. Uh, and then we have some recommendations in the amendments. I think I've, I've, I've overstayed my welcome here. Uh, we'll share the presentation. Uh, there are some, 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 some things that we are talking about around digitization where we're saying, well, for 20 years or 30 years, we've said to departments, do e-government, digitize, it's not happened, but we actually didn't regulate it. If you go look in the regulations, there's nothing that's forcing departments right now to go and digitize their processes, public facing or internal. There are, there are some things that you might be able to read into it, but nothing direct that says, in the next 18 months, I want you as a department to identify these critical services. I want you to submit a report or a plan to DPSA or Treasury or Presidency. We are going to combine it, and we are going to develop a roadmap in the next five years or three years to digitize. And I think it's time we did that. Yeah, so much to say, sorry. <laughs> Now I can see why people took so long in their commissions. Um, the, the amount of detail that uh, we have seen is, is very impressive. And uh, I think Zaid has uh, set a new standard of how you present. Uh, you first say thank you before you actually do the presentation. What a way to capture um, the attention of, of, of your audience. Um, I think maybe we'll have to discuss our, after the session with the, the Secretariat, how do we make um, all the presentations, including the ones from today, available to colleagues, because I think time pressure is uh, making us maybe to be a little bit unfair um, in terms of um, allowing people to go through the, all their presentations. But thanks very much to the two commissions that have presented thus far. I want to check um, if you want us to take all the commissions or do you want us to break if you have any questions for the two that we've had. I know that there is um, some inputs from colleagues that are joining us virtually. What's your pleasure? Take them all. Okay.
Prince, can you hold off on those ones um, and just note for me if there's more um, questions and comments that are coming um, from the virtual platform. Um, just one that I noted. Can you do 4IR and drones with 0.3% of staff in the entire public service? The next commission, um, who is ready? Commission number? Number five, over to you, sir. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm uh, entrusted with the responsibility by the committee, Commission uh, 5, that deals with Chapter 5, that focuses on uh, SMS, Senior Management Service Members, uh, the appointment. So firstly, I will then apologize to the audience that we did not prepare the slides due to time constraints. So I wonder if others had sufficient time to prepare such a, a long presentation. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, then as a, as a commission, then we focus on uh, chapter five uh, SMS uh, members, for SMS members. Uh, then we wanted to analyze or to discuss. The discussion was around the feasibility of the regulation and uh, the directive that are governing the SMS in the public service. And uh, specifically, to be specific, it's from uh, regulation 81 to regulation 92. Then we therefore uh, discussed with the members of the commission. We then find that um, in terms of the existing legislation or the directive, there are few hindrances that are there that are prohibiting the, the, the public service to attract and uh, to retain and uh, to sustain the service delivery uh, towards the end of service of those members who are aging. I'm sorry if the, 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 the word aging is inappropriate, but I'm sorry. Uh, those uh, 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 members of the SMS who are about to leave or to, to, to retire. Then we therefore uh, decided that maybe there are issues that the public service need to address in order to ensure that we are attracting the skills from the private sector as other speakers. Thank you. Am I too tall? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so as other speakers have already indicated that uh, in terms of uh, the attraction of people from the private sector, there are always problems that the human resource or the public services is facing when they try to attract a talent from outside. It's either because of uh, the, the requirement that we are setting in our advertisement or because of uh, the salary issues or the salary uh, regulations or the regulation that are regulating the, the salary uh, of, of, of the employees who are appointed in the public service. So, uh, to be specific, we spoke about when, when, when we deal with that, we then identify regulation at, uh, 44. To say regulation 44, maybe it's also part of the problem that we are having in the public service, that once you appoint a person who's earning higher than the, pay, uh, the, the salary scale, for example, on SMS level of a director, then the person is from outside or the private sector is earning maybe uh, a salary that is equivalent to a chief director, then we, we are unable to appoint those people because we are having a regulation that says uh, you, we must appoint uh, 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 the candidate or the employees at the uh, first 
notch of, 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 of the scale. So the, the public service is unable to attract uh, people. That is the error that we identified and under attraction. Then we then focus on the Nyugela as part of the, the, the problem. Nyugela certificate, we said it seemingly does not help the public service or whatever it assesses the, 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 the candidate or the person who has registered for that course. It's not clear whether it assists in terms of developing the person or to test the competence level of that particular person that the person can be then uh, confirmed that can be able to function at the level of a director or senior management, especially if that person is on an MMS level. The Nugela uh, certificate, maybe those who are uh, having powers, they need maybe to also uh, look at it and in terms of the structure and the content of the assessment that are there. So seemingly it's not a, 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 a tool that can be used to test the competency level of the person whether or to capacitate a person for him or her to perform the function at the senior management level, especially if the person maybe is on MMS level. Another element, then we look at the experience that is required uh, for entry to SMS uh, since uh, there is an emphasis that the, the, there is a need that we attract more youth in, in SMS uh, level post. Then it appears that um, if we are having this um, five, year, five years experience that is required, when we calculate and having discussion with the, with the committee and my cabinet, uh, we then find that uh, it's very rare or it's not achievable. If it is achievable, but in other uh, maybe job or occupations, not all occupations, maybe where you will be required to start your career at salary level five, level six. Maybe in those career where you start, where the entry level is at salary level eight, nine, maybe then you can be able to be an MMS, SMS level, at SMS level while you are on your late youth age. Because of the age, we, we are saying the, the, the years that you spend at school, it's like uh, from uh, 18, between, you finish your schooling uh, between 18 and 20. Then you, you are going to tertiary for three to four years. Uh, obviously, you are 25 years. Then you go for internship, two, two years. You go back home, you sit, you are unemployed. If they did not make provision for a registered establishment, those who are able. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you are unemployed, maybe you will be unemployed for a period of two years. When you get the employment at salary level seven or, or salary level six, you are already 27 or 28. You get appointed at salary level seven. Before you become level uh, nine, assistant director, they require that you, you are having at least minimum, minimum three years of experience at, at supervisory level. As we are uh, making that, that disclaimer to say, in other occupation, it might be possible, but not for all occupations. It depends on the entry level for that post. Then you are appointed on, on ASD after, uh, you are, after maybe three or four years. You are appointed as ASD. Uh, they require three years uh, at supervisory level or two. Before you up, we get appointed as a, a deputy director, then they, they require uh, two to three years uh, at, as uh, assistant director. How old are you now? You are probably uh, 33. You are towards the end of that youthful age. So by the time you, you serve as a deputy director, they require you to have five years experience as an MMS. So seemingly it's impossible. Maybe there's something need to be done, but the commission has proposed something. Then we go for assessment, uh, competence assessment. Uh, this time we are dealing with SMS very robustly. <laughs> All right. Um, competence assessment also, the commission deliberated and found that 
there are areas maybe that the department need to improve on because they find that there is no prohibition of appointment or there is nothing that um, prescribes that the person who performed or who did not perform or achieved those competency areas for competency assessment cannot be appointed as SMS. Even if you achieve one in all areas, you get recommended because on the interview, you performed well and the, 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 the committee recommended you. The competency assessment now is a tool that to check whether you can be able uh, to, to perform, to deal with the strategic management leadership finance. The, the, the commission further made an example that you find the person is appointed as a CFO, but that person is not performing right in the area of financial management, but the person is appointed. You find a person maybe who's dealing with a, a, a human resource management. That person needs strong leadership, uh, I assume. I'm not saying, I assume. Um, it requires a, a strong a, a competency in leadership because that person will be dealing with the people. People management skill is one of those areas that are required for, from that particular uh, candidate. So then the, the, the committee says those developmental gaps that are identified in those uh, competence assessment when the outcome comes back to the department to finalize the, the recruitment process, uh, you find that is there that the person needs to be developed in certain areas, but the departments, after they have appointed that, 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 that person, they start advertising other posts and forget about those who have already been appointed, which means the capacity building is still a problem, or the empowerment of those existing uh, a talent within the organization now, because that person has joined the department. Then they, we then therefore say, once that person is not performing, that person, they, 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 they deploy that person to another unit because they are saying there's an underperformance or poor performance from that particular person. While the performance, while the competence assessment has given the feedback and the outline of how the person's uh, 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 skills gap uh, can be addressed. So you find that we are having uh, 18 uh, SMS members appointed, only one will be, uh, go under, uh, will be will be trained maybe in terms of those areas that are identified in the in the competency assessment the human resources in the department we are then saying as a committee not myself we are saying maybe they are not making a use of those recommendations of those competency assessment by ensuring that those identified training they address them with the, the 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 candidate who are appointed in the in the in the position then the other committee commission members is are those sms members are willing are they willing to be trained are they that is the question and you will ask yourself in your department how many sms members attend the workshops how many sms members attending uh, short courses maybe the answer will be uh one percent or two percent then it's, it seems like uh, they are not willing to be trained while there are areas that are identified. So in that area of attraction, I think, and talent, I have exhausted all areas. And if I have left something, then my cabinet will then add. Uh, we then go for a retention. Under retention and the capacity building, uh, as a public service, we, we are unable to retain the skills that we are having uh, because of the competition that we are having with the private sector. The private sector are attracting the skills that we are having. Those people who are, are, are highly skilled, they, they are pushed by the, the private sector and they're leaving the public sector, uh, the, the public sector or public service because we are unable to measure the salary that are offered by the private sector. Okay. You didn't stick to your promise. Hallelujah. My bone goes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm about to finish. Uh, in terms of uh, those uh, uh, capacity, capacity building, then we therefore need to, to, to build capacity in the public service through retention, 
and uh, maybe uh, 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 having the environment that allows, the environment also plays a role in terms of having the people being interested in working those areas. It's part of retention, a strategy that the environment itself, it also contributes because you find people leaving the organization, not because uh, of the salary, but the environment is not enabling the growth of that particular individual. All right. So we then, f we therefore say, uh, in order to preserve that knowledge that is already there in those people that we are having in the public service, uh, those uh, uh, senior members, of SMS or SMS members, we are then saying, uh, in order to re to preserve that knowledge, we then need to have a mixed generation in SMS. How then the the solution are proposed by the 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 commission, not myself. So, how do we keep institutional memory through that mixed generation? So we then therefore need to have the 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 strategy to to address the future supply of SMS members, because we might have those SMS members who are about to retire and you, you leave the, the, the vacancies uh, vacant and it's, we, are, we are unable as a department to fill those a particular post because the, the post has been vacant and the, the knowledge was not shared and you find the department now requesting to have additional uh, to establishment for that particular individual appointing the person post retirement then you wonder a person who is at uh, SMS level was not training uh, the deputy directors or the chief director was not training the directors. It's a question for another day. So we are therefore saying uh, the knowledge management also, uh, knowledge management policy need to be used and the department need to make use of such policies for the benefit of the public service. Uh, in terms of the solution, we have few solutions. We said the directive on SMS members must be reviewed maybe to, to ensure that the department are training those uh, members and make sure that when the person get appointed, the competence assessment become part of the selection of the candidate, not just a, a, an assessment and then you keep it in your shelves. You need to consider that before you appoint a person. Another one, we're saying a coaching and mentoring. SMS members are expected to coach those MMS members and assistant directors and mentor them. Delegation of function is another measure that you can use to, 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 to capacitate those MMS members. And uh, therefore, we are saying we need also to include, uh, as it is included on performance management, I'm not sure if I, I, I'm correct, uh, uh, Edward or Temba, Liza. If uh, the on SMS members are required then to have that people management as a responsibility and they must be assessed on that. Department must make sure that they assess those SMS members because you are, you are also expected to have develop your, 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 your team. If you are leaving and we say goodbye, we do a, a farewell and we see you on pension. Thank you very much. Eh? Thank you, Commission Number Five, and your very vibrant uh, presenter. Um, we, as agreed, we will uh, go and take now the last commission. I've lost my numbers. I think we were following a sequence. We said three, four, and five. Uh, is this Commission Number Six, or we started with Commission Number Six, or Commission Number Four? It's DPSA again. <laughs> Renel, come up. Thank you.
colleagues, I, I think we, we tried to look at one of the biggest chunks of what we were assigned as a commission to do. By the way, good afternoon, colleagues. Sorry, we were trying to integrate this whole thing. We shouldn't forget to greet. I hope everybody had a nice lunch. And luckily, people spoke before us because we're going to have an opportunity to kind of put things together but not take too long because Madam Boss here will say you need to move. So the idea was to look at employment matters. And as, as everyone knows, employment matters forms the heart of what we do in the public service. It's how we get people in and what we do with them when we get them in, how we manage them, how we develop them, how we administrate around those individuals to deliver on the targets that we set. So we cannot talk about isolating only regulations. We need to look at the whole picture. So in our commission, we looked at basically assessing what the problem statement is. You know, is our policies that we are developing as DPSA conforming to the desired outcomes that departments want to achieve when they want to create a highly skilled and dynamic and ever-changing public service? Because that's what we're talking about here, the future of work. So isolating and pinpointing regulations is nice. We're going to look at that. But the focus is going to be of how we bring all these things together. Because as you are aware, before you start to recruit, and there was another commission that dealt with the HR planning and uh, strategic planning and all those processes that need to be done before you actually get to a point of getting people in. And we were very progressive in our commission when we said that if you don't get that part right, the chances of you getting your recruitment right is going to be very slim. But we tend to often point a finger at we haven't recruited correctly. We haven't recruited correctly because we do we understand the mandate of the department? Do we understand the skill set that we need to achieve that mandate? And how are we articulating that process is through your HR planning and your organizational design and development? So it's, it was four key areas that we tried to look at. Human resource forecasting, so strategic HR. Human resource administration, your recruitment, appointment, selection. Human resource management, when we get people in, what, what do we do from a probationary perspective, from a PMDS perspective, conditions of service, and human resource development. So how do we maintain those skills that we have, even under the circumstances that we find ourselves in with regard to budgetary constraints? How are we reskilling people for the benefit of their progression within the organization, as well as to make sure that we keep up with the trends of an ever-changing institution. Um, so I think we, we, we the, the other colleagues covered the angles of the strategic plan and mandate, the organizational structure and design, the HR plan, the employment equity plan, the HRD plan. But where we, where we had to start was how do we determine grading of jobs? How do we fill the boxes in terms of the functions that we expected to deliver on? And how do we determine what those people need in order for them to be successful in the job? And it is a fine balancing act because there was a lot of discussions in the commission, in the plenary around we being too inflexible in, in terms of how we deal with our inherent requirements through our job evaluation process where people are saying, can't we look at, instead of a qualification, a number of years of experience? But then we need to contextualize why we do what we do in terms of qualifications. Because certain professions need certain qualifications in order for that person to be able to function in the job. So it's about assessment of understanding the job requirements scientifically in order to understand how you want to recruit for that particular post. So we, we actually looked fundamentally at some of the things that we are unable to do currently. We, we have an inability, I haven't gotten there yet, we have, a, we have an inability to attract and retain scarce skills. And remember we have a whole OSD that was put together for this purpose. And we, it's one of the regulations that we had to review under Regulation 42. It's 42 if I'm not mistaken, the OSD to have an assessment around that. And people often forget why those OSDs were created. They were created to attract 
specific professional skills into the public service. But then there was an argument in the commission around, okay, but we need to pay scarce skills allowances because we're not able to attract certain skills that might have fell through the cracks because we didn't do our forecasting correctly. Why do we have, Zaid presented about, and, and Zaid, sorry, my presentation is not as sophisticated as yours, um, but he presented around the actual capacity of IT skills in the public service. Clearly, over the last five to 10 years, we have not forecasted correctly. There is no OSD for IT, and we are unable to, uh, to attract and retain those skills. Because can we afford the guy from IBM who costs three million a year? We can't. We can't even retain or attract a person at that kind of salary to do that kind of job. And, and that's the realities of what we're faced with. The issues around vacant and funded posts not being filled within the prescriptive times and the application of Regulation 57, which is additional to the establishment. Are we not abusing this particular regulation? And do we keep our posts unfilled because we keep on extending contracts and perpetuating that into labor disputes later on? Because the reality is we see a lot of departments with permanent posts in the structure that don't fill those perm permanent posts but a point additional to the establishment. And if I'm building a story here, you also get the problem of when those persons additional to the establishment apply for post, they are graded on, say, for example, level 14. The post is at level 13, which they apply for. And the automatic expectation is that I'm going to earn my level 14 salary. But what they fail to realize, Regulation 44 is written in a specific way that doesn't allow us to retain you at level 14 because you were not occupying a post. It's also not a good practice to appoint somebody additional to the establishment and then uh, just as a way of managing a higher salary, which is why the regulation is there. It clearly needs a lot of review, that specific regulation, because it prevents us from attracting and retain, retaining individuals uh, uh, to the public service. But it needs to be done with caution. Um, so ideally, we need to find ways of reducing the time it takes to fill a post because that it has a detrimental impact on how we function as a department. We need to understand the skills requirements in order to determine what the in inherent requirements of the job needs to be. If we don't understand that, we're going to continuously get it wrong and appoint the wrong people and try to skill them while they need to function in the job. In terms of organizational structuring, I think it was covered here. We need to get our structures right because we shouldn't be having a 40% staff complement additional to the establishment because we have structures and there's funding against that structure and we're using the same COE to pay persons additional to the establishment as opposed to filling our posts on the permanent structure. In terms of, uh, of okay, I think that the issue around human resource planning has been covered. Okay, now to get down in terms of the, uh, the actual integral discussions that took place in the commission uh, around specific regulations. Um, the, around the grading, it was said that there needs to be a standardization of, of posts that comes from the DPS as, as benchmark job descriptions, as, as standardized job descriptions. And that will allow departments to, ha to avoid the inconsistency, even throughout the provinces, to have a, direct, a deputy director on level 11 in one province doing finance, and then a deputy director on level 12 in another province doing finance. It's exactly the same job. And there was a long discussion around core versus administrative posts. I'm even saying that the minister currently does this for uh, posts in the, in the office of the executive in terms of Regulation 66. So against that premise, there should be a level of consistency and uniformity around specific positions in the public service that is consistent across the public service. And we need to look at what kind of core functions that we want to look at from a sectoral perspective and isolate those and have discussions with those sectors and establish those uniform job, job descriptions. So it makes it easier for departments to get to the processes of recruitment when they need to evaluate those posts. We cannot have inconsistent grading. That's why people job hop. If I'm a deputy director in finance at level 11, 
and I want to move to, uh, uh, if I apply for a deputy director level 12 post in another department. We're the same public service. I'm leaving here for one salary higher. And that shouldn't happen. The consistency should be there for the same function that needs to be dealt with. Um, I think that's covered. Inherent requirements of the job were spoken to in length as well, where we, we, we deal with this particular area when we determine what the job requirements are at the processes through the job description and the, and the job profiling processes. And this is how we determine grades. Now, when departments ask for a deviation at the point of advertising, it goes against the premise of how that job was graded. Because if you ask to deviate and lower a requirement when you advertise the post already, you lose sight of the fact that it was graded at that specific level because of those requirements that you put in there. So by implication, would, I, would, would, would it be correct for us to then say you need to review that job if you want to lower the requirements to suit a person to be appointed into a post? So that's another thing that we need to look at more coherently. When do we ask for these deviations and does it make sense to ask for deviations on inherent requirements of the job, which you as a department 99% of the time did yourself in terms of your executive authority. In terms of Regulation 44, and I think we touched on this already to a certain degree, there was a, a serious matter around us being able, not being able to actually attack, attract and retain. And I don't want to belabor the point, but I think historically there was significant changes around this particular regulation because it was open to abuse. Currently, you can only recruit or retain people, uh, I think, the notch closest to the current the, the offer from the outside. Um, and even if you were to uh, recruit, you, it's, it's only servicing internal public servants, which for me is not necessarily correct. But again, if you're going to review this particular regulation, you need to be very careful that we don't go back to where we were, where people were sitting in gray areas because of job offers that came from outside and they're sitting on personal salary levels outside the, 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 the grading that we have. And that is another reality. Because we can't afford the guy from IBM at three million rand a year. The question is, how do we get the skills in and try and manage those skills? Because we don't accommodate this regulation for the, for the private sector. We only protect internal conditions of service of currently serving public servants. Um, there was a lot of talk around overtime and the 30%, which uh, created a bit of disparity, and we, we, we thought that it would be important to review the wording in that regulation, because it speaks about less than 30%, and it can be inconsistently applied if there's no guidance offered in terms of that, because I could give somebody 5%, somebody else 10%, somebody else 20%, if there's no level, level of uniformity, and this was coming straight out of the commission. Um, we also spoke about working hours. And interestingly enough, this ties back to the remote working policy. Because it's not only about your place of work, but the hours that you put into, into the work with regard to the other uh, legislative framework that's utilized, which is the BCA. Your basic conditions of employment determines how and how long or how many hours you should work at the workplace. But then there was also a question around productivity. And this ties also to another regulation that we had to look at in terms of the PMDS. And to what extent are people actually being productive in that eight hours that they are actually at the office? And look, it sparks a lot of debate, and I think that's the purpose of having these kind of endeavors, because it allows you to look more laterally at processes without upsetting anybody or around specific regulations that they are responsible for. Um, we need a clearer definition in terms of workplace environment because a workplace environment, if we want to define correctively what a remote working policy would mean, and we had, a, we, looked, we had a gentleman from SARS that was sitting in our commission and he also shared with us some of the experiences that SARS has had with regard to how they've implemented their remote working policy. So it was like a 60-40 split in terms of how they manage the staff complement at SARS. And it worked for them in terms of the processes uh, w when it came to the, uh, the application of, of remote working. And maybe there's some lessons learned that we can actually 
have a discussion with SARS with because the DPSA is busy with a remote working policy with regard to that. Um, we also looked at regulation that was dealing with uh, HIV and AIDS and other diseases and the Commission felt that we need to now look at how we encapsulate pandemics like what we've been experiencing now. Um, because it, it isolates specific uh, 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 diseases, but it doesn't cover it in general. So there needs to be some level of specification around that particular uh, regulation to align it uh, to the current experiences that we've had over the last two years. We also had a long discussion around additional to the establishment. Um, and, and I think that is, is, it should be a separate regulation because it's convoluted currently with uh, minimum requirements for entry into the public service and then all of a sudden we speak about additional to the establishment. Remember the section of the act that deals with how you employ people, whether it's on the structure or additional to the establishment, whether it's temporary or permanent, finds expression in terms of this regulation because an, a regulation is an extension of the operational requirements of the act. So in terms of this, we feel that it should be separated. Additional to the establishment should find expression as its own regulation in the Act, and it should be a 12-month period because that is how, that is the purpose of additional to the establishment. Because one of the arguments that was raised is, do you really want to argue that if a person has to spend more than a year in a post, a position additional to the establishment, that's not a function that you need on the organizational structure. Because surely, if somebody, if you're perpetually extending a contract of an individual, you're not only ex ex creating expectations, you're also, you need to ask yourself, do I not need this function because this person is doing this function? But the other thing, the other side of the coin is that people don't fill their posts and continue to employ the person additional to the establishment. Remember, additional to the establishment is, is a temporary requirement. So if that's why it's up to 12 months, and we do have a provision that allows, I'm almost there, we do have a provision that allows for um, a, an extended period, but that has to come via the MPSA. And we very kind of, when we look at the assessment of that extended period, the moment that a department has that function on their structure, we actually decline that request. Because we say to the department, you had 12 months while this person was occupying the, the, the position additional to the establishment, servicing this, function, you should have actually filled the post. Um, in terms of secondment, there were different schools of thought in terms of secondment. I, uh, some were saying it should be 12 months because what would be the deficit of the person leaving their current position? Others were arguing we need to look at more flexibility in terms of specific projects that we need to run. I think all are good, but if you, if you want to second an official for longer than 12 months, I would then debate whether you need the post on the other side. Because who services that function? You're putting pressure, depending on the level of who that person is that you've seconded, you're putting pressure of this, on the staff that you leave behind for a period longer than 12 months to actually exercise that function. And that's some of the unintended consequences. But we need to look at whether a project-based approach would kind of work in, that, in this kind of circumstance, especially if there's specific skills needed that is found in other departments. So that's something that we, needed, we, we felt that needed to be revisited. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've, we've covered it, but we're going to make the uh, presentation available uh, to departments. Uh, it, it, we, yeah, I, we, we did cover it in, in, in up until there. Uh, but we did cover other things as well, and I want to, quickly go through it, Linda. Um, the competency assessments for SMS, I think Pilani was up here speaking about them. You know, some of the schools of thought when we speak to departments, it's, 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 it takes about four weeks to turn around that process. And that four weeks adds to the time it takes for you to fill a post. And that kind of thing needs to be reviewed in terms of the value add that it's currently exercising. Because the, the, the point is, do you really need to do the assessment prior if you're using it as a conduit to put it into the personal development plan? Is it a, is a, dis, a decisive tool for the recruiters who are actually looking at this as a selection committee? The answer is no. You cannot use the competency assessment as a final decider in terms of how you want to appoint a person. So the question is, is there room for thought in terms of 
whether or not it should be used prior to making the appointment or after making the appointment. I asked a question in the room, would HR people be happy if we say to applicants or prospective applicants, don't submit copies of qualifications. Just give us your ZED3 and your CV. And they were, it was a resounding yes. I'm sure we would, we would save a lot of trees if we do that. But that's, you see, it's the small changes that we need to focus on that will not require too much of, uh, and will have a great impact on, on, on the applicants out there as well. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think I'm covered. Um, sorry. <laughs> There's, there's a whole lot more that we can talk about, but we'll clean up the presentation and we'll make it available. Linda. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, thanks to all the commissions. Um, I want us to start with the colleagues that are joining us virtually um, so that we can hear uh, what their questions and comments are and we will then come back to the rest of the um, plenary in the, in the room. Um, Prince Ula sisters were just uh, reading out. Uh, and colleagues must just note so that if it falls under the area that you presented on, you can then assist with the response. Thank Prince? you, DDG. Uh, this one is from Henley Nell. Please consider using PhD and master's students to help with research in terms of determining best practice in other countries. Uh, the, next question, the next comment is, or question is from Mr. Lesiba Tlowatla. How can we effectively automate HR systems to, implant, to implement talent management strategies? Uh, the next uh, question or the next comment is from Jeanette uh, Water. Something that we are not talking about enough, I think. Uh, I think core change management skills need to support and go hand in hand in the utilization and adoption of new technology solutions in government. We also have examples of ICT projects with a lot spent on it, not being able to really give in terms its IROs, its IOI, oh sorry, ROI, due to poor change management. This links to the talk yesterday on the need for change management. And as such, ICT and transformation cannot be discussed without thinking about how we improve change management skills. The next question is from Ms. Anne Ponzang from the Department of Roads in the Northern Cape Public Works. Um, I agree with the presenter when he said that our public service IT space is not highly regulated compared to your finance space. I am comparing the same to HR space which is highly regulated but somehow has fundamental gaps on enforcement. DG I think we should impress on regularizing digitization of HR practices very clearly in this opportunity, very clearly in this opportunity to review the 2016 um, public service regulations. The DPSA ICT uh, framework is also not responsive to the 4IR. Digital future of work and my proposal is to review it and amend it to address the challenges the presenter is reflecting. And then this one is from Tabeleng Matabata. Five years experience requirement is not fair. How will we attract millennials since we are, we are a target in government? The next question is, what, was there any impact evaluation study conducted on the implementation of the 2016 public service regulations, which should be the basis of reviewing these regulations uh, based on the findings based on the findings of the study. Uh, the next uh, comment or question is from Seben Zileziwani. The knowledge management practices and initiatives is key in ensuring the upskilling of public service and retention of intellectual cap capital in the public service. 
optimal utilization of KM tools and initiatives by the public service will assist in breaking silo and enhance knowledge and exchange as well as assist with developing skills and knowledge. In addressing retention in the public service, uh, public service assets, there is a need for HR and KM unit to collaborate in knowledge harvesting, i.e. identifying the employees who will be exiting the system in five years and work on knowledge harvesting mechanism to ensure that the critical knowledge or insight of the employees gained over years is harvested, documented and used to build organizational capacity whilst preserving institutional memory. And then this one is from, from current skulls. HIV AIDS is only one life-threatening illness. What about all the other life-threatening illnesses that people are confronted and struggling with? Communication or not? And then this one is from Bongi Mabele. Focus on the commission should, should convert the current challenges to future work. It's quite a lot. Um, some of them were comments, some of them were specific questions. Um, I'm not sure, maybe let's deal with this round of, of questions first before we, 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 we open. Can we maybe just deal with the responses to the, the questions, not necessarily the comments, because I think the comments are for noting but the specific questions that you would have picked up relating to the area that um, your commission was tasked with. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer to answer? Um, sorry. Hmm? Was Prince going too fast? He didn't hear. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, DG. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my comment is on the five years that people are saying it's too much for the millennium. When this was introduced, and I'm, I'm, I must say that uh, because I was at DPSA, I know why this came about. Uh, it's because there was a lot of job hopping in the public service. A person will apply from KZN for a DD post in Pretoria, St uh, spend three months there, and when a director or chief director position is in, in Limpopo, he would, within, within that short space of time, he would apply and he will be taken. So, and it is the danger of promoting people who are not ready for the jobs. We must, we must uh, consider them. Uh, I know of uh, the, the, the very many uh, uh, challenges that were encountered by the people who were promoted before the time. So we must, as we discuss the millenniums, we must actually look at that aspect. And I don't think we need to change the regu regulations for the sake of, of, uh, of changing. Coming to the, and I just want to, 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 to comment on this one because I actually went to DPSA and had a discussion with uh, 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 the, the people responsible, Rinel and Rulani, where, which, uh, when, when we said at the beginning, because people were not, uh, conversant or were not used to the competency assessments. When they, they were introduced because they were bringing up some kind of fear to say what is going to happen. They were introduced uh, incrementally as a de developmental tool. However, there's nothing that prevents us today to say when you when you when you, you, you have gone through the interview, you, and then you go to the uh, assessment center, the assessment center can be used to actually assist with the recruitment process in the sense that one candidate whose uh, gaps are huge than the other, then 
even if he's number two in the interview, then those, those can be integrated and number two who came up in the uh, 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 interview as number two could be actually number, number three, uh, I, I mean number one. And that, that thing is just, I think it's not possible to introduce because the competencies have got so much that they can do uh, to improve the kind of people that we bring into the, in the, in the, in the public service. But when people have then taken an, a dis, a, an advantage of saying, no, they are developmental in nature, so you cannot use them. So I was just commenting on that one. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nico? Thanks, Mark. Your Royal Highness. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Tiriji. Um, I think, I think uh, we must welcome the presentations. We must also welcome the report back as well as the comments that were made and the questions that were raised. But um, I think we, we, we might have missed the point here um, because most of the report back that we're receiving were actually and I'm going to say this and I'm not going to be popular. It was DPSA colleagues defending their current work and the regulations. And that's not what we came here for. We said let's have an open discussion. Let's hear from the clients that we have as the DPSA to share what they think the, the regulations are doing, what their impact are, and how can we improve on that. I don't think we have achieved that. And we're going to have problems going forward. You know? And one of the reasons why we have this uh, um, uh, Indaba is because, especially today, is because we said we want to hear, and one of the questions was about, have we done a business case analysis to check the impact of the re regulations? We have had anecdotal information coming out from provinces, from departments, and so forth. This is the time for us to get the evidence. And that's why we went out and appointed GTEC to come and review the regulations so that they can go and check what is the evidence and whether we are correct for us to say if the Department X complains about one and two, um, is it correct, is it widespread, or is it only that department that misunderstands that? But we have failed to do that. So maybe uh, DDG, I, I think one, or Chairperson, sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the challenge, maybe one of the proposals that we should make going forward is that delegates and the provinces and departments, they should be allowed to make direct input. They can submit it to the, uh, the secretariat of, the, of this endeavor. They can submit it directly to the office of the DG. We'll do the analysis and submit it to GTEC as part of the reviews so that we can do what we were supposed to have done. Because right now, I don't think we've done that. Secondly, I think we need to um, agree that um, we cannot use regulations to solve things that should be managed somewhere else. The, the, the input that uh, we will allow people to be appointed into positions when they are not ready. It's not a matter of regulations. It's a matter of recruitment processes. So we will be closing even those that are ready to be appointed because we don't want someone to job hop. So we're completely missing the point of what regulations are supposed to do. So let's, let's apply our minds and agree that when we do regulations, the, the, the presenter, Amu, when she presented earlier about the laws, she said we don't, legislate, uh, what, we don't legislate for bad behavior or for good behavior, I can't remember, but something to that effect. But we're setting up regulations to prevent something that should be prevented by the recruitment processes that we have in the departments. And why are we not doing that? Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, 
Oh, DG is still here. Uh, can I note DG first and then uh, DG Jimandla, you can come after? Thank you. Thank you, DG Linda. I just. Uh, perhaps wanted just to say, I think that there is good work that's coming out of the groups and um, we should take it forward and further package um, the work. It should also guide us. Um, I think out of this report, we'll have the it will guide us going forward the work that we are going to do. I take it that that's coming out of this also, I think there's a problem with this, but um, can you hear me, guys? I, I feel like I, I'm hearing a, a bad echo. Thank you. Um, so I was just saying, I think that the, the data, the grounding, the, the base in terms of the information is, um, um, is, is, is useful, but obviously the review process must clean out um, certain things from information. Um, I did get worried when I saw the BSA colleagues going on stage to present because I knew that they may fall into the trap of defending and explaining their regulations. Um, and, and we had made it clear to colleagues who went to the groups that let's nominate people from the floor. It seems the people go, that got nominated to present back were uh, DPSA people in majority from the floor. So I, 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 we don't have control over that. But uh, I do want to say that to colleagues who are here from departments, from um, um, provinces, um, this is your process. So you are given an opportunity to speak on your process so that DPSA colleagues can listen and hear you on how you think things should be done. And hence we had given a guidance as well and tried to control the groups in terms of the areas that they are focusing on because we wanted you to organize yourselves in such a way that you go to the groups that you think are most relevant, where you think you are going to make the most profound input into this particular process. So I did get a little bit concerned when I picked up that DPSA colleagues are the ones who are reporting, but uh, I think that we must appreciate the fact that colleagues did avail themselves or when they were nominated, they were available to, to do those presentations. But I do want to say to DPSA colleagues, let's guard against uh, defending what we know, which is from the past, because we are talking about the future of work so which means the current and the future. So we need to learn lessons from what we know from the past into the future that we are going into. So that creating that balance in this process is very important. It's not the first time we are interacting with this process as DPSA. It's our process, we're going to interact with it, but let's try avoid to come across as over explaining and defending what we have done in the past and arguing that it's relevant, even when it's obvious that some of the things are not relevant because of the changing times that we're operating in. So for me, that's just a, a, a general comment, but to appreciate um, what um, a, a colleagues have done. The third issue I want to say is that I think we must, when we think about regulations, we must think about them from an empowering point of view not from a point of view of blocking. Well, ultimately, regulations will block certain things, but your intention must not be to block, block, block. Um, and, and if you know about the millennials, somebody talked about people job hopping. I actually liked that example you were giving, but we live in an era of job hopping. No regulations are going to help you stop people from changing from one job to the other. So using regulations to keep people in one place, you may not win, but you might. Period in a particular job. Do you even want to retain people for a longer period in a particular job? Or you want to people come do the work, deliver and leave if they want to leave? My view personally is always that deliver on your work and leave when you want to leave. As a result, I don't beg people who say I'm leaving. 
You know, even in my personal life, I hate begging people. When people want to leave, allow them to leave because once you beg them to stay, you carry a burden um, of always having to tiptoe or accommodating them. But also, um, once you beg people to stay, you are also taking away their opportunity to grow in the system. Some of us have had opportunities to grow whilst we were young in the system because we have taken risks and moved from one job to the other. What you may call job hopping, uh, move from one job to the other. So not the career public servant who stays in one job like in subs for 30 years, then becomes a commissioner on the 35th year and retires on the 40th year. So, 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 so we must think about what are the management practices we need to put in place to support regulations because I agree with Nico, we're not going to do everything, that we're not going to use regulations to control people and to control behaviors. We, we must take a view that says our regulations are empowering to assist us to achieve the outcomes that we have set ourselves to achieve. And one of those biggest outcomes that we have set ourselves is around the capacity of the state, building capacity of the state. So our regulations must contribute towards building capacity of the state, not restraining the processes of building capacity of the state. So maintaining that balance is going to be a very important thing that we need to do. But I do think from my side that this is good work. It's good data to work from. And um, uh, I saw some colleagues lobbying about their other issues. I, I was laughing when I was listening um, to the colleagues from the IT work stream. There was lots of lobbying that was happening there, which is not a bad thing because if you don't use a platform like this to achieve what you want, which other platform are you going to get to do so? You don't know. So for me, I think we have the quality. Let's build on that quality of work and improve continuously going forward until we get the product that we're comfortable with. But but let's not use regulations as a punitive mechanism because then we are going to lose. That's why maybe we struggle to get people to comply because we have all these punitive and many things and yet regulations are supposed to help us to um, implement legislation and to, uh, to, to, to achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve through our mandate. Thank you. Someone wanted to clap hands. You can go ahead. <laughs> okay, colleagues, I'm sure um, there's a lot of questions um, that you, you have, comments and inputs, um, and unfortunately due to our time limitations, I have been requested to request colleagues um, to share their questions and inputs to the Secretariat or specifically to Ms. Precious Isaacs from the Office of the DG. I think taking from what DG had said, this is part of an ongoing conversation that we need to have. So if I'm closing you off, trust me, it's not deliberate nor personal. I would like to take this opportunity to um, invite um, DG Tabo Masebe who has been sitting very patiently with us. It's very unusual to have a DG sitting with you for two days. So um, we thought that uh, I'm sure because of him having been here for two days and listening attentively, um, he'll have something very valuable uh, to share with us as we move towards closing the session. So DG. Once again, thank you for your participation and thank you for helping us to close off the session. There is a phone that was found. Um, I'm not sure whether it was somewhere. If it's yours um, or in the ladies' bathrooms. Okay, so I will quiz you if you think it's yours or if you say it's yours because I've just <laughs> seen something here on the screen, so I have the phone. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair and colleagues. Um, we have come to the end of this uh, uh, conference, and I think as uh, some of the colleagues have said, and DG Yoli also said, this was obviously a start, um, not the end. 
it was a start which uh, uh, helped us to kickstart the conversations about all of these issues to ensure that uh, we prepare ourselves or we gear ourselves for the future of work. Uh, so if it was a conclusion, it wouldn't be proper uh, because you can't start and then conclude. And that's why, in fact, even the issues that were raised, the questions that were raised, uh, did not need to be responded to. All of those uh, comments would obviously help as we finalize this process. Uh, those that are still going to conduct research will obviously have to look at them and say, how do we, uh, which ones can help uh, enrich the product that we want to come up with uh, at the end? And of course, uh, talking about uh, the research and all of these things, uh, I know that uh, there were a lot of talk about uh, regulations and about uh, uh, compliance issues. Uh, we send lots of reports to DPSA but it must be understood uh, because DPSA deals with a lot of data uh, and uh, they are able to analyze that data and say as we come to these uh, uh, processes where we have to review our systems and review our regulations, uh, we are then best able to use that data to say how do we move forward. What are the things that we need to fix in this system? And then we're able to do that. So that's why I'm saying it was a, 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 a start and the conversations from yesterday until today will indeed enrich this process that we have started. And I'm sure we will continue as the departments and provinces are being invited to continue making their inputs so that by the time this process is finalized, we are all happy that uh, the issues, whatever issues that we had with regulations, whatever suggestions that we want to make about uh, the future of work uh, will indeed find their way uh, in there. There was a lot of talk about uh, uh, technology um, and I said right through that uh, commission, I was part of the commission, was tempted to speak at some stage, but I decided let me give the colleagues uh, a chance to say all of these things, but maybe I can make my comment here just about technology. I think honestly the problem is that uh, we don't have the will and right from the top, because if we had the will, all of these things we could have implemented. The strategy that the colleagues uh, referred to, we could have implemented that strategy. Uh, but we tend to, and I will talk, uh, I will share a bit even about how to, we have a, an e-government department, which is meant to lead us with uh, ensuring that we optimize uh, ICT to improve our government uh, processes and systems. Uh, but any one of you can go to the Gauteng government website. It's not functional. I'm ashamed to say this. It isn't functional. And what is the problem? Because we probably knew what we wanted, we know what we want, but we can't go there and get it. We depend on what is available in the market. So our technology, uh, uh, our ICT is vendor driven. So different kind of companies would come to us and say, well, we can fix your, your problems here Here's a system that we have, and then we buy it. Another one comes tomorrow, sells us something, we buy it. Uh, before we know it, you'll find that you've got many systems which are meant to do the same thing, uh, but you use 
maybe a few applications in this one and then you go to the other one, use a few applications, you go to the other one and use it. Uh, I mean, we do it here. We have a different uh, a system that we use for payment and there's another system that we use uh, for HR management, PESAL, uh, and so on. Uh, then you have National Treasury uses another system. Uh, and then why do we keep our own uh, system? It's because while we know what we want, we depend on all these people who come to us selling us different things. And that's why in our commission we spoke about the amount of money that we spent just over the past three years um, buying things that we probably need, didn't need to buy. So early on, and I'm sure it was during the time when they were developing this strategy, there was the issue, the question of uh, open source. They say, can we use open source? Uh, and it was at the time when governments in uh, Europe were putting Microsoft under a lot of pressure. Uh, Microsoft was facing lots of litigation because of their uncompetitive behavior. But here, we then take a decision that no, we're not even going to touch open source. Microsoft is our operating system. How could government make such a decision? During that time, the key, uh, the main reason was that we didn't have staff who were trained on how to use other operating platforms. But why didn't we use that opportunity at that time to start building a system that we could rely on? Uh, even if it meant working with uh, different uh, uh, companies and so on, we didn't do it until today. We haven't done it. So where is that will? Uh, that's, I'm, I'm sure as we move forward, we're going to look at that and say, what do we need to ensure that we optimize ICT for, to improve our systems in government, to improve processes, uh, between government and the public. Uh, and once we have agreed on that, what is the infrastructure that we need? What is the personnel that we need? And then go and do that. Uh, we can't wait, we can't say no, we will depend on what each of these people who sell us things uh, tell us. Because each one of them will come and say, no, my system, can, you can only use my system. So. The issue of interoperability is not there. They, they can't work together and so on. Not that they can't work together, but the people who sell us these things don't want the systems to work together because we must keep going back to them. So we rely on them to even develop uh, more things so that they can come back and sell to us. So, I think that's where we really need to start. And if we can start there and say, this is what we want, and this is how it will help to enhance our own systems and processes, let's go and get it and do it. Let's, if we need skills, let's develop uh, those skills and give, us our, give ourselves time and say, in five uh, years or so, we will have our own capacity uh, to, 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 to manage our uh, systems. I think it can be done. So maybe as we uh, 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 process all of these things, that's my own contribution. Let's look at uh, um, how we can deal with that. And I think on regulations, uh, colleagues did speak uh, quite at length about them. The issue is regulations are meant to enable us, to empower us, to be able to do certain things to guide us on how uh, uh, things should be done, on how we run our processes and so on. Uh, and every time when you look at regulations and say we need to change, the first thing, understand the intention of the, if it is a law, 
understand the intention of the legislators. Otherwise, you won't be able to move. If you don't understand the intention, how do you then interpret that law and arrive at a determination that it serves the purpose for which it was uh, uh, enacted? So it is the same about regulations. We then need to understand why were they made and then say to ourselves, are there any unintended consequences? And if they are, and I think as the colleagues were speaking from yesterday until today, uh, there were examples of some of the unintended consequences. Then you say, how do we deal with them? Do some of those unintended consequences require an amendment to these regulations? Then we go and look at uh, whether indeed we need an amendment. Some of them may not require an amendment, uh, especially where you're dealing with a, 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 not a general situation, but an exception. A, an exception can always be uh, accommodated in existing regulations and that's why you talk about deviation and approvals for such uh, deviations and so on but the key thing that we want to say is that as we make those proposals for uh, uh, changes let's make sure that we understand the purpose or the intention for which these things were created and once we do and as I said, there might be unintended consequences, then let's look at that. And of course, one of the things that uh, was also uh, spoken at length, uh, spoken about at length, is the issue of uh, retention uh, or, or attracting and retain, uh, retaining uh, some of the scarce skills, especially from the private sector. Yes, we can look at that. Do the current regulations allow us to do that? If not, do we need to amend? Let's look at that. How do we uh, bring in younger people, especially to deal with the issue that was uh, raised yesterday about uh, many of us who in the next few years we will be retiring? Uh, what do you do to ensure that uh, there are younger people into the system and those younger people can then gain experience, including learning uh, from those who have been uh, long in the system. So those are all the things that uh, we need to do, but this was a good start. I don't have to make a speech because uh, as I'm coming right at the end. So let me end it here, because otherwise I would be tempted to do uh, what uh, something that I call a Mandela. Uh, you wouldn't know. It's, uh, so uh, I, I worked a bit with, in my other life with President Mandela. And then, uh, so he would go to a meeting, a big uh, conference, uh, and the protocol officers, before he speaks, they will bring a file uh, with his speech, open it there, and he reads the speech from the first word to the last, and right when he finishes, he folds the, 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 the file and put it away and then starts his own speech. <laughs> so when he did that, he did that on a few occasions when I was with him. And I, I, I then gave feedback to, some, to the people who were managing him in the office. I said, no, chief, please write Mandela his speeches. And they said to me, what do you mean? Didn't he have a speech? We always write him speeches. I said, yeah, but those are your speeches. Write the president his speeches. And then uh, I had to explain to them that uh, when he finishes reading your speech, he starts his own and probably take the same amount of time that he took with your speech, but making his own speech. And his speech is normally what gets uh, published in the media. So thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you.
colleagues, my secret plan to get a present at the end of today was to make sure we end at exactly half past four. It is exactly half past four. So, the DG has spoken. Um, I don't want to say anything further other than thank you, thank you very much for your commitment to these two days, your active participation, your words of wisdom to us as the DPSA and I think to other center of government departments that had joined us both here physically and virtually. And I trust that um, this will not be a talk shop that we will really heed the advice that you have given us and really do um, implement some of the recommendations that you have made. Um, DJ, I hope this is the first of many. Um, when I first joined DPSA, there was a concept that we must use public servants as the think tank of government. I think we have started that process and it would be very sad if we end it today. So um, we look forward to many more, um, as much as we can have for the benefit of the public service that we are trying to perfect for today and for the future. Thank you very much. Travel safely until we meet again. Okay. 